Talks with Japan and China Hitler Talks with S. Chandra Bose, Japanese Hopes of a Russo-German Peace, A Strange Visit to Goring, Tokyo Peace Feelers Thwarted by Ribbentrop, Chinese Secret Service Offers Collaboration. Their Proposal Rejected, An Alarming Report on Junk, Japanese Demands on China, Unequivocal Reply. Japan breaks off negotiations and day in March 1942 Junk came to see me on his return from a trip to Switzerland. S. Chandra Bose, one of the leaders of the Indian nationalist movement, who at that time wielded considerable influence in India, was staying in Berlin. The Japanese were trying to ingratiate themselves with Bose, so of course I was interested in getting Junk's opinion on the situation. So far, Primarily on Hitler's suggestion, the Far East Office of AMTV had relied for its information about India mainly on Sidi Khan, the leader of a small faction within the Indian Liberation Movement. But between Bose and Sidi Khan, who at the time was in Rome, there existed a state of uncompromising rivalry. Bose's outstanding intelligence and his mastery of modern propaganda methods had made a deep impression on Himmler and we were therefore considering whether we should not shift our support to him. One of Bose's favorite ideas was the setting up of an Indian legion within the German army. So we arranged an audience for Bose with Hitler, who agreed in principle to the establishment of such a legion. But Bose was deeply disappointed, for Hitler had emphasized that at the moment he was not particularly interested in India and would prefer to leave it to Japan to keep an eye on that country politically and strategically. If his luck should hold, however, if southern Russia and the Caucasus were to be conquered and German armor to reach Persia, then, but only then, he would be prepared to confer with Bose on India's future. When I mentioned Bose's name to Junk, he at once gave me a warning. He said he knew that Bose had lived and studied in Moscow for a considerable time and that he had established close relations with the common form. In my own dealings with Bose I had time and time again come across indications of the influence of Moscow's teachings in the way questions and answers were developed dialectically within a set of rules. At the request of the Japanese, Bose was taken to Japan in 1943 by a German U-boat. After he had left Berlin I did not fail to disclose my misgivings about him to the Japanese there. They insisted, however, that they could make good use of a man of his caliber in Japan. From both our talk turned to the affairs of my own department. Junk advised me to drop frontline infiltration tactics and intelligence work in the combat areas, which I could leave to the various army groups, and instead to penetrate as deeply as possible into the Russian hinterland where much more valuable information was to be found. I pointed out this would require a large number of fast transport planes, either for dropping agents by parachute or to land them in uninhabited areas, and the very few aircraft which the Luftwaffe allowed us would be a serious handicap. At this point Junk changed the subject. We were about to discuss the relationship between Japan and Russia when he suddenly broke off. There's no peace in this place. Why don't you shut everything up and come away for a weekend and twiddle your thumbs? The idea appealed to me, and so I went out to his estate on the Pomeranian coastal plain. Here were wonderful forests and lakes full of fish. After a wonderful meal, we sat over a bottle of good red wine until late in the night and discussed the problems of our work. It was not for my health that Junk had suggested this weekend but to ensure the utmost privacy to discuss the information he had got from the East. Junk had learned that the Japanese were intending to try to bring about a compromise peace between Germany and the Soviet Union. The Japanese cabinet had received extensive and shattering information from their secret service on the real strength of Russia's war potential. It was certain that the Russian armies would soon be strong enough not only to halt the German offensive, but to drive us back along the whole front. By the winter of 1942 to 1943 Russian industry would be geared to an overwhelming production of armaments. Guerrilla warfare in the German rear areas would be greatly intensified, tying down a large number of German troops and seriously disrupting our long supply lines. The Japanese feared that in the end Germany would have expended all her military strength in a hopeless campaign. Because of the Western Allies' hesitation about actively supporting Russia by opening a second front, 
a compromise peace with Stalin was still a real possibility. According to Jank, the Japanese leaders were unanimous in this view of the situation and an approach to Germany either directly or indirectly was likely. We discussed the problem for a long time. Junk thought the chief opponent of such a solution would be Ribbentrop, whose narrow mind would be unable to understand the situation. Himmler was too much under Hitler's influence to act independently and was very muddled in his thinking. Goering was no longer of importance. His star had set since the failure of the air offensive against Britain. Since then Goering seemed to have lost nearly all interest in the great military events. This was attributed by many to his increasing dependence on morphia, by others to his excessive and increasingly morbid indulgence in a life of luxury. At this time Himmler sent me to report to Goering at his beautiful country house north of Berlin, named Karin Hall, after his first wife, on the suggested incorporation of the Goering research establishment into Department V. This establishment had been built up by Goering with the help of naval experts for the supervision of all telephone and wireless surveillance, including monitoring and tapping. Every single telephone communication inside Germany and the German-occupied European territories could be tapped and often yielded a rich crop of valuable information. Hitler's long-distance calls were all monitored and recorded and if necessary passed on to the appropriate government departments for reference or action. Once, a production figure on German armaments mentioned by Hitler in a conversation with Mussolini caused the greatest confusion because Hitler himself had been misinformed. When I arrived at Karin Hall, I had to wait for some time in the entrance hall. It was vast and deeply carpeted and with its dark oak beams and heavy old furniture it reminded me of an ancient church. After I had waited for half an hour, one of the large folding doors was thrown open and the Reichsmarschall made his entrance, holding his marshal's baton and clad as an ancient Roman nobleman, toga, sandals and all. For a second I felt as though I were meeting the Emperor Nero. Goering smiled amiably and asked me to follow him into the next room. He motioned me into a huge armchair and settled down behind a small table on which stood a cut glass bowl containing pearls and antique jewelry. While I made my report, he kept fingering the jewelry, as though he were in a trance. When I had finished, all he said was, well, I will have a word about it with Himmler. A week later Himmler still had not heard from him and was furious about this. He raved at me and then against Goering, that king of the black markets, as he used to call him. By the end of 1943 Goering had lost every vestige of authority or respect. Thus, already in 1942, the only one who seemed likely to take any interest in effecting a compromise peace was Heydrich, whom Junk considered to be one of the outstanding minds in this whole circle. But Heydrich was so occupied with the protectorate that it was doubtful whether he alone would be able to influence Hitler decisively. Junk warned me emphatically not to tell Bormann at this stage about the Japanese offer of mediation. In his opinion Bormann was an unknown quantity and a dangerous confidant. Heydrich was sympathetic to the idea, however, and in fact broached the matter tactfully to Hitler, but without any decisive result. Four weeks later, in April 1942, Ribbentrop informed Hitler of a Japanese attempt to establish contact with us through the German naval attaché in Tokyo. Heydrich warned me by telephone that Hitler might even want to talk to Junk, whom he knew personally. But at the end of May, Heydrich told me that Ribbentrop had won after all, and the feelers from Tokyo had been officially rejected by the German naval attaché. Junk insisted that I should make a special effort now to win Himmler's support, so that he would influence the Führer. If Hitler really was a great statesman, he would realize that an honorable peace with Russia was essential, but he must be convinced that no loss of prestige would be involved. The Japanese, indeed, had not given up the attempt, and in June 1942 they tried again. This time the general staff of the army contacted the German military attaché in Tokyo and suggested that a Japanese commission, under the direction of an army general, should fly to Germany in a German long-range aircraft to discuss the coordination of political and military policy. Unfortunately they let it be known that the question of a compromise peace with Russia would be discussed. 
Ribbentrop managed to torpedo this effort very effectively. The Japanese army were working independently of their government. Ribbentrop suspected this, and immediately informed the Japanese ambassador. This caused some friction between the government in Tokyo and their general staff. The Japanese army could only interpret such behavior on the part of the German foreign minister as an official rebuff, and indignantly withdrew their offer. After our defeat at Stalingrad, the Japanese again repeated their offer to mediate without delay, this time through their foreign minister, Shai Jemitsu. Hitler, in his stubborn narrow mindedness, brusquely rejected the offer. Later, in 1944, I was to have a long conversation with Rear Admiral Kojima. He had commanded a Japanese battle cruiser in the attack on Singapore, and had been decorated and promoted for exceptional bravery. He told me that he had come to Germany by U-boat in 1943 with the special task of exploring the situation and persuading the FRA to initiate peace negotiations with Russia. This proposal had met with an outright rejection. Of course, when I talked with him at the end of 1944 the opportunity for such a peace had passed. The second problem I discussed with Junk during that weekend was his work with the Chinese Secret Service. The centers of the Chinese Secret Service at that time were in Bern, Vichy, London, Stockholm and Moscow. Junk's chief connections were with Bern and Vichy. There was a Chinese diplomat there at that time, an important member of the Chinese Secret Service who was a very close acquaintance of Junk's. He told Junk that influential circles around Generalissimo Chiang Kai-shek felt that there were still groups in Germany who were sympathetic towards China and who might be in a position to influence the German leaders towards bringing about a compromise peace between Japan and China. Here was an interesting situation, on the one hand Japan, locked in a struggle with America, was trying to act as peacemaker between Russia and Germany. On the other, the Chinese were trying to persuade Germany to act as peacemaker between themselves and Japan. The Chinese did not wish to discuss details at this point, they wanted first to see whether the Japanese would react favorably towards the idea. This was the political aspect of the matter. But there was also a Secret Service aspect to it. In return for our mediation, the Chinese were willing to enter into a collaboration with our Secret Service. Of course, this was a very important offer which fascinated me just as much as the political aspect. I knew that the Chinese Secret Service had extensive possibilities, and it must be remembered that they had free access to Downing Street as well as to the Kremlin. Junk and I discussed the offer thoroughly. I feared, and Junk agreed with me, that the almost certain rejection of the Japanese offer to mediate between ourselves and Russia would make it extremely difficult to put forward the Chinese plan. I assured Junk of my support, and drew up a detailed memorandum which Heydrich placed before Himmler. After this it took Heydrich and Himmler 14 days to decide on the best way to approach Hitler. They both agreed from the start that Ribbentrop must be kept out of it completely. Himmler himself reported on the situation to Hitler, who gave both matters considerable attention, though his first reaction to the Japanese offer was one of indignant rejection. The Chinese attempt he considered very interesting. He did not doubt that Chiang Kai shek was sincere, but he felt doubtful of the Japanese reaction. As he pointed out, it would all depend on the practical proposals and on the detailed conditions. Still, it showed that Haider was seriously interested when, through Himmler, he ordered me to prepare a report on the proportion of Japan's total war potential tied down in China. Himmler received permission from Hitler to pursue the Chinese proposals independently, for he very cleverly had pointed out that in its present stage this was primarily a matter between the two secret services and should remain so. In this way Himmler managed to exclude Ribbentrop from the affair. However, eight days later Hitler had changed his mind. The Chinese suggestion and the Japanese offer to mediate with Russia had to be considered as two aspects of the same problem. In both cases, no doubt, the secret services should continue to play the main part. But he did not wish to leave Ribbentrop out, and contact with the foreign minister had to be maintained. He had already asked Ribbentrop to discuss the Chinese offer with Oshima, the Japanese ambassador in Berlin, 
who was a great friend of his. Meanwhile, the Japanese had already declared their readiness to enter into negotiations on China, however, as had been foreseen, they demanded more definite proposals. For this reason, Junk again went to Switzerland. He appeared to do so reluctantly, not wishing it to seem that he was involved in the affair at all. He went, therefore, ostensibly for a business trip on behalf of a large Argentine grain firm. While Junk was in Switzerland, I received a shattering secret report. It was 30 pages long and was a painstakingly exact compilation of evidence proving that Junk was a top level British agent. The real purpose of his trip to Switzerland was to receive new directives. I at once gave orders for the most careful surveillance of Junk and for a close watch to be kept on his movements in Switzerland. However, nothing out of the ordinary was discovered, nor did his subsequent Secret Service work show even the slightest detail that might be regarded as suspicious. At the time I did not pass on this report to my superiors, for I had decided that even if it were true I would go on employing Junk as an agent. Finally, I gave the report to Junk himself, while he read it, I studied his attitude and expression very closely. I knew him so well that the smallest reaction of guilt could not possibly have escaped me, but his behavior was completely natural. It could hardly be explained away by saying that he had exceptionally strong nerves. Junk thanked me, I thought rather enigmatically. A man in your position is only human after all, he said. No one can know what is in another man's heart. In your situation you stand alone to face problems that are entirely your own. Your whole life has inclined you towards systematic suspicion, but I think you are big enough to overcome that. What is important is a man's real character, and there you can trust your instinct. He had returned from Switzerland surprisingly soon, obviously disappointed by the outcome of his mission. The Chinese proposals called for the complete withdrawal of all Japanese troops and the liberation of the Chinese ports. In the ports, however, the Japanese would be accorded certain treaty rights, and I thought these demands went rather far. Even if they were intended as bargaining tactics, I still thought the Chinese had overreached themselves, and we toned down their demands considerably. The discussions between Ribbentrop and the Japanese hung fire. Junk urged speed and I tried to hurry Himmler and Ribbentrop. Finally, in June 1942, the Japanese handed us a series of inquiries for further clarification. A number of these junk, on behalf of the Chinese, was able to answer very quickly, the rest were to be clarified by Chiang Kai-shek himself. As it was too difficult to communicate with China on such complex matters by radio, it was decided to send a special envoy. I succeeded in keeping the interest of the Japanese alive until the middle of September, chiefly by repeating old arguments. The messages which had meanwhile come back from China gave no information about details, Junk was certain that a courier from China, who was on the way, would bring further particulars and new authority. However, in September 1942, in spite of all our efforts to gain more time, the Japanese suddenly declared that they were no longer interested. All our attempts to keep the conversations open were of no avail. The door was closed. I was not clear about the reasons behind this. But I finally came to the conclusion that the Japanese general staff had intervened, having decided at this point to open a new offensive that would link their territory around Hankou with Indochina. Before the year was out, this offensive had begun. Xx via Perish and Zeppelin pressure on the SD's services, its functions and duties, Russian POWs trained to work for Germany, theories of guerrilla warfare, a discussion with Russian prisoners plans for attacking Russian heavy industries, Colonel Vlasov's army, Drazina, the Wansi Institute, a report on Russia's situation. Himmler reprimands my department in spite of the impressive successes of our armies on the Eastern Front, by the summer of 1942 increasing difficulties were becoming apparent to those who knew the facts. First, we were greatly astonished by the quality and even more by the numerical strength of the Russian armor. Secondly, Resistance behind the German lines was no longer the sporadic action of isolated units, but had developed into well-organized guerrilla warfare, 
tying down security forces that were greatly needed elsewhere. Himmler and Heydrich put considerable pressure on me, demanding more secret information on Russia as the available material was not enough. Admittedly, the reports were deficient not only regarding the political situation, but also regarding Russia's war production. The increasing pressure of guerrilla warfare and the heavy disruption of communications only called attention to our inability to retaliate, and this was inevitably brought very forcefully to the Fra's attention. There had been several rather heated discussions with Heydrich, and later with Himmler, for our intelligence work was not as extensive nor as successful as the military situation required. Himmler wanted to know precisely why our intelligence reports on the Soviet Union were so inadequate. Again he reminded me of the Fra's words, we have got to finish off the Russians before the others start. I told him the reason was that I was not given enough support either in materials or staff. It was not enough for the personnel officers to say that they had assigned to me so many hundred men. Numbers in themselves meant little in face of the task of training masses of foreign nationals, linguists, and specialists and the deficiencies in technical equipment were just as serious. How could one possibly expect anything else? There had been nothing like enough a preparation and one could not suddenly make up several years' backlog. Our Berlin Information Network, with its outposts in Sweden, Finland, the Balkans and Turkey, was running in top gear, but it was not giving us anything like a clear enough picture for long-range planning. I was asked to make a special point of intelligence work conducted directly across the front lines, but no account was taken of the difficulties which such work would entail. Our staff was inadequate, both in numbers and quality, and the gradual and continuous development of our work was constantly impeded by hasty and contradictory orders from above. On the other hand, we had to reckon with the detailed and relentless counter-espionage of the Russian secret police. The secret service work against Russia was split up into three sections. The task of section I was to gather and coordinate all information supplied by our agents working permanently in foreign countries. We sought to secure as much information, both secret and overt, as possible. Overt information included newspapers, official statistics, books and other publications. This information was chiefly required as a basis for long-range objectives, and the staff that handled it needed high intellectual qualifications. They had to be of all nationalities, and so had to be employed regardless of race, religion, and so forth. To organize this work, Information centers in all the capitals of Europe were formed on similar lines to the central office in Berlin. Through one of the centers, the existence of which was known only to three persons in the central office, we had a direct secret service connection with two of Marshal Rokosevsky's general staff officers. It was interesting that they both expressed doubts about Rokosevsky's loyalty to Stalin. The general, a former Tsarist officer, was supposed to have spent some years in Siberia. Later, when I took over Admiral Kinneris's military sector, another very important center was added. Its chief was a German Jew, and he conducted its activities in a manner that was unique. His office staff consisted of two persons, everything in the office was mechanized. His information network went through various countries and penetrated every stratum of society. He furnished quick and exact reports from the senior staffs of the Russian army, which were considered of special significance by the evaluating section of our own army supreme command. The work of this man was really masterly. He was able to report large-scale strategic plans as well as details of troop movements, in some important cases even down to divisional level. His reports usually came in two or three weeks ahead of events so that our leaders could prepare suitable countermeasures, or, should I say, could have done so if Hitler had paid more attention to the information. I had to fight like a lion to preserve this valuable assistant from Müller and from the jealousy and intrigues in my own department and on the Luftwaffe staff. There was a clique hiding behind Colton Brunner and Müller who were determined to remove the Jew. Not only was this man's Jewish origin used as a pretext for getting rid of him, but his enemies tried to prove in the most treacherous manner that he was engaged in a long-range game of deception for the Russian intelligence. 
it was assumed that for a long time they had been deliberately feeding us with accurate reports in order to lead us astray by the substitution of misleading information at a decisive moment. The second of our sections was responsible for Operation Zeppelin. The main purpose of this operation was to drop mass formations of Russian prisoners by parachute deep inside Soviet territory. They were allowed the status of German soldiers, wore Wehmacht uniforms, and were given the best food clean quarters, lecture films and trips through Germany. Meanwhile those in charge of their training, aided by informants, were able to find out their real attitude, whether they only wanted to enjoy the advantages offered by this plan, whether they had really turned against the terror of the Stalinist system, or whether, racked by inner conflicts, they were hovering between the two ideologies of Nazism and Stalinism. Having been trained and equipped, they were sent to the Eastern Front to gather information and infiltrate the Russian partisan bands, Operation Zeppelin's main task being to counter the effects of guerrilla warfare. Because of the vast areas involved, and regardless of the high losses that would be inevitable, special formations were to be trained for certain secret service missions including the establishment of contact with German emigre circles in Russia. In order to carry out this plan three units, South, Central and North were formed. These units, whose tasks were sabotage, political subversion, and the collection of information, were to be flown over the lines by special squadrons of the Luftwaffe along the entire length of the Eastern Front. A courier system across the front lines and secret wireless transmissions were to be their main means of communication. Most of the agents were dropped in places where they were able to shelter with friends. Some were equipped with bicycles with wireless batteries and transmitters built into the pedal mechanism, so that regular pedaling would ensure inconspicuous and smooth transmission. On one occasion, an agent succeeded in reaching Vladivostok with a Russian troop transport. There he observed and sent back full details of certain troop movements. The enormous size of Russia's territory enabled our agents to move about without hindrance, sometimes for months on end, although finally most of them were caught by the NKVD who, when the need arose, would mobilize a whole division near the front line, or detachments of guerrilla fighters in the rear, in order to track our agents down. Operation Zeppelin was now well underway but my explanations of the difficulties involved were always met by the stereotype to answer, that's all very interesting, but your assignment is still as before, to furnish the fra with information. The overwhelming lack of preparation and of trained staff and special equipment was entirely overlooked. Hitler wanted precise information on the organization of the Russian guerrilla units, their structure and channels of command, and details of their missions. I therefore gave this matter priority, and planned to issue special assignments during my intended visits to Sweden and Norway. I had worked out certain theories about guerrilla warfare which I propounded first to Heydrich, then to Himmler, every guerrilla war, every growing and active resistance movement, must in order to thrive possess an idea or ideal which binds the guerrillas or the members of the movement together. This idea must be strong enough to arouse and perpetually renew the energy and determination of the partisans. Training and the highest qualities of leadership are, of course, necessary for systematic partisan warfare, but the morale of the individual remains always the decisive factor. I had occupied myself with this problem during many a night's discussion with Russian officers, and also with our Russian agents at the Wansi Institute. It had become clear to me that Stalin and the other Russian leaders were systematically developing a form of warfare through their partisan units which exploited the fierceness with which the struggle was being conducted on both sides. The Russians used the harshness with which the Germans were conducting the war as the ideological basis for their partisan activities. The so-called Commissar befell, order to shoot all commissars, the German propaganda about the subhuman nature of the Russian peoples, the mass shootings carried out by the Einsatzgruppen, the special security units operating with the army in and behind the combat zone, 
all constituted arguments which were psychologically effective in arousing a ruthless spirit of opposition among the partisans. My Russian advisers believed that in reality Stalin welcomed these German measures, and reports of whose validity I was practically certain supported this theory. One of them stated that the most important aim of the partisan warfare was ruthlessness in itself, that anything was justified which would make the population support the struggle. The brutalities committed must always be ascribed to the German invaders, so that a hesitant population would be forced, as it were, into active resistance. If, because of Russian interests, unreliable elements had to be punished, this must be done in such a way that the punishment would seem to be imposed by the Germans. The rest of the population would then be all the more willing to support the partisans struggle. Another report gave special directives to the NKVD on how it was to support the partisan bands. The NKVD was to send some of its best and most reliable agents as advisors and informers into the German army and administrative offices. Their task, apart from keeping in close touch with the partisan units, either by sending false or accurate information, was to use their wits in influencing and inciting the German occupation authorities to take harsh measures against certain sections of the population, such as Jews and Kulaks. Executions, liquidations and deportations were, of course, to be presented as brutalities consciously committed by the Germans against the Russian people. It was a truly devilish program which the Russian leaders seemed to have evolved and its effects were no less brutal than the measures taken by the Germans. Himmler and Heydrich did not believe the Russian leaders had the time or ability to work out such complicated ideas. I told them that I had based my views on the reports which had come in, and on the professional views of my advisers. Furthermore, I added, the Russian leaders seemed to have a much sounder knowledge of their own people than we had deceived as we were by our own propaganda creation, the subhuman Russian. For making this point I got a serious dressing down, and for a while had to keep my mouth shut. Later I took up the subject once more, but this time very cautiously. I suggested that it would be necessary to offer the Russian prisoners working for us an ideal worth risking their lives for. National socialism was not suitable, its ideals were alien to them. The obvious thing would be to hold out the hope of eventual autonomy. But no one was interested. They went on with the old policy of putting Russians in uniforms and giving them better conditions. They gave them medals and lectured them on the high German standard of living and the efficient organization of the German state. With some of them this policy showed results, but the majority needed something better suited to the Russian character something which would satisfy their eternal longing for independence. In later conversations I was able to speak to him more openly about these problems. Towards the end of 1942, he showed a much more receptive attitude, but because of his basic prejudices towards all Eastern questions, I could hardly hope to succeed in obtaining his final agreement. He was too much influenced by the ideas with which Hitler had imbued him during the last 20 years. I had given up discussing this question with Heydrich very early on. He had revealed to me quite openly the way his mind was working when he said, be careful you don't get a medal from Stalin one day. This was clearly a warning that he only wanted purely national socialist conceptions used in propaganda work among the Russian prisoners. I had some interesting discussions with two members of the Russian army, one of them a general staff officer, the other a corporal. Both of them were from Moscow, the one a professional officer, the other in civil life a hydraulic engineer. They had been taken prisoner at Bryansk in August 1941, and had gone through several phases of our training program. Both had proved open-minded, intelligent and reliable, so they had been co-opted onto a special advisory board of Operation Zeppelin in Berlin and sent to live in lodgings as ordinary civilians. Here I visited them with the chief of the section and a Baltic German, a well-educated man who was an excellent interpreter and had already had many discussions with them. Through him, a lively and interesting conversation took place, stimulated by a supply of drink that we had brought with us. There was a considerable contrast between these two Russians. The officer was a trained dialectician and a convinced Stalinist. 
the other man was only moderately influenced by the regime and admitted its shortcomings with a healthy realism. Both of them were firmly convinced that Russia would win the war. This conviction did not spring from the influence of the propaganda to which they had been subjected, but was a fundamental belief. Each of them based his conviction on different reasoning. The officer derived his from Stalin's superlative qualities as a leader and from the strength of the Russian army. The other man, who thought in more primitive terms, said simply, you Germans will never be able to overcome the Russian people and the vastness of Russia. Even if you managed to give the various Soviet peoples their independence, this would only be a temporary step to the inevitable development of communism. He also said that a wave of national feeling was sweeping across Russia, and that plays such as Kuchasov, A Life for the Tsar and Prince Igor had been revived in Moscow with great success. In all of them an invader, after great successes to begin with, is finally defeated by the superlative courage of the Russian people and the vast expanse of Russia itself. The officer spoke of what he had heard discussed by the leaders of the Red Army. According to them, Stalin was ready to sacrifice as many as 20 to 30 million people in order to draw the enemy deeper into the country. This would gradually blunt the force of the Germans attack and ensure that the last decisive battles would be fought in terrain chosen by the Russians and under the iron severity of their winter. The supple lines alone would eat up a great deal of the Germans' material resources, and would be highly vulnerable to partisan warfare. In their retreat the Russians would not let a single factory, machine, or can of petrol fall into the hands of the enemy. Then, weakened by the forces of nature, their own successes, and the countermeasures of the Russians, the Germans would suddenly be overwhelmed by a new, well-organized counter-offensive. After this conversation I was decidedly thoughtful. I was much impressed by the simple manner in which the two men presented their opinions, which I had to admit sounded feasible. I reported these talks to Heydrich, but took care to add that, of course, it was not easy to follow their reasoning. Our military successes had been so tremendous that I could not imagine how the Russian state and people could be capable of such a major reorganization as would be necessary. There was some doubt, of course, whether Stalin possessed the industrial war potential to carry out such a plan, although we must not forget that the Luftwaffe had not yet struck at the industrial regions of the interior west and east of the Urals. Heydrich discussed the matter with Himmler and asked for a written report to show Hitler. Three weeks later the report was returned to me by Heydrich, who told me that the Führer considered it to be complete nonsense. I said, very cautiously, I am not quite of the same opinion but added that for the present we should not risk burning our fingers. If we had been allowed sufficient aircraft, we would have been able to deal very heavy blows at Russian industry. The preparatory planning for such actions had been completed and we had made tests with a V-1 projectile carried to the target area by a long-range bomber, with a so-called suicide pilot to steer it directly on to the target. Many of these pilots were already waiting for their suicide missions. Their attacks were to be launched against the industrial combines in the QI Bishop, Chelyabinsk and Magnetogusk areas, and against the Dunitz Basin. These nerve centers had been decided on with the help of experienced technicians who had carefully analyzed each plant according to its nature and location. The operations were to be aimed mainly at central power plants, transformers, and blast furnaces. However, all these well thought out plans were frustrated by the inadequacy of the Luftwaffe. We were able to carry out only small scale raids which blew up some high tension transformers, important electric pylons, and so on. But, of course, these were mere pinpricks and were without any real effect, except that they tied down a certain number of the NKVD's security forces. But this did not in any way affect the frontline strength of the Russian armies. Other plans included the dropping of battalions of specially trained Russians, commanded by Baltic German SS leaders, in several of the large and more isolated Russian labor camps. The guards were to be overpowered and the inmates, in some cases numbering 20,000 or more, liberated and helped to make their way back to the settled areas. Apart from the labor force that would have been lost to the Russians, 
the propaganda effect on the population would have been considerable. Preparations for one of these actions had been carried to the point of our establishing contact with the inmates of one such labor camp. However, the Luftwaffe failed us again. They were certainly willing, but they were hampered by shortages of material and delays in the aircraft construction program. Later, we employed the men who had been trained for these missions on tasks behind the Russian lines, where they were able to organize the return of seriously wounded soldiers and even of small units that had become isolated. Valuable psychological support was given us secretly by the so called Vlasov Army, which had inscribed on its banner, the liberation of Russia from the Soviet regime. There was a secret agreement between us and General Vlasov, a deserter from the Russian army and his staff which gave him the right to build up his own secret service in the Soviet Union, provided that any information he secured was made available to me. This form of cooperation suited me admirably. Certainly our Russian colleagues worked with an entirely different spirit now that they were fighting for their freedom and for a new Russia, without the discouraging effect of German interference in their work. Hitler's and Himmler's refusal to grant General Vlasov recognition until the bitter end, and not to employ his forces until then, was a fundamental error that sprang from the arrogant determination not to give autonomy even to the smallest group, and from an unholy fear that Vlasov might not be entirely sincere and might open an important sector of the front to a Russian breakthrough. There was also the fear of organized resistance in Germany, for with such a tremendous number of foreign workers, especially the millions of Soviet Russians employed in the Reich, such a possibility could not be ignored. This situation was Muller's particular hobby horse. He would point to it as a growing danger and one that made it impossible for him to guarantee industrial peace. The doubts about Vlasov's reliability did not really affect the question, for there was ample opportunity to employ his army in a sector of the front where German units could have been attached to it to guard against any danger of his defection. As to who should claim authority over him and his army, there was an unpleasant conflict that must have made Vlasov laugh. At one time, the army claimed jurisdiction, then Rosenberg's Eastern Ministry, then Himmler, and finally, astonishing as it may seem, Ribbentrop put in a claim. The best thing would have been to mount all these gentlemen on Cossack ponies and send them into battle ahead of Vlasov's army. This would have solved the problem once and for all. After the psychological and ideological preparation of the volunteers, their practical training began, with special attention being given to their instruction in wireless transmission. Because of their large number, and the shortage of teaching staff, their training had to be carried out with military discipline, and as all the volunteers had to use pseudonyms the whole time, considerable confusion resulted. Of course, the NKVD succeeded in inflicting sizable losses on us. Still worse, they began to send their own people through the front lines to infiltrate Operation Zeppelin and undermine it from within. In order to fly the agents into Russia, a combat squadron was put at our disposal but the military and political sectors of the secret service, which at that time was still working separately, and often at cross-purposes, had to share between them the limited number of aircraft and the very limited supplies of fuel. Consequently, the dispatch of the agents on their various missions fell further and further behind schedule. Nothing is more destructive of an agent's nerve and morale than to keep him waiting too long before sending him out. We therefore organized the agents who were waiting into a combat unit called Drazina. This organization was to help maintain security behind the lines and, in case of need, to go into action against partisan bands. Their commander was the Russian colonel called Rodionov, known as Gil, with whom I had already had a conversation. Now, as a result of further talks with him, I began to feel that his original opposition towards the Stalinist system was beginning to undergo some modification. He considered Germany's treatment of the Russian population, and of her prisoners of war, catastrophic. These were things against which I had protested in vain. On the other hand, I had to defend him as point of view. I told Gil not to forget that the conduct of the war and the methods employed were getting harsher and more ruthless on both sides. When one considered the partisan war, 
It was very doubtful whether the Russians were not guilty of equal or even greater crimes than the Germans. He reminded me in turn of our propaganda about the subhuman Russian people. It was he himself, I said, who had chosen the word propaganda, in wartime it was difficult to draw clear cut lines of morality. I was convinced that the white Russians, Ukrainians, Georgians, Azerbaijan, Turkmen and other minorities would understand these slogans for what they were, merely expressions of wartime propaganda. When we began to suffer reverses in Russia our secret service work naturally became more difficult. At the same time certain complications arose about the direction of Drazina, and finally, in spite of my repeated warnings, what I had feared would occur actually happened. Drazina had once again been employed in the ruthless screening of a partisan village. Whilst guarding a long column of partisan prisoners on their march back to concentration camps behind the lines, Colonel Rodionov ordered his men to attack the SS detachment accompanying them. Taking the Germans completely by surprise, the Russians massacred every one of them in the most bestial manner. Men who had originally been sincere collaborators had slowly become our most bitter enemies. Rodionov had made contact with the Central Organization for Partisan Warfare in Moscow and had forced his subordinates to turn against us. After the massacre he took off from a hidden airbase of the Partisans and flew to Moscow. He was received by Stalin personally and decorated with the Stalin Order. This was a serious setback for which, however, I was not personally held responsible, for I had asked Himmler again and again to withdraw Rodjonov from anti-partisan combat. Besides the arrangements made for recruiting Russian manpower for the secret service, a file was established in which the more skilled Russian prisoners were recorded. In the course of time these valuable specialists were taken out of the dull and useless prisoner of war life and given an opportunity to work at the jobs for which they were qualified electrical engineering, chemistry, steel production, and so on. In time their mistrust was overcome, they organized debating societies and study groups, and grew accustomed to lectures by German experts. Through collaboration directed on psychological lines such as these, much valuable material was gained which helped us not only to assess Russia's scientific progress, but also to stimulate our own defense industry. In addition to mass employment there were also special assignments. Volunteers who were considered suitable for these were given civilian clothes and properly housed, mostly in private lodgings belonging to the secret service. The third sector in our department was responsible for the work of the Wansi Institute, so called because it had been moved from its original home in Breslau to the Berlin suburb of Wansi. The institute was a library which contained the largest collection of Russian material in Germany. The special value of this unique collection was that it also included a wealth of scientific literature in the original languages. The head of the institute was a Georgian, who held both Russian and German professorships, and the staff was selected from librarians, scholars and Russian language teachers from various universities. They were allowed to travel in occupied parts of Russia so as to maintain contact with the Russian people, and to be able to gather first-hand material. The institute had proved extremely valuable even before the war with Russia, assembling information on Russian roads and railways, on the economic and political basis of the Soviet regime, and on the aims and composition of the Politburo. The wide experience and scientific thoroughness of its members meant that their work led to important conclusions on problems such as those of nationalities and minorities, the psychology of the Kolkhoz and Sovkhoz, the collective and state farms, and on many other questions. In 1942, the Institute was able to offer the first proofs that the statistical and scientific material made available to the public by the Soviet Union was unreliable. It had been altered or shall we say, adjusted, so that the outside world would not be able to measure the state of development in any field of production, knowledge or social activity. In time our collecting sector was able to produce additional material to support this hypothesis. The Russians for their part had set up an institution whose sole task was to check all the material published in the various fields of science, statistics, chemical formulae, and so forth 
and falsify them at decisive points. At the same time, this institute rigorously controlled the various fields of research and under special secrecy regulations distributed the correct material only to those Russian scientists and technicians who needed it for their work. Thus, population figures and other demographic data, as well as maps of Soviet Russia, were falsified. Although this could not inflict any great damage on us, it did lead to complications. As a further example of the work done by the Wansi Institute, I should like to mention an incident that took place in 1943. The catastrophe of Stalingrad had already occurred and had induced Hitler to declare total war. The German lines in Russia were still holding, but we had sustained heavy defeats. It seemed as though we should soon lose North Africa, and with it our ability to threaten the British lifeline at Suez, thereby increasing the possibility of an Allied invasion of the continent. Taken in conjunction, these factors should have led to a change of our general policy, as well as in our military strategy in Russia, not to mention in our occupation policies in the defeated countries. Having summarized these considerations, I presented them to Himmler. I purposely confined my comments to the Soviet Union because I wanted to give a sound and solid report on Russia's industrial and war potential, which had been analyzed to the smallest detail. We had employed all our secret intelligence sources and had questioned, separately and individually, thousands of Russian prisoners. My aim was to establish the need, or rather the duty, of our leaders to mobilize and make use of all physical, moral and material resources in the German occupied areas of Russia. At the end of the report I made some extremely forthright suggestions, armed with a sharp dialectical edge. I intended to give the leaders a serious jolt. The Reichskommissars in Russia who headed the German political administration should be withdrawn, as well as the Einsatzgruppen, the special units which cleaned up behind the German lines. Autonomous states should be created at once and the German administration of industry and agriculture in them should be completely and simultaneously overhauled. The result was a report of some 50 pages, with considerable additional data. On the whole, it was a very good piece of work. However, after Hitler had read it he discussed it with Himmler, and then ordered the arrest on a charge of defeatism of all the experts who had helped to compile it. This was a triumph for Colton Brunner. Later he and Himmler met and had a heated discussion about my intellectual and out-of-step attitude. Colton Brunner blamed Himmler for my favored treatment and demanded that I should be subject to the same rules and discipline as the other heads of departments in the Reich Security Ministry. My next interview with Himmler was a very rough one. He castigated all my experts, called the scientists of the 1C Institute, and especially their chief, Professor A agents of the NKVD. He attacked me too, and said the burdens of my post were obviously becoming too heavy for me and that I was beginning to fall under the defeatist influence of some of my assistants. I could not suppress a smile at this, whatever it might have cost me. Himmler was so astonished by this reaction that he looked like a scared rabbit, he had never encountered insubordination of this sort before. But I could react in no other way psychologically it seemed to be the correct reaction, for it dissipated the dangerous tension. On von Terrible, Himmler said, with a shake of his head. And with that I knew I had won. I then began quietly but forcibly to state my case. After two hours there was no longer any talk of arresting anyone. Instead, a thoughtful Himmler sat before me, chewing his thumbnail. Well, he said, it would be terrible if you were right. Still, one cannot let intellectual considerations deflect one into showing weakness, there is too much at stake. If we don't manage to overcome the East this time, we shall disappear from history. I believe we should follow your conclusions only after we've won the war against Russia. That's the decisive point, I said, when to start on this new course. But I must repeat, if we don't start now we may never have a chance to start at all. In the end, I failed to convince Himmler. Still, I had succeeded in defending my assistants and the political line of my department. Today that may seem unimportant, even academic, 
especially for those who have never been embroiled in a war of nerves and cannot appreciate the inner excitement and disappointments one suffers. To decide to continue one's own line of policy in these circumstances required some courage, for Hitler's sensitivity and pathological suspicion rose in direct ratio to the deterioration of our general situation. 29 wrote Kapelle combating Russian espionage, a report on the problem, extent of the Russian network, a spy trio arrested, discovery and breakdown of a code, the Luftwaffe involved, more arrests tracing a Russian transmitter. The search for Gilbert, the enemy grows suspicious, profiting from experience Sidikonosov, Russian ambassador in Berlin until the outbreak of war in 1941, had been the power behind the Russian secret service in Germany. The story of the Vietinghoff brothers, and many other cases of Russian espionage, both in Germany itself and the territories occupied by us, had aroused Hitler's intense interest and again and again he demanded information about our counter-espionage work. He believed the Russian secret service to be much more thorough and probably much more successful than the British or any other secret service. In this case his intuition was to prove correct. Towards the end of 1941 he had already ordered that steps must be taken immediately to counter the rapidly spreading Russian espionage activities in Germany and the occupied countries. Himmler was asked to supervise the close collaboration of my Foreign Secret Service Department with Müller's Security Department of the Gestapo, and the Abwehr of Canaries. This operation, to which we gave the code name of Rotkapel, Red Orchestra, was coordinated by Heydrich. Through our united efforts we not only discovered the largest Russian spiring in Germany and the occupied countries, but also managed to a very large extent to break it up. After Heydrich's assassination in May 1942, Himmler had taken on the job of coordinating and supervising Rotkapel. Very soon serious tension arose between him and Müller, which worsened to such an extent that sometimes when Müller and I were reporting to him together, Müller, many years my senior, would be sent out of the room so that Himmler could discuss matters with me alone. Müller was intelligent enough to recognize this situation, and whenever he had anything particularly difficult to bring up would ask me to do it for him. Once with an ironical smile, he said to me, obviously he likes your face better than my Bavarian mug. In July 1942, Himmler ordered both of us to appear at Supreme Headquarters in East Prussia with a full report on Rote Capel. We had only a few hours in which to get the report ready, and when we met, Muller began by telling me how invaluable my reports on Rote Capel had always been to him, and how very comprehensive my knowledge of Russia's spying activities seemed to be. After a few more obvious flatteries, he asked me to take the report to Himmler for both of us. But I said that as I was responsible for only about 30% of what had been achieved he might as well report on the matter himself. No, he said, you'll get the red carpet, I'll probably get the boot. I was not then aware of Muller's real reasons for this request. He must already have been planning to pull out from the work against the Russian secret service but I shall refer to this later. When I arrived at Supreme Headquarters I was surprised to hear that Himmler had ordered Canaries to report to him at the same time. He had planned to discuss the matter with Hitler that evening and wanted to have us all available to answer any questions. Himmler was in a very bad mood that day. He probably realized that Müller was avoiding a discussion with him. He read the first paragraphs of the report, it was to go to Hitler and at once began to criticize it in the most disagreeable way. It was obviously biased, he said, the credit due to the foreign counterintelligence of the Wehrmacht, Canaries's organization, and the military wireless counterintelligence were not fairly presented. Are you responsible for this report or is Müller? He asked with a malevolent sneer. I said that I was dot that is typical of him, he said to belittle other people's achievements so as to put himself in the most favorable light. A thoroughly petty attitude, and you can tell him I said so. Dot to make things worse, he called in Connery's and asked him for details of the Abwes collaboration with military wireless security on the case. 
it became increasingly clear that Mu'allah had somewhat distorted the truth in his own favor. Himala became quite unpleasant towards me, forgetting that it was not I who was responsible for the report. In the end he realized this. I give you the right to repeat this reprimand to Mullah word for word, he said. The Fra was so upset by this report and by the treachery it revealed, that he did not wish to speak to anyone, so neither Canaries nor I was required to report to him. That evening. Wrote Capel, the Russian espionage network, extended over the whole territory ruled by Germany at that time, as well as over the countries that were still neutral. With its many secret shortwave transmitters, it extended from Norway to the Pyrenees, from the Atlantic to the Oda, from the North Sea to the Mediterranean. As always, luck played an important part in its discovery. At the beginning of the campaign in the East, our wireless counterintelligence was very active. A few days after the beginning of the campaign, one of our listening posts in the West detected the presence of a transmitter, but was unable to establish its position. Wireless direction finders indicated that it was in the area of Belgium, but it was impossible to pinpoint it more accurately. This unsolved problem led to discussions between General Thel, the chief of wireless security, Muller, Canaries and myself. Wireless counterintelligence later detected a transmitter that was apparently working in the Berlin area, but within a few days of counterintelligence's efforts to pinpoint it, the transmitter ceased operating, and did not appear again. Our calculations indicated that the receiver to which this transmitter was beamed must have been in the neighborhood of Moscow, and was probably a large central station. It was obvious that the transmitter was being operated by agents of the Russian Secret Service in a code which we had not broken. Special branches staffed by Mueller's most able officials were now working hard in Belgium and France, as well as in the Berlin area. The Belgian section of our counter espionage began to get results. And at the end of 1941, after consulting Canaries and me, Muella decided to make an arrest in a suburb of Brussels. Three members of the Russian Secret Service were taken into custody. One, Mikhail Makarov, was the director of a post for collecting information, another, Anton Danilov, was a train wireless operator, while the third, Sofia Poznanska, worked as cipher clerk. This espionage group lived together in a small villa in which the secret transmitter was also situated. Their interrogation proved extremely difficult, as all three made repeated attempts to commit suicide, and refused to give any information at all. The Belgian housekeeper, who had been arrested at the same time, gave us only the vaguest information. Although she was ready to tell all she knew, this was of very little use to our investigation. After a long interrogation we finally managed to get it out of her that the three agents frequently read books which lay about on their table, and she told us several of their titles. As it was often our own practice to use a code based on sentences out of various books, we began to hunt for copies of those that she had seen them reading, there were eleven in all. Bookshops and publishers all over France and Belgium were ransacked for copies. In the meantime, the mathematical department of wireless security and the decoding section of the Wehrmacht Supreme Command worked feverishly on a fragment of an already encoded message found in the fireplace of the villa, half of it burned to ashes. The decoding section came to the conclusion that a code based on French books was involved and by mathematical analysis a small fragment of a key sentence was reconstructed. This contained the name Proctor. Now, having at long last found the eleven books, came the task of searching them for the name Proctor. The right book was eventually found, the key sentence identified and the decoding section of OKW then set to work. In due course they managed to decode the message found in Brussels and others which our monitors had picked up in the meantime. The results were truly astonishing, they revealed the workings of an extensive network of the Russian secret service, with links that ran through France, Holland, Denmark and Sweden to Germany, and from there on to Russia. One of the chief agents was a man who sent his wireless messages, invariably they contained important secret information, under the code name of Gilbert. In Germany two chief agents were actively at work under the code names of Cora and Arvid. 
there was no doubt that their information could only have come from the highest levels of the German government. The chief agent for Belgium, who worked under the code name of Kent, still remained undiscovered. He had escaped when we made the arrests in Brussels at the end of 1941. Our entire security organization was now working at full pressure, but time passed and we were still unable to get onto the track of the two agents in Germany. Then one small chance took a hand. Our decoding section came across a wireless message which in itself seemed relatively unimportant. But it revealed that Kent had been instructed by Moscow in the autumn of 1941 to go to Berlin and visit three addresses which were given in the message. This was the first real break in the case, for now we had not only the real names of those involved, but also their code names and their addresses. General Thel, of decoding and wireless security, Colonel von Bentiveni, of the military counterintelligence, Canaries and I immediately initiated a joint surveillance which in Berlin alone involved some 60 people. After about a month we decided to arrest most of these, but to leave a few at liberty so that the spying could continue to operate for the Russians. The situation revealed that a colonel of the engineers, named Becker, who played a decisive part in the aerotechnical development of our fighters and bombers was a communist who passed highly secret information to a central transmitter in the north of Berlin, whence it was sent to Moscow. Further investigations revealed that at least five other persons who had high positions on the general staff of the Luftwaffe, were suspect. A lieutenant colonel of the general staff, Charles Boyson, was also arrested. His was the fanatical driving force of the whole espionage ring in Germany, he not only furnished secret information to the Russians, but was also active as a propagandist. On one occasion, at five o'clock in the morning, wearing Wehmacht uniform, he threatened a subordinate agent with a pistol in the street because the man had neglected his communist propaganda work in a certain factory. Another member of the ring was Obrajirungs Ratharnak, a high civil servant, whose wife was an American Jewess. He was responsible for planning the allocation of raw materials in the Ministry of Economics. Through the information that he continually furnished to the Russians they knew more about our raw materials situation than, for instance, the responsible departmental chief in the Armament Supply Ministry, to whom such information was not divulged because of red tape and conflicts between various authorities. Among the large number of those arrested at this time was Legation Srat von Celia, first secretary at the foreign office, who carried out assignments the for the Russian secret service. He worked entirely by means of society espionage. Not only did he know everything that went on in the Fujian office, but his apartment became a favorite meeting place in the evenings for the whole diplomatic colony, from whom he collected secret information with cold-blooded skill and in the most methodical manner. The Russian secret service, in fact, had its agents in important positions in every ministry of the Reich, and was able to send secret information in the quickest way by means of secret wireless transmitters. Naturally, these circles were centers of resistance against Hitler and his policies, and against National Socialism in general. But resistance to Hitler and his regime was not the primary cause of their treason, nor did money make much appeal, except to some lesser agents. Their basic motive can be explained only in spiritual terms, escape from the ideologically sick western world into eastern nihilism. The arrests continued, new circles of suspects were uncovered, and the special units were kept working strenuously and for long hours. In the end, hundreds of people were dragged into the whirlpool caused by our security measures and were prosecuted. Some of them perhaps were only sympathizers but during the war the harsh principle of caught together, hung together applied. In the meantime a new transmitter had appeared in the vicinity of Marseille. Wireless counterintelligence suspected that this was the successor to the transmitter which we had uncovered in Brussels. This was deduced from the nature of the signal and the code that was used. At the same time new transmitters appeared in Belgium, Holland and many other places. The signal they sent out seemed to indicate that they all belonged to the same spiring. It became increasingly difficult to locate these transmitters, 
as the Russians had learned from experience and were careful not to make the same mistake twice. In the course of a large scale investigation in Paris, counterintelligence accidentally came across a circle of persons who, in their interrogations, gave information about Kent which enabled us to establish his identity. He traveled under an alias and with a South American passport. Gilbert's name also was discovered in Brussels. He was a German communist who had been trained for many years in Moscow. On the basis of this small bit of information a general search for Kent and Gilbert was started throughout the European continent. The quarry turned up under various names, Kaufman, Vincent Sears, Trepper, and others. For months the hunt for these people went on. Only after the most painstaking surveillance and tireless work by our agents were we finally able to pick up Kent's trail in Brussels. His downfall was brought about by his love for a beautiful Hungarian girl, who had the code name Blondine and whose real name was Marguerite Marza. They had a lovely daughter, and Kent was extremely attached to this woman and their child. We knew that once we had found the woman, Kent would turn up sooner or later. Marguerite never betrayed her friend, but involuntarily she led him to us. When we finally interrogated Kent, his concern for her proved invaluable. He would do anything for this woman, if necessary give up his life for her. Thus, for the first time we were able to establish contact with the central station in Moscow, using Kent's transmitter for our own purposes. Over a period of several months we managed to pass misleading information of considerable importance to the Russian secret service and caused much confusion the dot after this successful appropriation of Kent's transmitter, we managed to do the same with a number of other transmitters, until finally about 64 transmitters were sending misleading information to Moscow. Of course. The Russian secret service noticed the setbacks their work was now suffering and tried even harder to frustrate our counter espionage activities. The search for Gilbert and his secret transmitter proved extremely difficult. As soon as our investigations disclosed enough for the direction finders to begin the process of closing in on him, he would cease transmission, and then start up again in a spot perhaps as much as 60 miles away. Whenever we decided to go in and make a raid we would find nothing, then, as if he were making fools of us on purpose, that same night the transmitter would be sending out its messages from a different town. But finally our relentless search brought us success. In the course of investigating communist resistance groups in Belgium, we found a man who had once worked as Gilbert's right hand man. He was a special courier trained in Moscow a former German communist who had lived for a long time in Belgium and held an important post with the German authorities. At the time, he was running a shortwave station which served as a liaison between the Red Marquis and the Belgian resistance movement. The transmitter was then diverted from this activity, and he received permission from the Russians to take up direct communication with Moscow. In reality, however, he was an agent we had turned around. This time we furnished him not with false material, but with valid material, for our purpose was to establish contact with Gilbert, whose headquarters were in Paris. In this way the agent succeeded in reawakening Gilbert's interest, and a closer collaboration between them developed. Gilbert, however, remained extremely careful and suspicious. First of all we approached his secretary. Then our special search unit decided on a sudden raid in which they would be able to grab both the secretary and Gilbert. But luck was against us, for, when the search unit went to make the arrest, they discovered that Gilbert had gone to the dentist. They were unable to find the dentist's address and a wild goose chase through Paris developed. We had got to arrest Gilbert before he could be warned. At the last moment we managed to get the name of the dentist from the concierge of a neighboring house and the moment the dentist had finished his treatment, Gilbert was seized by quite a different pair of forceps, those of the German aid where he gave in quite quickly and his well-equipped station was afterwards used by us to carry on our work of misleading the Russians. We now began to notice that the Russians were gradually starting to direct radio messages both from their own transmitters and from those under our control towards a central reception network. Here the information was passed on to a specially trained valuation group. 
Obviously they were growing suspicious of the information they were getting. Therefore, for about three months we sent out accurate and valuable information, even though we had considerable misgivings, and gradually we managed to allay their suspicions of the material they were receiving. Again and again new transmitters appeared. The battle flared up in Brussels, Antwerp, Copenhagen, Stockholm, Berlin, Budapest, Vienna, Belgrade, Athens, Istanbul, Rome, Barcelona, Marseille, and again and again the direction finding units went into action. The search was most difficult of all in the neutral countries, where the apparatus, the technicians and the agents all had to be carefully camouflaged. Naturally the technical discoveries made in the course of this work were of the greatest value to me, for as chief of the active intelligence service, I had to exploit the experience thus gained in order to acquire better and less easily traceable wireless transmitters than the enemy services possessed. The work on Rote Capel was to continue right up to the end of the war. The silent struggle became more and more intense until the conflict was carried on not only in Germany and the countries occupied by her, but throughout the world. Xxx's assassination of Heydrich Heydrich discusses the shortcomings of the army, Bormann and Himmler jealous of his success in Moravia, Heydrich's car blown up, slaughter of Czech partisans, Heydrich's funeral, Himmler delivers an oration. His interest in my future in the spring of 1942 a series of conferences which I had to attend had been arranged by Heydrich at the Radkony Palace in Prague. I was just preparing to return to Berlin by air when he asked me to stay another night so that I could dine with him. I was overworked and irritable and rather sickened by the prospect of an evening which would probably end in a drunken orgy. However, this time I was mistaken and we spent a most interesting evening discussing the problems that were foremost in Heydrich's mind. To my surprise, he criticized Hitler's decision to take over the supreme command of the army. He did not doubt Hitler's ability as a commander, but he feared that he would not be able to cope with this additional burden. Then he began to revile the generals of the supreme command. When they were with Hitler they said yes to everything. They were too slow and too dumb to remember any difficulty until they had left the room. Heydrich was disgusted with the shortages of supplies for the army. Goebbels' Bickledunk's action, the drive to collect civilian winter clothing for the troops, had been carried out with the usual fanfares but also with a great deal of genuine enthusiasm. However, this did not remedy the damage that had been done. Heydrich suggested that for every hundred German soldiers who froze to death, someone in the quartermaster's department, starting from the very top, should be shot. It was a crime to have sent combat troops wearing summer uniforms to face the Russian winter. Field Marshal von Braukitsch, whom Hitler had dismissed, had been used simply as a scapegoat. Certainly he was partly to blame, but those who were directly responsible were still sitting in their cozy offices, slightly sobered but still flashing around with their gold braid. Hitler was relying more and more on Himmler, who was a good tactician and could exploit his present influence with the Fra. If only he would let himself be advised by me, said Heydrich. He then touched briefly on the problem of France and Belgium. His aim was to increase his own authority and organization by appointing supreme SS and police leaders there since there was no longer likely to be any opposition from the Wehrmacht leaders. I did not agree with this idea. The administrative problems would become unnecessarily complicated, and it was already difficult to find suitable men for these important posts. Heydrich concurred absent-mindedly, then suddenly said, Himmler insists on it, and just at this moment I must show my goodwill. The situation between us is pretty tense just now. Apparently, there had been differences between him and Himmler, who had become jealous. Heydrich's policy in the Protectorate had been a great success, and the Fuhrer was very satisfied with his plans and the measures he had taken. He had begun to confer with Heydrich alone, and although Heydrich was greatly honored by the favors showered on him, he was worried because of the jealousy and antagonism of Bormann and Himmler. He was afraid that Bormann would react by stimulating intrigues. Timler was more likely to be just mean and bloody minded. Things had really become very difficult for Heydrich. 
So far his successors had served to protect him with the fur, but he felt by no means secure and could not see how to resist the restraints which the rivalry of Bormann and Himmler imposed upon him. To attack either of them openly was always dangerous, for Hitler felt even more strongly than Himmler about the internal loyalty of the SS. He felt that in any case it was almost too late, for it was only a matter of time, and that time was coming fairly soon, before Hitler succumbed to their promptings, and then he would turn against him. Heydrich was considering the possibility, he said, of trying to get me attached to Hitler's entourage, but I managed to talk him out of this idea. However, before I left for Berlin he brought the matter up again. It was particularly important that he should have someone looking after his interests up there. Also he felt it would be a good thing for me to report directly to the fountainhead for a time. Finally we arrived at a compromise, I was to remain in Berlin for another month, and in the meantime he would arrange a six weeks assignment for me at Hitler's headquarters. However, it was not to be. Shortly afterwards I had to go to The Hague to discuss ultra shortwave transmissions with some technical experts. It was while I was there in June 1942, that a teletype message reached me saying an attempt had been made to assassinate Heydrich and that he was seriously injured. I was instructed to return to Berlin at once. I wondered who was behind the attempt, and I remembered Heydrich's recent difficulties with Himmler and Bormann. I could well imagine that people who knew Heydrich's methods would be afraid of him, and they both knew that he would shrink from nothing where his own ruthless schemes were involved. His successes in the protectorate must have been very galling to Himmler and Bormann and the tension between the three of them had obviously been at breaking point, or Heydrich would not have mentioned it every time we talked. It was the practice of Hitler and Himmler to rule by playing their associates off one against the other but with a man like Heydrich this was impossible. Besides, as head of the Rye Security Office, and also as acting Rye Protector, he had become too powerful for them. I suddenly remembered an incident which Heydrich had mentioned to me. During his last meeting with Hitler he had been called on to report about certain economic problems in the protectorate. He had been waiting for quite a long while outside Hitler's bunker, when he suddenly came out accompanied by Bormann. Heydrich had greeted him in the prescribed manner, and then waited for Hitler to ask for his report. Hitler stared at him for a moment, then an expression of distaste came over his face. With a confident and easy gesture Bormann took the Führer's arm and drew him back into the bunker. Heydrich waited, but Hitler did not return. The next day Bormann told him the Führer was no longer interested in his report. Although Bormann had said this in the most amiable tone, Heydrich sensed his implacable hatred. Hitler's antagonistic attitude on this occasion was obvious, and was probably based on hints and slanders put about by Bormann and Himmler. It was interesting that in my last conversations with him, Heydrich, although convinced of his own powers, had shown that he was afraid. There was little doubt that he had been filled with foreboding, and his anxiety to place me in Hitler's entourage undoubtedly sprang from this feeling. The attempt on his life certainly had its effect on the work of the central office in Berlin. Instead of the hum of intensive activity, there was a hush of incredulity, almost of fear. How could such a thing have happened? Himmler ordered me to fly at once to Prague where the chiefs of AMT4 and V, Müller and Nibi, were already on the scene. I arranged for a consultation with Müller, who promised me a short report. Heydrich lay unconscious in hospital, where the best doctors were attempting to save his life. Bomb splinters had torn his body, forming numerous centers of infection. Part of the material of his uniform had penetrated his wounds and intensified the danger to his injured spleen. On the seventh day, general sepsis set in, which quickly brought about his death. Towards the end he was under the care of Himmler's personal physician, Professor Jebhardt, whose treatment provoked serious criticism by the other specialists. One opinion was that an operation to remove the injured spleen should have been attempted so as to get rid of the main source of infection. Later I received from Müller an account of how the assassination occurred. Heydrich was on his way back from his country estate near Prague to the Hradkony. He was sitting beside the driver who was not his usual chauffeur, 
in his big Mercedes. On the outskirts of the city there was a sharp bend and the car had had to slow down. Three men were standing at intervals along the roadside, the first about twenty yards before the bend, the next one on the bend itself, and the third about twenty yards beyond it. As the driver slowed down the first man jumped into the road, shooting wildly with his revolver. The car came almost to a stop and at this moment the second man rolled a spherical bomb towards the car which exploded directly underneath it. Although badly wounded, Heydrich shouted to the driver, step on it, man. He then jumped out of the car and fired several shots at the men, who were making their escape on bicycles, and wounded one of them in the leg. Then he collapsed, unconscious. The driver was bleeding profusely and the car, in spite of its heavy armor, was almost demolished. Had Heydrich's old and experienced chauffeur been at the wheel, he certainly would not have let himself be duped by the assassin who jumped out into the road. The natural reaction of a quick-witted driver would have been to jam his foot on the accelerator so that the car would have leapt ahead then the effect of the explosion would not have been so devastating. After long examination, the specialists of the Crime in All Technices Institute, the Institute of Criminal Technology, found that the bomb was of an unusual and clever construction hitherto unknown. Its explosive mechanism could be adjusted according to the distance which it was to be rolled, in this case about eight yards, and it must have worked with extraordinary precision. The explosive itself was alleged to be of English origin, but this gave no indication of the identity of those behind the act, for in our own service we used almost exclusively a certain type of captured English explosive. It could be molded into any shape and was of very high power. The investigation was conducted with all the resources of modern detective science. The official directive stated that the assassins were members of the Czech resistance movement. Every possible clue was followed up, many suspects were arrested, and all known hideouts raided. In fact, police action was conducted against the entire Czech resistance movement. The reports read like the script of an exciting film. Finally, four possible theories were evolved, but none led to a solution. The assassins were never captured not even the one with the injured leg. Through the ruthless action of the Gestapo, a hundred and twenty members of the Czech resistance movement were finally rounded up in a small church in Prague, where they were besieged. On the day before the church was to be captured, I went, acting on Himmler's orders, to see Müller. On the telephone Himmler had said to me, it's rather difficult to keep track of this investigation. That was all he had to say about his feelings in the matter. I had nothing to do directly with Müller's investigations in Prague, nor did he speak his mind very openly to me at first, though later he began to talk more freely. The Reichsfuhrer was gradually driving him crazy, for Himmler had made up his mind that the whole affair was staged by the British Secret Service, and that the three assassins had been dropped by parachute near Prague for this special purpose. Müller admitted that such a theory was possible, for after all, the whole Czech underground is financed and directed on one hand by the British, on the other by Moscow. Tomorrow we'll take this church, and that will be the end of the matter. Let's hope that the murderers will be with the ones inside. Muller looked at me quickly as he said this, then asked, Have you any inside information? I thought Himmler said that you might have. I was sorry to disappoint him. After I had left his office. I could not help reflecting that Müller wasn't altogether happy in this affair. Somewhere something was not quite right. The next day an all-out attack was launched against the church. Of the Czech resistance fighters, none fell into German hands alive. The secret of who Heydrich's assassins were was thus preserved. Had they been in the church? Were they members of the Czech resistance movement, and, if so, of what part of it? All those inside the church had been killed, though whether this was done on purpose or not remains uncertain. Their fanatical resistance and determination to die was emphasized in the report that was made afterwards, but of those 120 members of the underground there was not one who had previously been wounded. Our investigations had come to an impasse, 
and with it the inquiry into Heydrich's death was brought to a close. Heydrich's body had been placed on a ceremonial bier in the forecourt of the castle at Prague and a guard of honor was chosen from his closest associates. It was a considerable strain for me to stand in full uniform with a steel helmet for two hours at a stretch with the temperature at 100 degrees in the shade. Three days later the body was borne in procession from the castle to the railway station, and thence to Berlin. The citizens of Prague followed these events attentively and many houses had black flags hanging from the windows. No doubt the citizens were using the occasion to show that they were mourning for their own fate under the foreign occupation. Before the funeral, Heydrich's body had lain in state for two days in the palais in the Wilhelmstrasse where he had had his beautifully furnished office. On the first morning, the chiefs of the departments were called into the office by Himmler. In a short address, he paid tribute to Heydrich's accomplishments, to the noble traits of his character, and to the value of his work. No one could ever control the giant machinery of the RSHA as well as Heydrich, who had created it and controlled it. The Freie had agreed that for the time being Himmler himself should take over its direction until Heydrich's successor had been chosen. He called upon the heads of the departments to do their best, and forbade all conflicts arising from jealousy. He warned them not to work against each other, or try to usurp each other's authority. Any such attempts would be sharply punished by Hitler himself. Pointing to the coffin on its spear and addressing each of the heads in turn, he gave them what was in effect a severe dressing down, speaking with a biting irony that emphasized their characteristics and defects. At the end, it was my turn. I steeled myself for what I was about to hear, expecting the cold shower of his criticism to envelop me as well. Himmler must have noticed my apprehension. A trace of a smile came over his face, which was deathly pale. He looked at me for a while, then turning more towards the others than to me, he said, Selmberg has the most difficult office, and is the youngest of us all. However, the man lying in state here considered him suitable for the position and placed him there. I too consider him capable of undertaking the tasks placed before him. Above all, he is incorruptible. You, gentlemen, no best the sort of difficulties you have been putting in his way. You resent him because of his youth, and because he is not an old member of the National Socialist Party. I do not consider there is any justification for your objections, and I wish to make it clear once and for all that the decision in this matter is mine, not yours. He is, so to speak, the Benjamin of our leadership corps, and therefore I shall give him my special support. I have said this openly and in his presence because it accords with the intentions of your murdered chief, and I consider Selenberg too intelligent to grow conceited because of what I have said. On the contrary, I hope it will be a further incentive to him to work carefully and industriously at the tasks assigned to him. If anyone wishes to say anything further on this matter, or on any other raised on this solemn occasion, he now has opportunity to do so. There was an oppressive silence. I had felt relatively calm until this moment, but now I began to blush, the more as Himmler again took up his theme, saying that from now on he wanted me to work closely with him, that he needed my abilities, and wished me to report to him as frequently as possible. Then, rather abruptly, he adjourned the meeting. In the evening, Himmler, accompanied by SS Obergruppenfuhrer Karl Wolf, again gathered all the leaders of the RSHA in Heydrich's office. This time he made a speech in which he dealt with the essential phases in Heydrich's personal development, and pointed out to the SS leaders their obligations to the memory of their dead chief. It should induce them to give the best of themselves in their conduct and their work. He ended with a reference to the increasing importance of our work abroad hoping that as we developed our shortcomings and the gaps in our tradition would be overcome, for our achievements in this special sector still could not compare with those of the British Secret Service. Therefore, our motto should be, my fatherland, right or wrong, as well as the general motto of our order, the SS, my honor is loyalty. At the memorial service in the Reich Chancellery which preceded the state funeral, orations were delivered by Hitler and Himmler. It was a most impressive spectacle, 
which did full justice to Himmler's gift for pageantry and drama. In their orations both Hitler and Himmler spoke of the man with the iron heart. I could not help thinking that with all the ministers, secretaries of state, high party officials, and family mourners, the whole thing was like a renaissance painting. After the coffin had disappeared into the earth, I saw, surprisingly enough, that Canaries was weeping, and when we turned to go he said to me in a voice choked with emotion, after all, he was a great man. I have lost a friend in him. About two months later, Himmler stood with me in front of a death mask of Heydrich. Suddenly he said, Yes, as the Führer said at the funeral, he was indeed a man with an iron heart. And at the height of his power, fate purposefully took him away. His voice was deadly serious, and I shall not forget the nod of Bode like approval that accompanied these words, while the small, Cold eyes behind the pince were suddenly lit with sparkle like the eyes of a basilisk. Three months later, going to Himmler's office to make a report, I noticed that the corner in which the mask had been placed was now empty, and I asked him why. He replied cryptically, Death masks are tolerable only at certain times and on special occasions, either for the sake of memory or example. In the summer of 1942, Himmler arranged to meet me in Berlin. As usual, he set aside ample time so that he could talk at length. After discussing various matters, I felt that our conversation was about to reach a dramatic climax. As usual, Himmler sat with his head a little to one side so that his glasses reflecting the light made it difficult to see his small, crafty eyes. Rising suddenly, he asked me to sit down with him at another table always a sign of unusual confidence. He explained to me that it was proving extremely difficult to find a successor to Heydrich, as none of the departmental heads could possibly be considered, with one exception, myself. I have talked to the Führer about this at various times. He leant forward, looking at me intently. I was well aware, of course, of the far-reaching implications of what he was saying and it took all my resolution to look him firmly in the eye. After an almost unbearable silence I finally managed to say in a strained voice, it would certainly be a very difficult position for me, and I think you might find me a rather awkward assistant. Again there was a pause. Then, with a decidedly benevolent change in his tone Himmler said, you won't be chosen. The Führer thinks that you are too young, although he agrees that you're well qualified. Personally, I think you're too soft for the job. The Fra wants you to concentrate entirely on the secret service abroad, he's shown much more interest in it lately, so you'll do that, whoever is appointed chief. The final choice will probably be between three or four of the higher police and SS leaders, the older ones, but I'll tell you more about that later. From now on you must maintain close contact with me the whole time. As far as the outside world is concerned, administratively, that is, you'll still function within the framework of the RSHA, but all decisive problems you'll discuss with me personally, and you'll have access to me at any time. Now, this is a special position and it won't make things any easier for you with other members of the department, nor with whoever is appointed chief, still less with other opponents of yours. You need this special position not only for yourself, but for your department, it must be given greater weight in its relations with the foreign office and other ministries. They must realize that you are acting as my direct representative. All the same, you mustn't neglect your health. I'll arrange leave for you whenever you need it, but you must take care to look after yourself, we shall need you later on. Try to live a life of abstinence, to live completely in the interest of your work. If you do this, you ought to be able to increase your output without expending any more energy. Later on, cases of fruit juices, mineral waters and all sorts of things to build me up were delivered to me regularly, in the future, Himmler went on, Kirsten, my own doctor, who is also a neurologist, will take charge of you. I want him to examine you, and if he considers it advisable, he'll treat you regularly, just as he treats me. He has worked wonders for me, and he certainly ought to do you a great deal of good. He is a Finn, and completely loyal to me personally, so you can trust him. The only thing is that you'll have to be careful. 
he talks too much. Also, he is very inquisitive. Otherwise he's not a bad fellow, good-natured and extremely helpful. After the years that have intervened, it is difficult to reproduce the impression that this conversation made upon me at the time. On the one hand, I felt as if I had been hit over the head, on the other, I felt extremely proud at the recognition of my work. But all the time I could not help wondering what would have happened if I had been chosen as Heydrich's successor. To reject the appointment would have been impossible, to accept it would have been fatal. I am sure I would not have fallen in with the methods which Hitler, and therefore Himmler, would have wanted. I left Himmler's study feeling very empty, as one feels, in fact, after some moment of great danger has passed. I was not really myself until several hours later, then I felt as happy as a small boy. That night I went out to celebrate with my wife and, in spite of Himmler's admonitions, drank a bottle of good wine. This conversation with Himmler gave me an interesting insight into the manner in which he used to work. He was consciously but very discreetly striving to create a new leadership for the Reich, naturally with Hitler's approval. This policy was to ensure that all those who held leading posts in the Reich ministries, in industry, commerce and trade, in science and culture, in short, in all spheres of the modern state, should be members of the SS. This process was almost completed, and it is easy to see what tremendous power was thus concentrated in the leader of the organization, that is, in Himmler himself. His aim so far as I was concerned was to build up a position of power for me that would open all doors and provide help in whatever quarter I needed it. It was really a marvelous system, and I felt a little ashamed that it would no longer be through my own achievements that such doors were being opened to me, but through some incalculable, anonymous, and all-pervading influence. Scarcely a week passed without Himmler's assistant arranging for me to call on some leader of importance, a minister or secretary of state, an economist, scientist, or military leader. Over all this Himmler maintained a close personal supervision. Years later he told me that the establishment of these relationships with important persons in the state and the party had been arranged not only for practical reasons of policy, but also as a kind of testing process. Directly or indirectly he had obtained their personal impressions of me. In considering the working of this secret scheme, I began to realize that the establishment of a secret service such as I envisaged would be impossible without some support of this kind. And still this was only the modest beginning of my idea, the preparatory work within one's own country. Here and the connections somewhat similar, if on a different level, began to be established in political, economic and military circles abroad. But all these were contacts which neither the other departmental heads nor the agents of the inner circle knew anything about. Xx plans for peace total victory no longer a possibility, obstacles to a negotiated peace military circles confident of our success, a rendezvous with Himmler, Dr. Kirsten, Himmler and German peace feelers, my plan discussed, outlines of a future Europe, my authority endorsed by Himmler my conversations during the summer of 1942 with the various heads of government departments, leading economists and scientific experts, considered in conjunction with the secret information that was continually coming to me gave me feelings of considerable uncertainty. What troubled me most was the war potential of the United States, which had not even been engaged yet, and the strength of the Red Army, which are Wehrmacht leaders, confident in their offensive power and the superiority of their strategic and tactical commands, still underestimated. The immense area of the Russian plains and the climatic conditions of the country had not been sufficiently taken into account. Although much progress had been made in mechanizing Wehrmacht units, again and again one heard of technical deficiencies. Tank tracks, for instance, were not wide enough and tanks were often bogged down in muddy roads, moving parts did not function properly in the extreme cold, very often the turrets could not turn, and many other defects cropped up in other types of armament. Our main industries, as yet unharmed by the effects of total war were working at top speed. At this moment we still stood on the dizzy heights and the Nazi leaders believed that victory was in sight. I felt, however, that for me this was the real turning point. 
I was forced to the conclusion that the idea of total victory, and its later version, final victory, could no longer be realized. This brought me to the problem of how to inform our leaders of these unpleasant facts, since they rigidly refused even to consider their possibility. My work had forced me to realize that our leaders had no real understanding of conditions abroad. Their actions were determined entirely by their own narrow political views. The Foreign Office did nothing to change this situation. There may have been people employed in that department who saw things just as I did, but they played no part in the formation of the political will. None of them was willing to advance from recognition of the facts to the inevitable conclusion, that the idea of final victory was impossible, still less would they stand up for their opinions in front of their superiors. I began to think seriously about the problem and came to the conclusion that as long as the Rai had the power to fight, it would also have the power to bargain. There was, in fact, still time to achieve a compromise with our enemies, but one would have to calculate coolly like a broker, it is better to lose 50% than risk complete bankruptcy and lose everything. At this time, in August 1942, our evidence showed that Stalin was dissatisfied with the Western Allies. That this seemed to offer a realistic basis for doing business was confirmed by the Japanese for, in spite of the passing setbacks we had suffered on the Eastern Front, they still considered that compromise negotiations with Russia were possible. The situation in the year 1942 had developed into a race for time. Britain was too weak to act alone, and was waiting for the arrival of American strategic material. Stalin was waiting not only for the delivery of material, but for effective relief in the opening of a real second front. So long as the Western Allies delayed their invasion, no matter from what motives, there was a good chance of conducting compromise negotiations. Germany's superiority of power at this time placed her in a good position to bargain with both sides. It was important therefore to establish contact with Russia at the same time as we initiated our negotiations with the West. An increasing rivalry between the Allied powers would strengthen our position. Such a plan had to be launched very carefully, however, and with regard to Russia we were handicapped by previous Japanese attempts to act as mediators, for we could negotiate more freely if we did not have to consider Japanese interests. But it was no use considering means of negotiating until our own leaders had been convinced of the necessity of our doing so. I was well acquainted with the attitude of Hitler and Ribbentrop, and it was the latter who seemed to be the main obstacle. Unfortunately, he was so firmly in Hitler's confidence that it was not possible to undermine his position. Goering was already more or less in disgrace. There remained only one man who had sufficient power and influence, that was Himmler. Of course the fact that I had immediate access to him was an important factor, for after Hitler he was, and remained to the very end, the most powerful man in the regime. For these reasons I determined at the first opportunity to exploit the possibilities of my position with him and make an attempt to launch plans for negotiations. But I still had a great amount of routine work and above all there was the carrying through of my 10-point program for the Secret Service. At the beginning of August 1942, I was called to make my usual report to Himmler at Sitima in the Ukraine, near Hitler's headquarters at Vinitsa. Himmler had requisitioned the beautifully situated officers' training college for himself and his staff. Within two days it had been transformed into a completely equipped field command post. Shortwave and telephonic communications had been installed to enable him to be in constant touch with even the most remote localities of the territories occupied by Germany. Everything for his personal needs was also provided, there was even a tennis court. In his heavy command car Himmler was driven every day over the so-called Rollbahn. This Rollbahn connected Zetima with Vinitsa where Himmler spent several hours every day with Hitler. One morning he telephoned to me from Vinitsa. First I spoke to his personal assistant, SS Standard and Führer Brandt, with whom I was on very good terms. Brandt was a small, plain-looking man, who in his appearance and gestures aped his master. A walking reference library, he was Himmler's living notebook and was the most industrious of all his entourage. 
I believe he was the only person in whom Himmler had complete confidence. Brandt would begin work at 7 in the morning, no matter what time he had gone to bed the night before. Three or four hours of sleep were sufficient for him. As soon as Himmler had risen in the morning and washed, Brandt would go to him loaded with papers and files, and while Himmler shaved he would read him the most important items of the morning's mail. This was done with the greatest seriousness. If there was bad news, Brandt would preface it by saying, Pardon, Herr Reichsfuhrer, and thus forewarned Himmler would temporarily suspend his shaving operations, a precautionary measure to prevent him cutting himself. Brandt was certainly most important. He was the eyes and ears of his master and the manner in which he presented the matter to Himmler was often of decisive importance. On this particular morning Brand asked how I was and how my work was going. From the sharp way in which he spoke I knew it would only be a matter of seconds before Himmler took the receiver from him. And so it was. Himmler flooded me with questions on various matters. It was his custom when speaking on the telephone to employ all sorts of private code words and names which he had invented himself and remembered with great accuracy. He could carry on a conversation consisting entirely of such words, which sometimes created difficulties for the person at the other end. He once asked me, and what is Heikler doing? Although by then I was quite familiar with his nomenclature, for a moment I could not think who he meant. Impatiently he explained, why, the long cellar, the entrance to the cellar, down in the pit, the mine, only then did I remember that Heikler was his code name for Schacht, the president of the Reichsbank, who always wore a high collar, and the other allusions were to his name, which means Shaft. That morning, however, I remembered all the code words, and at the end he ordered me to report at Zatimmer and bring various documents with me. That same evening I took the Wehmacht courier train from Berlin to Warsaw. There I was entertained with magnificent hospitality at the Royal Palace by Governor General Frank. Frank entertained all the higher Wehmacht, SS and party leaders en route to and from the Fras headquarters in the east. A message from Himmler awaited me. He wanted me to rest for a day in Warsaw so that I should not be too exhausted by my journey and then to take the special courier plane the next day. At Frank's palace I met many higher Wehmacht officers, divisional commanders of the Waffen SS, higher SS and police leaders, and it interested me to sound the opinions of all these people. On the whole, they were completely assured of the fighting power of the German people. On this score they had no doubts whatsoever and all were striving to achieve their utmost and to be 100% efficient. It made me even more conscious of the difficulty of the task I had set myself. For the confidence and assurance of all these important officers would strengthen and confirm the opinions of the leaders. Another interesting thing was that these circles, perhaps because of their origins, saw everything solely from a military point of view. They had only the haziest notion of the meaning of the secret service. Theirs was the prevailing German idea on the subject, which saw the secret service as a rather interesting and adventurous enterprise, but had little idea of its importance in the conduct of the war. The next morning I flew on to Zitima in Himmler's special aircraft, which had landed by chance at Warsaw. The flight captain was a Bavarian who had been Himmler's personal pilot for years. A few days later he went alone into a Russian village against Himmler's strictest orders and was murdered in the most horrible manner by the partisans. That morning, however, he had no foreboding of the fate that awaited him. Gazing over the vastness of the Polish and Russian planes from the flight deck of the foreign giant Condor, I saw only occasionally the marks of warfare. They ran like strips burnt by lightning across the face of the earth but for hundreds of miles to the right and left of them the country was completely untouched. Oppressive heat scorched the land and a vaporous haze in the sky arched over us like a great glass dome. There was an uninterrupted view to the horizon and as the engines droned on steadily hour after hour I began to have some understanding of what our troops had had to achieve in order to conquer this enormous area. Here and there one saw peasants at work. All were barefoot the women with coloured kerchiefs around their heads. Very few of them took any notice of the sound of our engines. Finally we arrived at the airfield, then came a rider's itamar at breakneck speed in a command car. 
The buildings shaded by tall trees were white and untouched by the war. Everything looked spick and span, as was always the case at any of Himmler's headquarters. He placed the greatest importance upon the best possible treatment being given to his guests. I was shown to my room at once and was able to take a shower, then while I waited I chatted with the various adjutants, experts and secretaries whom I knew. This I did with a purpose, because it was important to get the feeling of the atmosphere here. I was not to report until late in the afternoon, but when the time came there was another delay. I was then asked most politely how long I could remain away from Berlin. As I wanted to have time for a quiet talk with Himmler, I said one or two days would not make a great deal of difference. In the evening I was asked to dinner. Until the very last part of the war Himmler was insistent upon his guests appearing in trousers, white shirts, and shoes instead of military boots. He received me with great amiability, and for some little time made small talk, carefully refraining from coming to the point of my visit, as a mark of politeness. This was one of his conversational tactics. He questioned me very closely about my health, told me that Dr. Kirsten, who would certainly be happy to treat me, was there too, and asked whether I had had frequent conversations with Langben, and so on. At dinner he talked to me on various scientific questions and told me about an expedition to Tibet. Then he spoke of India and Indian philosophy. This led him to speak of a subject which was a hobby horse of his, in a lively manner he described to me the result of researches in German witchcraft trials. He said it was monstrous that thousands of witches had been burned during the Middle Ages. So much good German blood had been stupidly destroyed. From this he began an attack on the Catholic Church, and at the same time on Calvin. Before I had caught up with all this he was discussing the Spanish Inquisition and the essential nature of primitive Christianity. Suddenly he said to me, by the way, what is dear friends Jim von Papen doing? And asked me to include Turkey when I made my report to him. In this way the dinner went on very harmoniously and pleasantly. Later in the evening I talked with Dr. Kirsten. I had met him several months before at Himmler's suggestion. He was an interesting and exciting personality. Through his manual dexterity, and perhaps a certain magnetic gift, he was able to achieve remarkable cures through massaging the nerves. He could feel nerve complexes with his fingertips and through manipulation increase the blood circulation, thus reconditioning the entire nervous system, and could cure headaches and neuralgia within a few minutes. During all the years of the war he was Himmler's shadow, so to speak for Himmler believed that without Kirsten's treatment he would die. Kirsten's system must have worked, because in the end Himmler became completely dependent upon him. This, of course, gave the doctor considerable influence over his patient. So great was Himmler's faith in Kirsten's ability, that he submitted everyone in the Third Reich whom he regarded as important to a sort of test, which consisted of a physical examination by Kirsten for Kirsten claimed that through his manipulations he could feel the nature of the nervous reactions and the nervous energy of an individual, and thereby judge his mental and intellectual capacities. Himmler once told me that Kirsten had described me as a very sensitive type, my dominant inclinations being towards intellectual work. I would never be capable of commanding troops in action, for that required an entirely different kind of nervous reaction. But Kirsten felt that in my present position I was the right man in the right place, and my intellectual capabilities qualified me for still higher posts. Kirsten had come to Himmler with a great reputation, having been introduced by the Director General of the German Potash Syndicate, Dr. August Daim. Among his patients were industrialists from all over the world and various people of position, including Queen Wilhelmina of the Netherlands. With such a reputation it was not difficult for Kirsten to get himself well in with Himmler. In appearance he was a fat, jovial man, weighing almost 18 stone. His massive hands would never have led one to suspect the extreme sensitivity of his fingertips. He had one disturbing feature, an unusual black ring round the iris of his light blue eyes, which at times gave them a strangely piercing and reptilian look. 
He was a self-taught man who had worked himself up in the world through his singular talents. He was a fanatical bargain hunter. Anything that could be acquired at a knockdown price, such as a dozen watches or cigarette lighters, he would buy. On the whole, he was good-natured and kindly, although he admitted that it was often difficult for him to be so. He had many enemies, some because he was envied, some he made through his passion for backstairs intrigue, although he was unable either to profit by his schemes or to keep them from becoming entangled. Some people even suspected him of being a British agent. Once I asked Himmler about this. Good God! He replied, that fat fellow? He's much too good-natured, he would never want to harm me. We must let him have his bit of egotism, everyone suffers from it in some form or other. If you want to investigate, why, that's your business, but avoid upsetting him if you can. Kirsten always knew how best to exploit him to his own advantage. He was able to bounce unharmed out of all difficulties. What usually happened was that so much confusion was created around him that you never knew where you were. But without Himmler's support, Colton Brunner and Müller would have brought about his downfall, and Langbens, in 1943 or at the latest, 1944. But to return to that night in August 1942, after a long conversation I was quite sure that Kirsten not only agreed with my ideas regarding a compromise peace, but was enthusiastic about them. He had completely fallen in with my plans and agreed to use all his influence with Himmler to prepare the way for me. He assured me that I could go a long way with Himmler, who had a very high opinion of me. Here at last was the first active supporter of my plans. Then Kirsten began to tell me of his own difficulties. He needed protection against Mueller's hostility and I promised him my help. When I went to bed early in the morning I could not sleep. Again and again my thoughts returned to the question of how to convince Himmler of my ideas. The next morning I was unexpectedly called to report to Himmler. He was planning to go to Vinitsa in the afternoon and wanted me to inform him before he went on the present status of the Sino Japanese compromise negotiations. This took up the entire morning. I had almost finished my resume when Himmler suddenly changed the subject and said he was happy that I had made good friends with Kirsten, and begged me to improve my relationship with Langben as well. It seemed to me the time had arrived for me to broach the subject that was most on my mind. Himmler must have noticed that I had something to think about, for he said to me suddenly, You look so serious, are you unwell? Question mark. On the contrary, Herr Reichsfuhrer, I said, the treatment I had from Dr. Kirsten today has toned me up considerably. I know how great the demands on your time are, but the most important part of my report is not in my briefcase, that's almost empty now, it's in my head. But I don't want to begin until I can be sure that you really have got time to listen in peace. Himmler, suspicious as always, became a little nervous. Something unpleasant? Something personal? He said. Nothing like that, Herr Reichsfuhrer. It is simply that I want to place before you a matter that involves a most important and difficult decision. At this point, Brand was called in and Himmler made certain decisions, dictated several directives, and postponed various appointments and conferences. Then he invited me to lunch with his adjutants and secretaries and asked me to be ready to report to him again at four o'clock. In order to keep this appointment he set back his trip to Vinitsa. During the meal I consciously restrained myself, and noticed how Himmler's curiosity was increasing. Several higher Wehrmacht and SS leaders were present and Himmler was especially gay and jovial. He had the ability to change his personality as easily as he changed his uniform, from being the cool executive to being an amusing and pleasant host. After lunch Himmler excused himself and disappeared with his shadow, Brandt. About half an hour later I was called into his study. He came from behind his desk, a thing he very rarely did, and asked me whether I wanted anything to drink, then invited me to sit down with him and lit a cigar which was also unusual for him. Well, please begin, he said cheerfully. I asked his permission to start in a somewhat broader manner than usual because of the extensive nature of the matter I wished to raise. He nodded. You know, 
Herr Reichsführer, I began, that I did my final preparatory work for the bar in Dusseldorf. The president of the court there once asked me to prepare a draft judgment, it involved a tremendous amount of work and I kept putting it off until in the end I had to do the whole job in two or three days. Well, the next morning I was told to report to the president. The first thing he said to me was, I'm sure you'd like a cigar. This remark had an ironic undertone, for in German it has a double meaning, to receive a cigar is to be given a rebuff. At this Himmler smiled for the first time, pressed a bell, and told the orderly to bring me a good cigar. When I protested, he said with a smile, perhaps you prefer the president's. I went on. The president told me that there were two good things about my report. One, I had been punctual with it. The other was that as I'd quite failed to get any grip on the matter that I was writing about, he could take the occasion to give me some advice which he hoped I'd remember for the rest of my life. He said that going through the evidence he had noticed three or four points which could have led to different conclusions, and asked why I hadn't dealt with these alternatives in my draft. Also, he said, why did I not give an alternative verdict instead of keeping rigidly to the same line of argument? Later in life, he said, I would often have to face very difficult problems indeed, and would then do well to think of his words, never forget the alternative solution. Make those words one of the basic principles in your life, he said. Looking him firmly in the eye I went on, well, you see, Herr Reichsführer, I have never been able to forget this advice given me by a very wise man. May I be so bold as to ask you this question? In which drawer of your desk have you got your alternative solution for ending this war? The ensuing silence lasted a full minute. Himmler sat before me quite aghast. He could not have misunderstood my introductory remarks and must have realized quite soon what I was driving at. Slowly he came to life. At last he spoke, softly, then in a voice that grew loud until he was almost shouting at me. Have you gone mad? you've been working too hard. Shall I give you five weeks leave right away? Are you losing your nerve? And anyhow, how dare you talk to me in this way? I remained completely cool. I waited until his excitement had subsided, then assuming for the moment a detached tone, I said, Herr Reichsführer, I knew you'd go on like this. In fact, I thought it might be even worse but I should like you to consider that even such a great man as Bismarck at the height of his power always kept an alternative solution in mind, and such a solution is possible only as long as one can keep one's freedom of action. Today Germany still stands at the zenith of her power. Today we are still in a position to bargain, our strength makes it worthwhile for our opponents to seek a compromise with us. In broad strokes, I outlined to him the relationship of forces in the world as it appeared to me. As I went on, he became noticeably calmer. My own assurance had its effect upon him. During the course of my remarks, he became more and more interested. Every now and again, he nodded. By the time I had finished, after an hour and a half, he had interrupted me only a very few times, and I was able to repeat my question in a different form, you see, Herr Reichsführer, that was my motive when I asked you at the beginnings, in which draw have you got an alternative solution for the war? He got up suddenly and now he was pacing up and down the room. Presently he stopped and said, as long as that idiot Ribbentrop advises the Fra, this cannot possibly be done. I said immediately that of course Ribbentrop would have to go. He is always fighting with the Reichsmarschall, meaning Gering, and as the one wants to be Duke of Burgundy, let us make Ribbentrop Duke of Brabant. Himmler understood the jest, and also the serious purpose behind my words. He went to his desk and opened the large map of his Brockhaus Atlas. For several minutes he studied it intently. I, too, had risen for the sake of courtesy and he called me over to his desk. How will your ideas work out in practice? He said. I think you overestimate Russia's strength, but I am very worried about what's going to happen when American war production really gets going. How, how are we to go about it? In my present position I might have some chance of influencing Hitler. 
I might even get him to drop Ribbentrop if I could be sure of Borman's support. But we could never let Borman know about our plans. He'd wreck the whole scheme, or else he'd twist it round into a compromise with Stalin. And we must never let that happen. He spoke almost as if to himself, at one moment nibbling his thumbnail, then twisting his snake ring round and round, sure signs that he was really concentrating. He looked at me questioningly, and said, Would you be able to start the whole thing moving right away, without our enemies interpreting it as a sign of weakness on our part? I assured him that I could dot very well. But how do you know that the whole business won't act as a boomerang? What if it should strengthen the Western powers' determination to achieve unity with the East? I said, on the contrary, Herr Reichsfuhrer, if the negotiations are started in the right way, it will prevent just that contingency. All right, Himmler said, then exactly how would you proceed? I explained that such operations could never be conducted through the official channels of conventional diplomacy, but should go through the political sector of the secret service. Then, in case of misfiring, the persons directly involved could be officially discredited and dropped. On the other hand, it would be essential for the other side to know that the person with whom they would be dealing had real authority behind him. If Himmler were prepared to appoint such a person, and at the same time would promise to get rid of Ribbentrop by Christmas 1942, then I would take up contact with the Western powers. Ribbentrop's removal would prove to them that a new wind was blowing and that our plan had powerful backing. At the same time, rumors of a new foreign minister representing a more conciliatory policy would strengthen my position even more. Here Himmler interrupted me. Perhaps it would be a good idea to dig up Franz Chin again question mark meaning Franz von Papen, at that time our ambassador to Turkey. Then he shook his head. No, let's forget that for the moment. I'll have to probe the possibilities more carefully. Do you really think a change of foreign minister would be sufficient indication of a change of policy on our part? I said that I thought it definitely would be. On the whole Himmler seemed to agree with my plan. He had not said so in so many words, but he kept nodding as if in affirmation. Then he turned round and studied the map of Europe for a while. After a pause he said, until now you have only explained the necessity for such an alternative solution and the way to start it moving. Now let us talk about the concrete basis on which such a compromise could be reached. I answered him cautiously. Well, that is just what I supposed you would have in the drawer of your desk. By this time he was in a very amiable mood. He did not take my remark badly. Well then, let's start with the British, he said. Well, I said, from all the information I have it seems the British would insist on our evacuating at least the north of France. They would never tolerate German naval batteries mounted on the Calais coast. Then you don't believe in a grand alliance with our brother nation? Question mark, not in the immediate future. I said. The road from a state of war to a grand alliance by way of a negotiated peace is a very long one. Himmler nodded. Well then, what about Germanic regions, like Holland and Belgium? Question mark, they should become objects of the negotiations, I said. But I believe we will have to restore these territories to their former status. However, if you want to salvage something in deference to your racial policies, those that have been faithful to the creed could be resettled inside German territory. Himmler was nervously drawing on the map with his green pencil and had already marked Holland, parts of Belgium and northern France, as bargain encounters. Well, and France question mark Herr Reichsfuhrer, I replied, I am thinking of a solution which aims at the economic integration of German and French interests. France's own political physiognomy must be restored but inevitably Germany and France will be drawn together, and France, with her colonial possessions, will bring Germany tremendous advantages. Therefore, one must not limit one's actions by doctrinaire preconceptions or political resentment. Take Alsace for example, you know I am from Saarbrücken myself, and I know from experience how wrong it was of France to try to swallow up the Saar after Versailles. Himmler raised his head and said, disapprovingly, but there's a great deal of German blood in Alsace which has hardly been touched by French culture. 
I suggested that this point could remain open as a subject for negotiations, but that if Alsace ever were restored to the French in compensation, there should be closer economic cooperation between the two peoples. Unwillingly, Himmler made a green semicircle round France. Then he looked at me questioningly again. Do you believe that such a solution would satisfy the British? I said I could not anticipate the attitude of the British government, but I thought that they might consider such a solution worth discussing. Their chief interest would probably lie in the form which the new Europe was to take. Himmler interrupted me at this point. Well, let's leave that, then his eyes rested inquiringly upon Switzerland. He poked at it with his green pencil. Leave Switzerland, sir, I said quickly. Its constitution can serve as a good model for the new Europe. We shall need Switzerland as a bridge to the west too, and as a European clearing house for trade and currency. Himmler turned to Italy. He stared in front of him for a long time, then said, Yes, yes, Mussolini, we cannot relinquish the North Italian industrial area. Apostrophe. I said that I felt sure that the industries of northern Italy and Germany would complement each other very well but that I did not believe Italy could lose any part of her own territory. She'll have to give up enough of her colonial aspirations in any compromise peace. Again Himmler nodded his head like a Buddha. Well, I can't say that I'm convinced about northern Italy yet. Then he jumped to Austria and said in a voice full of decision, but that remains ours. I said, yes, I'm sure that no one will have any objections to that dot well. And what about Czechoslovakia? Question mark. The Sudeten territories will remain affiliated to the Reich, politically and administratively. Czechia and Slovakia will each be governed by their autonomous governments, but economically integrated with the Reich. I believe this ought to apply also to all southeastern Europe, including Croatia, Serbia, Bulgaria, Greece, and Romania. At first, Himmler did not agree. But after a discussion he admitted that these areas could hardly be integrated into the framework of a new Europe in any other way. Whilst I was explaining this he interrupted me. But in the long run this will develop again into nothing but an economic race with Great Britain and there'll be the same old tensions. Herr Reichsfuhrer, I said, let us not think about the tensions that might perhaps arise in the future. Let us first of all remove the immediate tensions which are preventing the formation of a new Europe, and this means finding a basis for a compromise solution to end the war. He made a great leap across the map to Poland and said, But the Polish people have to work for us. I said, We have to create a solution in which everybody will collaborate of their own free will. We must all be in the same boat, and anyone who doesn't pull his weight will be drowned. Himmler went on to the Baltic states. Here an area of expansion must be created for Finland, but the Finns are intelligent people, and this northern corner won't cause me any headaches. He looked up again. And what about Russia? Question mark. We must wait and see, I said. There was a long pause. Then Himmler said, If I understand you correctly. Your basis for a compromise peace really means the preservation of the Greater German Reich in its approximate territorial extent on September 1, 1939. Broadly speaking, yes. Do we have to use all our additional territorial gains to bargain with? Himmler asked, and again I answered, yes. I went on to say that as the nucleus of a reconstituted Europe, the Greater German Reich would be able to approach social problems with renewed vigor private initiative combined with direction and planning. I believe that in order to achieve a new Europe nationalist tendencies will have to be curbed, but the experts will have to investigate all these problems thoroughly. To begin with, Herr Reichsfuhrer, all that matters is that it's well worth our while to seek a compromise whilst we are still at the height of our power. This compromise peace, if it can be achieved, will create the right basis from which we can face the conflict with the East. At this moment we are already fighting a two-front war, and once the USA adds its full weight, the scales will be laden pretty heavily against us. I reminded him of Lavelle's words to the Führer, Herr Hitler, you are conducting a great war in order to build a new Europe. But you should first build a new Europe in order to conduct your great war. Himmler had to smile. Yes, yes. Yes, he said, that level, 
he's too clever by half, whether you read his name forwards or backwards, it still remains level. By now it was three o'clock in the morning. Himmler noticed that I was rather exhausted and cut the conversation short. Very well. I am extremely glad to have had this full exchange of views with you. Your plan has my approval, with this condition however, if you make a serious error in your preparations I will drop you like a hot cool. Of course, it remains to be seen whether I shall be able to convince Hitler by Christmas. It will be difficult for the reader to realize how much this conversation meant to me in August 1942. Himmler had given me full authority to act. But I did not realize at the time that such a decision could later be influenced by factors outside my control, nor that his character was so changeable that these influences could reverse his best intentions. In any case, before I left him that night he had given me his word of honor that by Christmas Ribbentrop would no longer be at his post. From now on all my thoughts and efforts were to be directed towards extricating Germany from her present situation with a minimum of territorial loss. I was still an idealist and I firmly believed that I would succeed, but, from this point on, the long uneven road of disillusionment started, punctuated again and again by intervals of restored hope. At times I felt certain that the situation was firmly in my grasp. But in the end I was made to realize that I was only a tiny cog in the great machinery of historical development. I could really do nothing but spin in my own fixed orbit. Xxxmuela Himmler in financial difficulties, Bormann's influence on Hitler, first suspicions of Mueller's loyalty, his criticism of party leaders, report of his death in Russia during the summer of 1942, a serious conflict arose between Himmler and Bormann in which Himmler continually made small tactical errors which Bormann always exploited to the full. Himmler's biggest mistake, about which he told me a year afterwards, was made during a sort of truce between them in 1943. Himmler's first marriage had been unhappy, but for his daughter's sake he had not sought a divorce. He now lived with a woman who was not his wife, and they had two very nice children to whom he was completely devoted. He did what he could for these children within the limits of his own income, but although, after Hitler, Himmler had more real power than anyone else in the Third Reich, and through his control of the many economic organizations could have had millions at his disposal, he found it difficult to provide for their needs. He therefore asked Bormann, his greatest opponent within the party, for a loan of 80,000 marks out of party funds a completely incomprehensible action. When he told me about this he said that it was for a building loan, and asked whether I thought he had not been taken advantage of over the rate of interest. What could I say? I suggested he should repay the loan immediately and secure a mortgage on his house, which could easily be arranged. But he rejected this with an air of resignation. It was a completely private matter and he wanted to act with meticulous rectitude. Under no circumstances did he want to discuss it with the Fra. Obviously he could not afford to pay a high rate of interest, or for that matter make any other payment out of his official income. At about this time I began seeing a good deal of Bormann. He was a short, stocky man with rounded shoulders and a bull neck. His head was always pushed forward a little and cocked slightly to one side, and he had the face and shifty eyes of a boxer advancing on his opponent. His fingers were short, thick and squarish and covered with black hair. The contrast between him and Himmler was really grotesque. If I thought of Himmler as a stalk in a lily pond, Bormann seemed to me like a pig in a potato field. At later meetings with him I had ample occasion to consider the source of his influence with Hitler. In Hitler's entourage it was Bormann who, through his constant presence, made himself indispensable simply by habit. In anything which concerned Hitler, Bormann was there. He shared in all large and small decisions, in all the excitements, rages and fatigues. Indeed, Bormann governed the range of these events in Hitler's daily life. He had developed great skill in finding exactly the right word with which to change unpleasant subjects and to push new interests into the foreground, in short, to dispel the Führer's worries. He also had a cast iron memory which was invaluable to Hitler, particularly in the last years, for the more absolute the regime became, 
the more difficult it was to reconcile the decisions of such a war machine with the Führer's commands. The greater the burden on Hitler's nerves, the more soothing was Bormann's continual presence at all hours of the day and night with his stalwart and unflagging spirit. He had the ability to simplify complicated matters, to present them concisely and to summarize the essential points in a few clear sentences. So cleverly did he do this that even his briefest reports contained an implicit solution. I saw examples of this several times and was so impressed by his exemplary manner that I decided to adopt similar methods of reporting. I once discussed Bormann's personality with Himmler, who confirmed my supposition. The Führer has become so accustomed to Bormann that it's very difficult indeed to lessen his influence. Again and again I have had to come to terms with him, though really it's my duty to get him out. I hope I can succeed in outmaneuvering him without having to get rid of him. He's been responsible for a lot of the Führer's misguided decisions, in fact, he's not only confirmed his uncompromising attitude, he's stiffened it. In the course of time Bormann methodically strengthened his position. Originally he had been the administrator of an estate in Mecklenburg, then a saboteur in the resistance against the French occupation in the Ruhr, and was also a former member of the Black or Illegal Rights. He had joined the party at an early date and had made his career under the protection of Hess, whose position he took over and exploited for its political power to an extent which Hess never achieved. In 1945, with a very clear idea of the general situation, as well as of the dangers of his own position, he was one of those who made a determined attempt to move over into the Eastern camp. Another top leader with a definite leaning towards the Russians was Muller. My first serious suspicions about the sincerity of his work against Russia were roused by a long conversation I had with him in the spring of 1943, after a conference of foreign based police attaches. Muller, with whom I stood more and more on a footing of open enmity, had been especially correct and courteous that evening. I imagined, because it was so late, that he had been drinking when he said he wanted to have a talk with me. He began talking about Rote Capel. He had occupied himself a great deal with the motives for these treason cases and with the intellectual background from which they stemmed. You will agree with me, I suppose, that from your own experience, the Soviet influence in Western Europe does not exist among the working classes alone that it's also gained a hold among educated people. I see in this an inevitable historical development of our era, particularly when you consider the spiritual anarchy of our Western culture, by which I mean to include the ideology of the Third Reich. National socialism is nothing more than a sort of dung on this spiritual desert. In contrast to this, one sees that in Russia a unified and really uncompromising spiritual and biological forces developing. The communists global aim of spiritual and material world revolution offers a sort of positive electrical charge to western negativism. I sat opposite Muller that night deep in thought. Here was the man who had conducted the most ruthless and brutal struggle against communism in all its various forms, the man who, in his investigation of Rote Capel, had left no stone unturned to uncover the last ramifications of that conspiracy. What a change was here. Presently he said, you know, Selmberg, it's really too stupid, this thing between us. In the beginning I thought we would hit it off very well in our personal and our professional relationship, but it didn't work out. You have many advantages over me. My parents were poor, I'm self-made, I was a police detective, I began on the beat and I learnt in the hard school of ordinary police work. Now, you're an educated man. You're a lawyer, you've got a cultural background, and you've traveled. In other words, you're stuck fast in the petrified system of a conservative tradition. Take, for instance, men like those you know from Rote Capel, Charles Boyson or Harnack, you know. They were intellectuals too, but of an entirely different kind. They were pure intellectuals, progressive revolutionaries, always looking for a final solution. They never got bogged down in half measures. And they died still believing in that solution. There are too many compromises in National Socialism for it to offer a faith like that, but spiritual communism can. 
it's got a consistent attitude towards life which is lacking among most of our western intellectuals, excepting perhaps some of the SS. I am not speaking now of the mass of the German people, they're steady and tough and courageous, nor of the heroism of our frontline soldiers, I am speaking of the intellectual elite and wishy-washy forms of their muddled spiritual attitude. National Socialism has never really possessed their kind or transformed them. If we lose this war, it won't be because of any deficiencies in our war potential, it will be because of the spiritual incapacity of our leaders. We haven't got any real leaders, we do have a leader, the Führer, but that is the beginning and the end of it. Take the mob immediately below him, and what have you got? You've got them all squabbling among themselves night and day, either for the Führer's favors or about their own authority. He must have seen this long ago, and for some reason that's incomprehensible to me he seems to be exploiting this state of affairs in order to rule. That's where his greatest failure lies. His statesmanship shows a grave lack of wisdom there. I can't help it, but I am forced more and more to the conclusion that Stalin does these things better. Just think what his organization has stood up to during the last two years, and the assurance that he's asserted himself with before his people. I see Stalin today in quite a different light. He's immeasurably superior to the leaders of the Western nations and if I had anything to say in the matter we'd reach an agreement with him as quickly as possible. That would be a blow which the West, with their damned hypocrisy, would never be able to recover from. You see, with the Russians one always knows where one is, either they chop your head off right away, or they hug you. In this Western rubbish heap they're always talking about God and all sorts of other lofty things but if it seems to their advantage they let a whole people die of starvation. Germany would have been much further ahead if the Führer had really got down to it. But with us everything is only half attempted and half done, and if we are not careful it'll finish us. Himmler is only tough when he knows that the Führer stands behind him. Otherwise he wouldn't make up his mind one way or another. Heydrich was far superior to him in that way. The Führer was right when he called him the man with the iron heart. Bormann is a man who knows what he wants, but he's much too small to think in a statesmanlike way. And look at him and Himmler, like a couple of snakes fighting. Himmler will have a tough job to come out on top. I was amazed to hear Müller express such opinion. He had always said that Bormann was nothing but a criminal, and now suddenly there was this change of attitude. I grew more and more nervous. What was he driving at? Was he trying to trap me? He was knocking back one brandy after another and in gutter Bavarian he began to revile the decadent West and the leaders, Goering, Goebbels, Ribbentrop and Lee, till their ears must have burned. But as Müller was a walking filing system and knew all the most intimate details about every one of them, this had its amusing moments, though for me they were overshadowed by a most uncomfortable feeling of apprehension. What did he want, this man who was so full of bitterness and hatred, suddenly talking like a book? It was something no one had ever heard Müller do before. Once, to steer the conversation on to a lighter and more jocular course, I said, All right, comrade Müller, let's all start saying Heil Stalin. Right now, and our little father Müller will become head of the NKVD. He looked at me with a malevolent glint in his eyes. That would be fine, he said contemptuously in his heaviest Bavarian accent, and you'd really be for the high jump, you and your die-hard bourgeois friends. At the end of this strange conversation I still could not work out what Müller was driving at, but I was enlightened several months later. The conversation had taken place just at the time when Müller was making his intellectual somersault. He no longer believed in a German victory and thought peace with Russia the only solution. This was completely in accordance with his methods. His conception of the relationship of the state to the individual, as far as this was shown by his actions, had from the beginning been neither German nor national socialist, but in truth communistic. Who knows how many people he influenced at this time and pulled over into the eastern camp. Müller knew quite well that he had made no impression on me, that the truce which we had made for this one evening was over. 
his enmity was to cost me dear in nerves and energy, it was a sort of duel in the dark, in which most of the advantages lay on his side, especially after I discovered towards the end of 1943 that he had established contact with the Russian secret service, so that quite apart from his personal antagonism I had to reckon with the objective enmity of a fanatic. In 1945 he joined the communists, and in 1950 a German officer who had been a prisoner of war in Russia told me that he had seen Müller in Moscow in 1948 and that he had died shortly afterwards. Xxxmi hopes frustrated the case of Horia Seema, Ribbentrop and Under Secretary Luther, an agreement broken, Luther's arrest, Himmler's attitude towards peace proposals revised, Ribbentrop's ban on their further discussion, talks with the Swiss Secret Service, Ernst called and Brunner, his hatred of Heydrich, our working relationship at the end of 1942 the leader of the abortive Iron Guard Putsch, Horia Seema, managed to escape from the SD school at Bergenbrueck, near Brno. Müller had organized a big search, but had not reported Seema's escape to Himmler. Nine days later Himmler telephoned to me in a terrible state and told me to go to Müller immediately and do all I possibly could to help recapture Seema. I realized at once how dangerous this situation was for Himmler, and put all the resources of my organization to work on the case. Within four days I had got Horia Seema back to Germany. Meanwhile, Ribbentrop had heard of his flight, and had also found out that Hitler knew nothing about it. This brought the bitter struggle between Ribbentrop and Himmler to a climax. Ribbentrop went straight to Hitler and told him that Horia Seema was again attempting a putsch from Italy. Without even ascertaining the facts, Hitler flew into a terrible rage, for he had given Marshal Antonsku his word of honor not to release Horia Seema until they had mutually agreed that he should do so. Ribbentrop managed to phrase his report so cleverly that Hitler was firmly convinced that Himmler and I were again trying to launch a plot in Romania. He became mad with rage and for three hours shouted that this was a scandal and, referring to the black uniform of the SS, that he would smoke out this black plague with fire and sulfur. For us, the whole thing was an ill starred business from the very beginning. And Hitler's attitude was, after all, quite understandable. He simply could not believe that Himmler had not known of Seema's flight. The atmosphere was extremely tense for about ten days, then very slowly Himmler began to re establish his position. However, this ridiculous incident had decisive repercussions and enabled Ribbentrop to strengthen and re-establish his own position, while it took Himmler a considerable time to regain Hitler's confidence. Müller, to justify himself, wrote long reports. I alone was left to hold the baby, for of course Ribbentrop could not now be removed, and my credit was damaged with the Western powers, to whom we had promised that Ribbentrop would be got rid of. They no longer believed in the seriousness of our intentions and regarded the whole thing as a desperate attempt to upset the unity of the Allies. It is even possible that news of our first abortive peace feel has reached Roosevelt and that this may have decided him to put the unconditional surrender resolution before Churchill at Casablanca. My discussions with Himmler at this time about his failure to keep his promise concerning Ribbentrop were stormy. He was deeply depressed and seemed completely to have lost his nerve, and it was only with the greatest effort that I could get him to give further authorization for my plans. Here I should like to digress for a moment in order to refer to the important and tragic part played in the moves against Ribbentrop by Under Secretary of State Luther, of whom I have already made some mention. In spite of an estrangement that had developed in his relationship with Ribbentrop, Luther, who supported our ideas, had managed to persuade him of the importance of the secret service in the conduct of the war. The feelings between the two of them were aggravated by difficulties in their private relationships, particularly those that existed between their wives. Luther no longer felt able to meet the Ribbentrop's continual and increasing demands on the large secret foreign office funds for which he was responsible. So far he had managed to manipulate them in order to meet his chief's extravagant way of life, but things had got to such a pitch that he began to doubt Ribbentrop's sanity. For instance, the tapestries in the Ribbentrop's house had to be changed four times because their colors were not precisely to Frau Ribbentrop's liking. 
Luther felt that he could not go on working under such conditions, and though he did not wish to be disloyal to Ribbentrop, whose closest confidant he was, he did not hesitate to tell me how things stood. In view of what had passed between Himmler and myself at our long conference at Zittima in August, I felt that the time was ripe to inform Luther, very judiciously, of my plan for peace negotiations. I also mentioned to him the unfortunate influence which Ribbentrop had on Hitler, and begged him to help me to get material which might enable me to bring about Ribbentrop's downfall. Luther was convinced by my arguments, and indeed was very pleased that Himmler was adopting such a reasonable policy. It would now be much easier for Luther to forget his earlier resentment against the Black Corps, as he called it. Mentioning the continual difficulties he had had with the SS leadership, he said, some of these gentlemen are utterly unreasonable, they want the earth. They don't understand my difficulties at the Foreign Office, and especially with Ribbentrop. I know they're constantly slandering me to Himmler, so I'm very glad of this opportunity to improve relations with him. I'll certainly give you all the help I can to ensure the success of your efforts. Towards the end of the year, at a reception given by the Italian ambassador, Signor Ritolico, Luther met Himmler again after a long estrangement. I had told Himmler all about Luther's attitude, so he was well disposed towards him and received him in the most friendly and even jovial manner. Luther, in return, began to behave like an ill bred upstart. In spite of the many foreigners present, he buttonholed Himmler as though they were bosom friends and began to talk shop. It was the worst mistake he could have made. Himmler was extremely sensitive about such things, especially when he felt himself in the public eye, but though he was irritated he remained polite and friendly. This only encouraged the unfortunate Luther to further unwelcome intimacies. The next day they both telephoned me. You know, said Himmler, that man Luther really is a common, unpleasant sort of fellow, slimy and uncouth. I tried to defend Luther as well as I could. I said that he had probably been overflattered by Himmler's attitude and had been tempted to open his heart to him. Eventually I succeeded in persuading Himmler to forget the incident. Then Luther's clipped speech, full of Berlin slang, came over the telephone, I must say, my dear chap, your chief is a real sport. He's a man one can talk to. You know, last night I really got on well with him. My boss can lump it now, as far as I am concerned. He went on for some time, until in the end I suggested that I should call on him the next day so that we could have a talk. When we met, I gave him a good dressing down and warned him that Himmler was a man of the most complex and changeable disposition who needed time to reach difficult decisions. I insisted also that he should make no move against Ribbentrop without telling me, so that I should have a chance to discuss them fully with Himmler beforehand. Luther gave me a solemn promise that he would do this. Then one day in January 1943, one of his assistants came to me in a state of great excitement. He told me that Luther had compiled a file against Ribbentrop which contained reports on his personal behavior, raised serious doubts about his sanity and indicated that he was obviously not fit to carry on his duties as foreign minister. Confident of Himmler's support, and of mine, he had sent this report to various government departments in the hope of bringing about Ribbentrop's downfall. Those involved were waiting for Himmler to say the word go before taking any action. Luther therefore wanted me to induce Himmler to begin his attack without delay and asked me to arrange for him to see Himmler immediately. I had to think the situation over quickly, Luther seemed to have acted in defiance of our agreement. I was by no means certain whether Himmler had managed to re-establish and strengthen his position with Hitler sufficiently to be able to launch an all-out attack against Ribbentrop. On the whole, however, I welcomed Luther's move, though it would have been foolish to commit myself prematurely. Consequently, I made everything conditional upon Himmler's approval, which I said I would try to secure at very day. This conversation took place during the afternoon. It was not until the evening that I telephoned Himmler, who told me to go to him at once. Unfortunately, I had first of all to discuss some urgent secret service matters with him, which took a great deal of time because of his lack of decision. 
I did not know that he had to appear at an official gathering that evening, however, I did notice that while I was telling him what Luther had done, he became increasingly nervous and impatient, and presently SS Obergruppenfuhrer Wolf looked in to warn him to get ready. I had to act swiftly, and as soon as Wolf had left the room I began to press him a to take immediate action in support of Luther. But he hesitated, twisting this way and that, then was just about to say yes when Obergruppenfuhrer Wolf appeared again, carrying Himmler's coat. Himmler rose, and in a few words explained the situation to him, then said, more by the way of a question, that, I presume, will settle, at this dramatic moment Wolf, who had always held Luther in contempt, butted in. But, Herr Reichsfuhrer, you cannot let SS Obergruppenfuhrer Joachim von Ribbentrop, one of the highest ranking members of our order, be kicked out by this scoundrel Luther. It would be a grave infringement of the rules of the order. I'm certain you would never get Hitler's approval. Suddenly all Himmler's old animosity against Luther was revived. I knew only too well that if Luther were dropped now, for reasons of SS etiquette, his fate would be sealed. It occurred to me therefore that it might be more prudent to give up for the moment and return to the matter when circumstances were more favorable. But it seemed as if Luther's destruction was preordained. A nervous restlessness had seized Himmler, and he muttered repeatedly, Yes, yes, Wolfgen, you are right. I interrupted him, Herr Reichsfuhrer, I must beg you not to reach a hasty decision in this matter. It is too complex and its effects are too far reaching. It was impossible to guess what was going on inside Himmler's mind at this moment, I imagine he was trying to gauge his present position with Hitler and decide what risks he could take. I felt the decision was going against me, but he left without making up his mind. I was disappointed and at a loss what to do next. I wished that I could have had another talk with Himmler that night, but knowing his fixed habits I realized it would be unwise even to try. I turned over a thousand possibilities and still could find no way out. Then at midnight I was aroused from my brooding by a telephone call. It was Miller who told me curtly that Himmler had decided to turn Luther's case over to him for investigation. He asked me to put myself at his disposal and give him information. He then told me to have Luther's assistant in my office the first thing in the morning and get a written statement from him about his conversation with me. This Muller wanted to use as the principal part of his evidence. I hung up without saying goodbye. It was a most unpleasant situation. The next morning I telephoned Himmler. He could not have been more evasive and indefinite. But eventually he said, Now, now, calm down. After all, no final decision against Luther has been reached yet. Whatever happens, I will have time to think the matter over and I'll give you a chance to discuss it with me once more. Luther's colleague was cross examined by Muller the next day, and then arrested. A succession of foreign office officials was then interrogated. Finally, Luther himself was arrested and put through a non-stop interrogation. All of them stood resolutely by their opinions. Ribbentrop was seriously incriminated by their testimonies, and if the country had been run by responsible leaders, that should have been enough for his dishonorable dismissal. But the machinery of the Third Reich worked in a different way. The protocol of the high order of the SS stood above everything. Specially incriminating facts were removed from the testimony and disappeared into Himmler's desk. I was never clear whether Himmler did this in order to have a reserve of incriminating material should a need arise for it later on, or whether he did it to protect the good name of the SS. After eight days, Ribbentrop received a summary of the files and went at once to see Hitler. Of course, his was an extremely one-sided version of the incident. This affair, he told the Führer, was nothing but an unpleasant attack by a subordinate official on the foreign policy which Hitler himself ordered. Ribbentrop demanded that Luther should be removed from office for insubordination and hanged for defeatism. But this was too much even for Hitler. He must have discussed the case with him or two, anyway. He finally ordered that Luther be dismissed and put in a concentration camp for the duration of the war. When I discussed the matter with Himmler later on, I did not try to conceal my disappointment. I told him frankly that his handling of the affair had been most unfortunate. 
Himmler silently accepted this reproach. I demanded that he should not carry out the severe sentences which Ribbentrop wanted to impose upon Luther's colleagues. Himmler agreed, and no further punishments were dealt out, except to a few officials who were transferred to frontline duty with the Waffen SS. Hitler had expressly forbidden that I should visit Luther, but I used my influence with Müller to secure preferential treatment for him. Later I heard that at the end of the war Luther refused to help in building a bridge for the Russians in the eastern sector of Berlin, claiming exemption as a concentration camp inmate, and that he had been shot on the spot by a Russian sergeant for refusing to obey orders. While I should have liked to go ahead as quickly as possible with the plans laid down at Zitima, I realized that hasty action would be fatal. I could only employ such secret service contacts as I had built up over the past few years, and I did not wish to use the most important of these hastily, but to reserve them for the final negotiations. At the same time, I confess I was a little worried by the fact that I, the youngest member of Himmler's staff, had succeeded in securing such sweeping authority for myself. I had to overcome a feeling of insecurity. Was Himmler's promise honestly and seriously meant? I already suspected a strong element of indecision in his character, and I decided not to rush my fences. I began by establishing contact with a British official who was at that time in Uruk. He expressed his readiness to begin preliminary conversations with an authorized German representative. Later he sent word that he had in fact received authorization from Churchill to carry on such unofficial exploratory conversations subject to certain assurances. Finally, he was even ready to come to Germany to pursue these talks at the appropriate secret service level. He was well informed about me and my attitude. After these preparations were completed I reported to Himmler on the first steps that I had taken under his authority. My object was to secure his agreement before venturing any further, but here I experienced my first disappointment. He discussed the affair with me for hours, and I soon began to notice that his views on the matter were becoming more and more involved and changeable. At first I did not understand why he was behaving in this manner, but then I realized he was scared by his own daring. It is easy to imagine my disgust and disappointment when, in his best schoolmaster's manner, he came out with the suggestion that perhaps it would be best to discuss the whole thing with Ribbentrop first of all. I pointed out that fundamentally this would be against the general line of policy he had laid down and developed. It would be catastrophic if Ribbentrop agreed to the scheme, for the whole thing depended on his exclusion. Should he reject it, as was most likely, then we should merely have called his attention to our plans. I was at a loss to understand Himmler's motives in wanting to bring him in. He replied to my argument impatiently, I am tired of working against the Fuhrer, I want to work with him. That's my final decision, and you'll have to put up with it. And so the whole matter was placed before Ribbentrop. As far as I could gather, neither of them in discussing it went beyond courteous and meaningless formalities, fencing with their visors closed and neither of them divulged his real thoughts. As I had feared, all this put Ribbentrop on his guard, he decided to discuss the affair with Hitler. Himmler watched this development apathetically, showing a cowardly lack of decision and doing nothing, while Ribbentrop, as they say, cleaned up. It was obvious that Hitler discussed this matter with Himmler, and later I received a note from Ribbentrop in which occurred a passage that I have never forgotten. I forbid the political sector of the secret service to contact enemy nationals in this way. I regard this as defeatism, which, from now on, will be severely punished. On the other hand, if any Englishman should wish to converse with us, he must first hand us a declaration of surrender, an echo of Hitler's own words on the subject. When we next discussed the matter, Himmler was sullen and taciturn, possibly because of a guilty conscience. In an impassioned appeal I declared that things could not possibly go on like this, it indicated a complete misconception of the nature of a secret service. One expected such things from Ribbentrop, but I asked him to show more understanding for my tasks, as well as for me personally, and for the scheme which he himself had approved. He rambled on evasively, and finally said, well, you know, perhaps you did make a mistake after all. 
but I won't hold it against you. Perhaps it was unwise to contact the British directly. Maybe you should have used a neutral as a buffer. Of course, this was only an attempt to save his face. But I grasped the opportunity at once and answered casually, very well. In the future I shall see to it that these things are handled through neutral channels. I wanted to try to save at least part of the foundations laid at Zitima. Himmler agreed. His reaction was typical, he seemed relieved, freed from the trammels of his own conscience, and therefore generous. I exploited this at once, and said that in future I would continue to work along the lines which we had discussed, but would take all possible precautions. I was careful to add, however, that contact between members of my service and enemy nationals might still occur, since this could not possibly be avoided. Again, Himmler's reaction was true to form well, I don't wish to know all those details, that's your responsibility. It was then that I decided personally to take up certain secret and long standing service connections with Switzerland, for no other purpose than to try to bring peace one step closer. I had a personal conversation with Brigadier Masson, then chief of the Swiss Secret Service, and this led to further talks. But the failure to remove Ribbentrop, Himmler's wavering, and the unconditional surrender policy of Casablanca, frustrated any real progress in the matter. Despite continual efforts to keep these tenuous contacts in being. After a short time, Himmler succeeded in re establishing his former position of power and confidence with Hitler who at length believed his version of the Horia Simu affair. He attributed the whole thing to the fact that Himmler had been overworked because no chief of the Rye Security Center had yet been appointed to replace Heydrich. Thus the whole matter also affected the appointment of the new chief of the RSHA. My own choice would have been almost anyone except the man whom Hitler finally selected, Obergruppenfuhrer Ernst Kaltenbrunner. But Hitler was convinced that this countryman of his, for Kaltenbrunner was an Austrian, had all the necessary qualifications for the job, of which unconditional obedience and personal loyalty to the Führer were not the least important. Incidentally, Himmler, in accordance with one of his peculiar foibles, had been able to arrange for Dr. Kirsten to examine all the higher SS and police leaders who were being considered for the post. Thus, even Kaltenbrunner, having no idea as yet of his impending appointment, was examined by the fat fellow one day. Afterwards Kirsten said to me, I've seldom had such a tough, callous ox to examine as this fellow Colton Brunner. A block of wood would be more sensitive. He's coarse, hard-bitten, probably only capable of thinking when he's drunk. Naturally he'll be the right man for Hitler. I gave Himmler a report on all this, but he still seems to think he's the right man. Colton Brunner was a giant in stature, heavy in his movements, a real lumberjack. It was his square, heavy chin which expressed the character of the man. The thick neck, forming a straight line with the back of his head, increased the impression of rough hewn coarseness. His small, penetrating, brown eyes were unpleasant, they looked at one fixedly, like the eyes of a viper seeking to petrify its prey. When one expected Colton Brunner to say something, his angular, wooden face would remain quite inexpressive, then, after several seconds of oppressive silence he would bang the table and begin to speak. I always had the feeling that I was looking at the hands of an old gorilla. They were much too small, and the fingers were brown and discolored, for Colton Brunner smoked up to 100 cigarettes a day. My first proper contact with him was in January 1943, and from the first moment he made me feel quite sick. He had very bad teeth and some of them were missing, so that he spoke very indistinctly. In any case, I could understand his strong Austrian accent only with great difficulty. Himmler also found this extremely unpleasant and eventually ordered him to go to the dentist. I met Colton Brunner during the time of the Anschluss in Vienna, but had formed no clear or lasting impression of him then. I tried not to let our working relationship be affected by my personal feelings, but after only a short time this proved impossible. Perhaps he felt an equal antipathy towards me, anyway there was soon a complete breach between us. 
our personalities were too much opposed for us ever to be able to work together harmoniously. There were various reasons for this, interesting in themselves, which I would analyze thus. First of all Colton Brunner was a doctrinaire and fanatical adherent of National Socialism and followed the principle of absolute obedience to Hitler, and also to Himmler. To him I was just a careerist who held his position purely because of professional ability, I had rendered no special service to the movement, and from my opinions and associations it appeared that I was politically unreliable. Colton Brunner's ambition had been to become Secretary of State for General Security in Austria. This was very quickly blocked, however, by Heydrich, who appointed him SS and Police Chief of Vienna. His personal influence was so effectively checked by Heydrich that he did not play any part in the hierarchy of the Third Reich until his appointment in 1943 as Chief of the SD. Colton Brunner had great personal weaknesses, above all he drank which in itself was enough to damn him in the eyes of Heydrich, who of course exploited this weakness in his usual effective way. Colton Brunner knew all this, but his hatred of Heydrich induced him to commit one stupidity after another in his dealings with him. This finally brought about in him what one could almost call a Heydrich complex. When he became chief of the organization which Heydrich had created, he sought to surround himself entirely with Austrians, until Himmler intervened. Whether through the influence of the chiefs of other departments, or through some of the members of my own department, Colton Brunner eventually transferred his Heydrich complex to me. I suddenly became the object of all the animosity he had previously entertained against him. Of particular importance to him was the fact that he knew of my aim to separate the Secret Service from the RSHA. The significance of this was reinforced by the fact that though he was chief of the RSHA, I was the only one of the departmental chiefs under him who had the privilege of direct access to Himmler, who had quite clearly indicated to Colton Brunner the nature of my exceptional status. On the other hand, Timler gave Colton Brunner the right to take a personal interest in the secret service abroad and indeed encouraged him actively to occupy himself with the needs of my department. My having direct access to Himmler was the worst thorn in Colton Brunner's flesh. My limited interest in nicotine and alcohol was another thing which infuriated him. On several occasions he tried to force me to exceed my quota of one or two glasses of wine. The more desperate the situation became towards the end of the war, the more Colton Brunner drank. I would find him in his office at 11 o'clock in the morning, having risen hardly more than half an hour earlier, his small eyes dull and empty. With the joviality of a drunkard he would reach under his desk, or bellow orderly, and pour out a glass of champagne or brandy for me. Then, when he became too obstreperous, I would take a nip or two to pacify him and pour the rest onto the carpet. Usually he did not notice this, but once when he did, the veins in his face became so swollen with rage that I thought he was about to have a stroke. In the last years of the war one was forced to have lunch with the departmental heads of the RHSA, which we all had together on Himmler's orders. Colton Brunner presided, and availed himself of the opportunity to attack me in the most sadistic manner. To put up with this cost me dear. I complained to Himmler that this half hour took more out of me in nervous control than ten days hard work. Himmler was much concerned and tried to calm me by telling me not to pay any attention, but because of Colton Brunner's relationship with Hitler, Himmler considered it important that I should not increase my reputation for unsociability. Among the top leaders I had few friends and many enemies, so there was nothing for me to do but to put up with it. I am not exaggerating when I say that because of such associations alone those terrible last years of the war seemed a real torture to me. Xxxiv relations with Turkey Turkish apprehension of our aims, visit of Turkish leaders to Germany, Russia and Turkey exchange notes, a discussion with von Papen, exchanging views with the chief of the Turkish secret service, an alarming flight, nightlife in Istanbul, an undercover office, back to Berlin. Mussolini's arrest announced, Hitler orders his release, Balkan reactions to Italy's collapse of entry of German troops into Bulgaria in April 1941, and the strengthening of our reserves in Romania, 
cause great anxiety in Turkey. The German military leaders did not attribute any great importance to this event, which they considered more in the nature of a political demonstration. But in spite of our reassuring declarations, the Turkish general staff concentrated 37 divisions on the narrow peninsula of eastern Thrace. Even so, our forces in Bulgaria were so strong that if the Turks had opened hostilities the bulk of their forces concentrated in this narrow and confined space would have been destroyed within a very short time. Realizing this, Turkey quickly did the wisest thing, and, with the approval of Great Britain, concluded a pact of friendship with Germany on June 18, 1941. This diplomatic agility on the part of Turkey was also in evidence after the first highly successful phase of the German offensive against Russia. It was very gratifying to the Turks to see the military and political power of Russia diminished, for this had been a great cause of anxiety. From my conversations with high Turkish officials I realized that they were maintaining certain religious and political bonds with various Turkish national groups in the Soviet Union, and that these groups, which included the Crimean Tatars and the Azerbaijans, were determinedly exploring the possibilities of reunion with the mother country. For this reason I tried to persuade the German leaders not to consider the areas concerned as German colonial territories, but to grant them at least some form of autonomous administration. I had informed Himmler of this situation in various detailed reports, which, if proper attention had been given to them, might possibly have prevented the worst stupidities of our political administration in the Russian areas, certainly in the Ukraine. Himmler agreed with several of the points that I raised, but lacked the moral courage to argue them with Hitler. In spite of Ribbentrop's attitude, which by now amounted to almost continual sabotage, I was able to maintain my contacts with the Turkish police and the Turkish secret service. I was aware, of course, of the diplomatic maneuvers of the Turks towards the Western powers, which was routine diplomacy. Ribbentrop, however, completely failed to understand the necessary give and take of diplomatic life. In order to counteract our political and military decline during 1943, I invited leading officials of the Turkish government to Germany, having of course told Hitler and Himmler that I intended to do so. I thought it important to show my Turkish guests the positive side of National Socialism, the tremendous industry of the German people, and our great war effort. Apart from official receptions and festivities, I also arranged sightseeing tours. After a visit to the Eastern Front, my guests crossed Germany to inspect the Atlantic Wall and the bomb-proof U-boat harbors. I was given astonishing latitude in the matter of information. I was allowed, for instance, to give our guests arms production statistics, which until then had been a most closely guarded secret. In Berlin they were shown one of the anti-aircraft installations of the Waffen-SS, and the newest machine guns and automatic weapons were fired for them in one of the underground firing ranges in the center of Berlin. At an official reception at the Turkish embassy I had an opportunity for a long conversation with the ambassador which for once did not touch on politics at all. He had a deep knowledge of the Turkish language and all its dialects and told me that these dialects formed an unbroken chain from the shores of the Black Sea deep into Mongolia, if one mastered the language, one would encounter no difficulties of communication throughout the whole of this area. Finally, this friendly visit of the Turkish officials came to an end, and before they left I promised that I would visit their country at the earliest opportunity. There were various reasons why I wanted to make the trip, for the first time for many years we had succeeded in deciphering the Turkish diplomatic code, and were now familiar with all the directives of the Turkish Foreign Office to their missions abroad. We were also able to peruse the reports of the Turkish embassies, those from Moscow and Washington proving especially interesting. During 1942 and 1943, we had entered into close collaboration with the Turkish Secret Service in connection with our Operation Zeppelin. Specially trained Georgians, Caucasians, Azerbaijans, and Turks had been sent in from Turkey to southern Russia and the Urals. This infiltration had shown surprising results. Whenever we got information that concerned Turkey, it was passed on to the Turkish Secret Service. One of the groups, however, did not work with sufficient caution. 
the Russians apparently managed to decipher their wireless messages, and began an intensive search throughout the area from which the transmitter was operating. As a result, two of our agents were arrested. Our system of organization proved itself, however, as each group was limited to three agents, and the Russians thought this was the only transmitter in existence. Still, the GPU reports of this incident aroused the interest of Molotov and Vyshinsky. They confronted the Turkish ambassador with the result of their investigations and tried to bring pressure to bear on him. Reporting this interview to his own foreign office, the ambassador asked for instructions. Their reaction was excellent. Though the ambassador had wavered under the Russians' reproaches, the Turkish Foreign Office refused to be intimidated and remained convinced that the investigation of the GPU had not disclosed any large-scale infiltration. However, the Russians proved relentless. The final result was a note in which the Turkish Foreign Office declared that both Germany and Russia were parachuting agents into each other's territory, but Turkish counter-espionage would make sure that in future no such operations were carried out from their territory. We were able to read this exchange of notes, and it was apparent to us that the Turks were getting cold feet. So I decided to take this matter up personally with the chief of the Turkish Secret Service and try to find out whether cooperation between us was still possible. I also wanted to avail myself of this opportunity of seeing the German ambassador, von Papen, in Ankara. I wondered whether he might not be the right man to suggest ways and means of negotiating a compromise peace. Trade relations between Germany and Turkey had broken down over the delicate point of further Turkish deliveries of chromium ore to Germany, and I thought that a little pressure might easily put things right. I also intended to carry out an inspection of our secret service organization in Turkey. When I presented the plans for my trip to Himmler, he not only agreed with them but told me that Hitler himself had been considering this kind of approach in the negotiations over Chromium War. I was rather surprised that all my suggestions, even the discussion with von Papen, were so readily agreed to. It seemed that Himmler was still willing to pursue the plans I had suggested to him at Zittema. Before my departure I insisted on a consultation with Ribbentrop. He gave me a lengthy lecture about Germany's political position and asked me to emphasize in my conversations with Turkish officials Germany's enormous military strength, the united will of the German people, and their faith in final victory. I was to point out that there were setbacks in every campaign, but that the concentrated power of the German nation would make up for all this. I asked Ribbentrop whether he wanted me to concentrate exclusively on this attempt to influence Turkey politically or whether I should attempt a solution of the chromium ore problem. He looked at me like a frightened rabbit. He realized at once the trap that lay behind my question. Suddenly he was in a great hurry to conclude the conversation. He knew me well enough by now to realize that his empty chatter made no impression on me. Several days later I saw the golden horn glistening in the afternoon sun below my plane, and there lay the ancient city of Constantinople. From the airport I was driven quickly to Therapia, where von Papen had his summer residence. I was received most warmly by the special envoy, Jenk, and his wife, who was Ribbentrop's sister. It was already quite late when we sat down to dinner. The change of climate and the exertions of the trip had made me too tired to discuss service matters that evening, but the next morning I passed on to Jenk all the information I considered it necessary for him to know. Then I made my first call on von Papen. We discussed the military and political situation thoroughly, and he gave me a clear picture of what the latter looked like in Turkey and of his attempts to maintain the existing feelings of confidence in Germany. However, there was an acute danger of Germany's position worsening and Turkey going over to the Allies' camp. The Turkish Foreign Office was especially interested in any decision Germany might make regarding the Dodecanese Islands. Their wish to draw these islands completely into the Turkish sphere of influence had been expressed to him repeatedly. The decision would be a difficult one, but von Papen felt that Berlin should consider the matter seriously. 
he welcomed my offer to try to influence the negotiations on the chromium ore shipments, and suggested that I discuss this with Jenk first. Because of von Papen's excellent relations with the Vatican, I had hopes that he would be able to support my attempts to reach a compromise peace with the Western Allies. I did not disguise this from him, and expressed my hope that another visit by Cardinal Spellman could be arranged. He agreed with my political conception and welcomed my plans, as he did the idea of getting into touch with the Lateran Council. Berlin has already smashed too much China, he said. In any case, our unhappy policy towards the church should be changed as quickly as possible. If there were a sign of goodwill in this direction, helpful intervention by the Lateran Council would be a distinct possibility but there would have to be some concrete action before we could expect cooperation from the church. After a three-day stay in Therapia I flew to Ankara, where my conversations with the chief of the Turkish secret service were to take place. Von Papen kindly placed at my disposal the house of a German diplomat who at the time was on leave. This conference with the chief had been arranged through my principal agent in Ankara, C. L. Moises who served as attaché in the German embassy. After some preliminary hesitation, I made excellent headway with the chief, having taken little notice of Ribbentrop's instructions. My frank exposition of Germany's military and political situation made a great impression on my vis-a-vis. -vis. It induced him to be equally open with me and place his cards on the table. Turkey, he told me, always had the greatest interest in strengthening Germany against Russia, for in the event of a breakdown in Germany, Turkey would be confronted by an overwhelmingly strong Russia, who, as historical experience had shown, was to be regarded as a deadly enemy. Turkey was by no means willing to take up a one-sided attitude towards the Western Allies, for even at the time of the greatest extension of her power into the Balkans in 1941. Germany had continued to respect Turkey's interests, Russia would never have done that. Germany's collapse would have a catastrophic effect on Turkey, for in that event no one would be able to foretell how the balance between the major powers would be adjusted. The Turks, no doubt, would be in an extremely difficult position. They were determined to resist any declaration of love from Russia and the deadly embrace that would follow. Turkey had to support a weighty armaments program which greatly weakened her economically. Germany should show a practical understanding of the needs for an economic strengthening of Turkey. Very largely, the political and economic aims of the two countries coincided, and it should be possible to achieve a rewarding collaboration within this framework. All this was sufficient to allow me to raise the question of continued support for my secret service work against Russia. As far as the economic questions were concerned, I promised to do my best to secure preferential treatment for Turkey. In spite of the burden which the war placed on German industry, I would try to encourage large-scale shipments of the commodities Turkey needed. In return I was given a reassurance that active participation by Turkey in hostilities against Germany was quite out of the question. I knew that I would not have received such an assurance unless it had already been confirmed by the Turkish president. It was with great interest that I now turned to the special question which I had in mind, if I were to receive authority from Germany to initiate peace negotiations with the West, would I be able to count on Turkey's help? My Turkish vis-a-vis -vis believed that at the decisive moment he would be able to assist me, for his doing so would in no way be contrary to Turkish foreign policy. Having achieved full agreement on all points, we parted company with the highest hopes. After this, I spent some time arranging administrative and technical problems of our secret service in Turkey, most of which I did with Moises. He took me out duck shooting, and I had an opportunity of observing the somber beauties of this rugged and arid country, which looked to me like a lunar landscape. Everywhere we went, I saw contingents of the Turkish army by which I was greatly impressed. I spent a considerable amount of time with Moises's family, to whom he was very devoted, and was so impressed by the sincerity and industry with which he tackled his work that I decided to increase his already considerable salary. I instructed him to keep von Papen informed about his activities, 
for I felt that a relationship of confidence between them was emphatically necessary. We discussed the question of setting up another secret short wave station in Ankara, but I decided against it because Moises felt that it would create too great a strain upon his relationship with the Turks, and might also prove embarrassing to von Papen. After our discussion had ended, I flew back to Istanbul. I was in rather a hurry, and as no service was running at the time, a small private plane was placed at my disposal by the Turkish Secret Service. We had been in the air only a short while when the clear blue sky was suddenly obscured by low clouds which had risen from the jagged mountains ahead. Soon the pilot was having to fly at treetop level in order to keep the ground in sight. Strong gusts of wind began to buffet our small plane and my companions began to show signs of nervousness. But somehow I felt quite calm and confident that it would all turn out all right. Suddenly the man beside me grasped my arm and said loudly in German, now we're for it. He pointed to the pilot, who was a Turk, and I saw that while he was steering the plane with one hand, with the other he was telling his beads as he prayed to Mohammed. I must say that I did begin to feel somewhat uneasy at this. The wind was now tossing our frail aircraft about, so that we would suddenly rise 60 or 70 yards and then drop again until it seemed that once more we were skimming the treetops. After an hour of this, the sky cleared a little, but there was still a tremendously strong headwind. I asked the pilot whether we had enough fuel to reach Istanbul. He said that he hoped so, but he did not sound very confident, and it was with great relief that I presently saw we were approaching the sea. The landing, in a strong ground wind, was pretty rough, but the pilot made it with skill, setting the plane down finally with the throttle almost wide open. Fortunately we were on a long runway. I complimented the pilot, wiping the cold sweat from my brow as I did so. The ground crew ran up to secure plane and the commandant of the airfield pulled the pilot from his seat and embraced him. So overjoyed was he to landing the plane safely with its important guests. At Istanbul, I inspected our secret transmitter and had conferences with my agents. At noon, I lunched with the German Consul General, von Wardowski, and afterwards had a conference concerning an independent Arabian intelligence organization, which covered the Near East and had the code name of Remo. It was conducted by an Italian journalist named Zambarini. The German naval attaché considered the reports that it gave of ship movements through the Suez Canal especially valuable, so I decided to continue our collaboration with the organization for another six months. After a day's rest, I went on a boat trip to an island in the Sea of Marmara. The next day was devoted to my Turkish friends, from whom I had received many invitations. In the evening, there was a moonlight cruise on a yacht, and afterwards, at about eleven o'clock, a banquet in one of the fashionable hotels on the beach. It was a charming and quite unforgettable evening. Later, with a small circle of friends, we went on to another hotel, where there was a roof garden which was the meeting place of the fashionable world. I was especially amused when my Turkish friend pointed out to me the more important agents and the chief representatives of the enemy intelligence services. The next morning was occupied by official visits. But in the afternoon I withdrew on the pretext of a headache, for I had to deal with a matter in which I had to be free of my companions. Half an hour later a Turkish agent, known to me alone, came to fetch me in his car. He brought with him a hat and overcoat, which he urged me to exchange for mine, saying with a smile, it is better to be cautious. We drove at high speed through the crowded streets of Istanbul making many detours as an added precaution, and finally stopped in a back alley. We waited five minutes to make certain we had not been followed, then entered an office building, walked through a long hall, and finally came to a carpet firm. In almost every country I had a second organization working quite separately from the main one and unknown to the latter. I considered this necessary in order to be able to check and control the information and material received from my regular service. Often the chiefs of my evaluating sections were surprised at the questions I was able to ask on points of detail, 
until they slowly began to realize that I had other sources of information. My number two organization in Turkey was directed by a Turk, an Egyptian, and an Arab, whom I left free to select their own assistants. They had set up a commercial firm which dealt chiefly in carpets and old gold and silver. Over the years they had organized their own extensive network in the Near East. Normally they communicated with me through a cover firm in Berlin, but in case of emergencies sent wireless messages which I received independently from the Secret Service. The only person who knew about these organizations and worked on them with me was Junk. The Turk was the official owner of the firm and the Egyptian and the Arab worked ostensibly as his employees. It was the Turk who had brought me here in his car. I was received enthusiastically by the others, and we chatted for a while, drinking thick black Turkish coffee, before we turned to business matters. We discussed methods of transferring funds, and I checked their accounts for the large sums I had placed at their disposal. To show me how this money was spent they led me into a storeroom, pushed aside two huge heaps of carpets and disclosed an excellently equipped shortwave transmitter and receiver. Soon Alexandria started contacting us, and I was able to see for myself how smoothly the transmission worked and how skillfully the Arab operated the equipment. The next day I boarded a plane for Berlin and as soon as I arrived I had a short talk with Carlton Brunner. Two days later I reported to Himmela, who was well satisfied with the results of my trip. But when I urged him again to have Ribbentrop removed and von Papen appointed as his successor, he shook his head. Selmberg, Selmberg, he said, you are working on my conscience, I know you only want the best, but you are demanding the impossible exclamation mark on the contrary, I said, with total victory it is you who are demanding the impossible. These two impossibilities cancel each other out. Because of the reflection of Himmler's glasses, I could scarcely ever see his eyes or I might have recognized and forestalled some of his more dangerous reactions. I had therefore made a habit of always staring at his forehead, just above the base of his nose, and this seemed to make him strangely uneasy after a few minutes. He would start to make notes or look into the drawers of his desk in order to escape my glance. On this occasion he reacted as usual and made several notes. Then he said, I can only remove Ribbentrop with Bormann's help, and the result would be an even more radical policy. For the time being, the Turkish problem was pushed into the background by the situation in North Africa, the onrush of events in Italy, and our defeats in Russia. In July 1943, Himmler rang me during the night to discuss the situation in Italy. From my own sources I knew that something was brewing there and I had already asked Himmler to warn Hitler accordingly. Hitler's answer, however, had been that Mussolini's loyalty and watchfulness were beyond doubt. In this belief he had been strengthened by Ribbentrop, who relied on the reassuring and utterly misinformed reports of the German ambassador in Rome, von Mackensen. And now the wireless stations were broadcasting the news of Mussolini's arrest. Only that very day Ribbentrop, blind to the situation had cabled von Mackensen that Badoglio should be arrested and Mussolini transported to Germany for an official visit. In fact, however, Badoglio and his new government were already firmly established in power and he was negotiating with the Allies. Hitler was now, of course, bitterly disappointed in his friend Mussolini. In order to achieve a compromise solution which would enable him to extricate Italy from the war, Badoglio, through his contacts, offered to neutralize Italy. This offer was submitted to Hitler with a comment drafted by me. I advised that German troops should be withdrawn to a line behind the river Po, which would free half a million men for the Eastern Front. This suggestion made Hitler rave for hours. He demanded my immediate punishment as an irresponsible defeatist and it was only Himmler's intervention that saved me. At the beginning of August Hitler gave instructions for the liberation of Mussolini from his place of internment. But we had not the faintest inkling of where he was. Therefore, Himmler summoned some of the practitioners of the occult sciences arrested after the flight of Hess to Great Britain, and had them closeted in a one-sea country house. These quacks were given orders to find out the whereabouts of Mussolini. This, incidentally, cost my department a considerable amount of money, 
for the scientists had an insatiable appetite for good food, good drinks and good tobacco, nevertheless, a master of the sidereal pendulum succeeded at last in locating Mussolini on an island west of Naples. To do this say justice, it must be recorded that at the time Mussolini had no apparent contact with the outside world. It was, in fact, the island of Ponza to which he had been transferred at first. Later on he was brought to a small mountain hotel on the summit of the Gran Sasso d'Italia, from which he was liberated by German parachutists. The repercussions of Mussolini's overthrow nearly spelt disaster for us in the Balkans, where Italian units surrendered important districts to the enemy partisans. In Yugoslavia Marshal Tito profited by these defections so extensively that in 1944 Hitler ordered a decisive counterblow to be mounted against him. This led to the planning of Operation Ro Esselsprung, from the Knights Move in Chess, with the aim of capturing Tito. Army and secret intelligence should have cooperated closely in this operation, but Hitler again preferred to issue parallel directives. Thus, while parachutists operated to schedule against Tito's headquarters, missing him only by a hair's breadth. The agents infiltrated into his headquarters by the Secret Service were advised too late of the timing of Operation Ro Esselsprung. This was, of course, a capital blunder, but for which they would have been able to prevent Tito's escape. As it was, we had to be content with the capture of a newly made Marshal's uniform. Xxx of Operation Cicero A mysterious offer from Ankara, British secret documents photographed, Pierre interviewed, the truth of Cicero's claims questioned, a key to the British ambassador's safe, Cicero's material, Turkey moves towards the Allied camp, cessation of Cicero's activities, speculation on his motives in the morning of October 28, 1943 I had arrived at my office and was just going over the short wave messages which had come in during the night, when I got a telephone call from Ribbentrop's right hand man, Legation Srat H. Wagner. He asked if he could come to see me at once, it was an extremely urgent matter which could not be discussed on the telephone. When he arrived he told me of a telegram which had just come from von Papen, and of a strange offer from a man who claimed to be the valet to the British ambassador in Ankara, Sir Hugh Natchbull Hewesson. In return for the tremendous sum of £20,000 sterling, to be paid at once, he offered photographs of the most secret documents of the British Embassy. He would sell further photographs of such documents at a price of £15,000 per roll of film. As this offer was a purely secret service matter, and a pretty risky one too, Ribbentrop wanted to have my opinion as to whether the offer should be accepted. At first glance the whole affair seemed quite staggering. However, the information placed before us so far was of much too general a nature to permit a really considered decision. But in the course of my secret service work I had frequently faced equally risky decisions and had developed a certain intuitive feeling. The suggestion that payments be made upon the delivery of each set of copies seemed to offer a certain security, but it would be best for a quick inspection of the films to be made before handing over the money. I was pretty sure this case would be handled in Ankara by Moises, and I knew him to be intelligent and experienced. After weighing up the considerations involved, I suggested that the offer should be accepted. The initial sum, carried on the account of the Secret Service, should be dispatched to Ankara at once by special courier. Ribbentrop agreed with me, and informed von Papen by telegram. The next day £20,000 sterling was flown to Ankara by courier plane. I waited in anxious suspense for the first report from Moises. It reached me three days later. He had established contact with the man, whom for the time being he called Pierre, and who had been introduced to him by the envoy, Jenk, for whom Pierre had worked for a short time as a valet several years earlier. As a diplomat, Jenk had to take precautions against secret service tricks from the enemy, and therefore did not wish to be involved with Pierre. For this reason, as soon as Pierre presented himself at Jenk's house, Jenk asked for Moises to be sent for, and that night he met Pierre for the first time. Pierre was of medium height, pale, with deep set dark eyes and an energetic chin. He said very little 
but impressed Moises as being a ruthless and very able man, his answers to all Moises's questions were definite and precise. After a rather dramatic conversation with this strange character, Moises found himself in a difficult situation. As a Secret Service agent he was, of course, tremendously tempted to accept. On the other hand, the sum demanded was extremely high and the business itself very risky. Furthermore, Moises did not have enough foreign currency at his disposal. To complicate matters, Pierre set a time limit of three days for Moises's decision and indicated with an unequivocal gesture towards the Soviet embassy that he had other customers lined up. Moises decided to confide in von Papen and get a decision as quickly as possible from the Foreign Office. Also, if it were to be needed, the money with which to pay Pierre. When Moises received the first films from Pierre, he was able to develop them and give them a brief glance before handing over the money. The contents of the first two films were breathtaking and were at once radioed to Ribbentrop by von Papen. After receipt of the first report, I was able to look at the copies of the photographs themselves. I could see that we had here highly secret correspondence between the British Embassy in Ankara and the Foreign Office in London. There were also private notes in the Ambassador's own hand, dealing with developments between Britain and Turkey, and Britain and Russia. Of special importance was a complete list of the materials shipped from the United States to the USSR under Leesland during the years 1942 and 1943, and there was a provisional report from the Foreign Office on the results of the Conference of Foreign Ministers, Cordell Hull, Eden and Molotov, held in Moscow in October 1943. The contents so impressed me that at first I devoted myself entirely to the study of the documents and almost forgot to initiate those measures which must be carried out by the chief of a secret service in such cases. However, I then ordered, one the immediate presentation of the reports to Hitler through Himmler. Two General Thel, chief of the wireless security and decoding section of the Wehrmacht Supreme Command, to visit me at once to receive the material, which would enable him to start work on deciphering the British diplomatic code. The four greatest decoding experts in Germany, two professors of mathematics among them, worked on this material for weeks until finally they were able to crack a part of the code. It was a tremendous achievement. Especially revealing were a number of handwritten notes on the margins of the documents, technical data on code messages from London to Ankara. Such things were of the greatest value to our experts. 3. The experts concerned to compile a list of questions, which, when answered by me, would substantiate the reliability of the material for Hitler. Of course, this was of the greatest importance for on it would depend whether the material could be used for decisions on policy. For the Under Secretary of State, Steingrucht, to be informed of the measures I had taken, and that my assistant, Moises, had taken the matter in hand. As the sums involved were quite considerable I asked him on whose budget they should be carried. Steingrucht replied that it would be better if I handled the whole thing, but if it proved too great a burden on my funds the Foreign Office would participate financially. A wireless message that reached me from Istanbul said that Moises had been ordered to go to Berlin to make a personal report to Ribbentrop. I was very annoyed that I had not been consulted, and at once arranged for Moises to speak to me before seeing Ribbentrop. I was not going to give him the opportunity to intervene in the case of Cicero, this was the name by which Papen called Pierre because his documents spoke so eloquently. Meanwhile, I met Colton Brunner for dinner and during the course of our conversation I complained about Ribbentrop's intervention in the case. While we were talking I suddenly had the idea of using Colton Brunner as a spearhead for my plans against Ribbentrop, and as soon as I disclosed the fact that Himmler was backing my scheme for his removal, Colton Brunner showed great interest. To increase his enthusiasm, I pointed out how different Germany's position would be if only say Sinkwart or Dr. Neubecker, two fellow countrymen of Colton Brunner's, were foreign minister. Finally I played my trump card and, under the seal of complete secrecy, disclosed to him Dr. de Crinis's opinion that since Ribbentrop's kidney operation a deterioration of his mental faculties had set in. 
I thus succeeded for once in gaining Colton Brunner as an ally, in spite of his personal antagonism towards me and his opposition to all my plans. I had my first full discussion with Moises the day after he saw Ribbentrop, and we sought to analyze Cicero's possible motives. At this time, nothing final could be said about the validity of the photographs, but both Moises and I agreed that the tremendous expenditure had been justified for even if the material should later prove to have been a deception by the enemy's secret service, such knowledge would have considerable value in itself, for it is most important to know by what means your enemy tries to mislead you. But, as I remarked to Moises at the time, I believed the material to be genuine. It corresponded completely to the general picture of the political situation as I saw it. However, I would devote my attention and energy not only to its evaluation, the second phase of intelligence work, but especially to the third phase, the utilization of the information. Normally a secret service should not have to concern itself with this at all, its work should be completed with the first two phases, but the seriousness of Germany's position required that most of my skill should be devoted to the use made of the material. I told Moises that I still hoped to be able to carry through the peace plans which I had discussed with von Papen, though the difficulties and the resistance to them were overwhelming. I instructed Moises that all rolls of film brought to him by Cicero should be sent on to Berlin at once, so that our technicians could make the required number of copies for distribution to the interested authorities. If he needed technical assistance, we could use the twice weekly courier planes. A technician, with all the necessary equipment for a modern photographic laboratory, was to be sent to Ankara at once under diplomatic immunity. Moises and I then discussed some of the more curious personal aspects of Cicero. Cicero had claimed that his father had been living in Constantinople at the time of the First World War, had become involved in an unpleasant quarrel over Cicero's sister, and had been shot. In a later account that he gave, he said his father had been shot by an Englishman while hunting in Albania. It was this that made him hate the English and thus motivated his actions. The discrepancy between these two stories gave rise to some doubts about Cicero's truthfulness, but the documents spoke for themselves. He also claimed not to speak a word of English, although later this was found to be completely untrue. I considered all this of incidental importance but it did raise considerable difficulties in my proving to Hitler and Himmler the validity of Cicero's material. Towards the end of December further doubts were thrown upon his veracity, and therefore upon the validity of the documents, for two of his fingers appeared on one of the photographs. Cicero always maintained that he worked quite alone and took the photographs without any assistance, having trained himself for two years in the photography of documents. His version of how he worked was as follows, as the ambassador's valet, he attended him when he retired to bed. The ambassador usually took sleeping pills, and after he had fallen asleep, Cicero would remain in the room in order to clean his master's suit. On these occasions he was able to take the key, open the safe, and then, using a strong light and the liquor we had given him, take the photographs. Within half an hour all the documents would be back in their proper place, and his master's trousers cleaned and pressed. But now suddenly Cicero's own fingers appeared on the photographs. I consulted the photographic experts and technicians of my department. By trying to reconstruct Cicero's actions, we came to the conclusion that it was quite impossible for him to have held the document and operated the camera at the same time. My experts therefore came to the conclusion that the man was not working alone after all. This merely proved Cicero's untruthfulness, but did not necessarily mean that the material was false. In the meantime, by using the documents we had been able to decipher part of the British diplomatic code. One of the first important pieces of information we found in Cicero's material was that the planned invasion of France was to carry the code name Operation Overlord. After the first appearance of these words in the document, I immediately conferred with General Thel. 
he at once started operations that would enable us to determine where and when the code word overlord appeared in the enemy's shortwave communications. My experts had suggested that Cicero might get an impression of the key of the safe on a specially prepared wax which we could send him. The materials were thereupon dispatched to him, with instructions on how to use them, and a small specially made box in which the wax impression could be returned to Berlin. Within a remarkably short time the impression of the key was sent to us, and our locksmith went to work. Three days later a key to the safe of the British ambassador in Ankara lay before me on my desk. It was a masterpiece of German workmanship. Cicero was overjoyed when he received it. He said that it functioned better than the original key, and now he was able to do his work in much greater safety when the ambassador was absent. There is one more incident about Moises I would like to relate. It was during the trying period of my imprisonment after the collapse of Germany. An English officer was driving me from Richmond, near London, where I was interned for an interrogation by a special Anglo American Commission on Codes and Deciphering. On the way, the Englishman asked me, what did you really think of Herr Moises? I did not wish to answer the question and shrugged my shoulders. Whereupon he continued, he was very capable. Wasn't he? Again I replied with the same noncommittal gesture. The English officer said, you know, Moises has told us that he's really Jewish, and that you forced him to join the SS and work for you at pistol point. Apart from the drafts of code telegrams made by Sir Hugh Natchbull Hewesson on the relations between Turkey and Britain, the material furnished by Cicero contained, 1, a report on the conference at Cairo in November 1943, between Roosevelt, Churchill and Chiang Kai-shek. The most important result of this conference was Roosevelt's promise to return Manchuria to China after the defeat of the Japanese. It was therefore astonishing when, at the end of February 1945, a Polish woman agent working for our secret service reported a secret agreement between America and Russia. In this Roosevelt, without having consulted Chiang Kai-shek, agreed to turn over the Trans-Manchurian Railway and the naval harbors of Port Arthur and Dairn to the Russian sphere of influence, all this in order to secure from the Russians a promise that they would declare war on Japan three months later. It was difficult to convince our leaders that this change of attitude on the part of the United States had really taken place. 2. Reports on the Conference at Tehran, November 28 to December 2, 1943 between Roosevelt, Churchill and Stalin, and the discussions of the Allied military commanders that took place there. On the basis of these reports one could see clearly that while differences, both military and political, existed between the Allies, on the whole these had been resolved at this conference. Our evaluation established with a certainty of 60% that Churchill had not been able to maintain his plan for a second front through an invasion of the Balkans. Obviously Roosevelt's military advisers played a decisive part in this question. The political situation in the Balkans may have seemed too complex and uncertain, also such strategy would favor British interests in southeastern Europe, and Roosevelt was still continually afraid of a possible Russo-German understanding. The documents photographed by Cicero showed clearly that a special status was provided for Turkey. There were, unfortunately, no indications about Greece. However, it was quite evident that according to the agreement reached at Tehran, Poland, Hungary, Romania and Yugoslavia would come under the protection of the Soviet armies. Stalin even demanded that Poland should become Russian territory as far as the Kurtzen line and should receive parts of eastern Germany in compensation. With defeat growing ever more imminent, Germany's ultimate fate could clearly be foreseen. The study of these documents was quite breathtaking. Our evaluating commentaries were simple and straightforward, and there was no mistaking their meaning. Only Ribbentrop tried to read between the lines, and saw there, as always, continuing tension between Russia and the Western Allies, and, of course, found a ready audience in his supreme master. Hitler reacted as I had expected. 
he declared that now more than ever before it was necessary to gather all our forces for total war, for total destruction of the enemy by means of a ruthless expenditure of all physical resources. Cicero's reports obviously put Himmler into a state of uncertainty. Shortly before Christmas 1943, he asked me to go to see him. I was reporting on various matters when suddenly he interrupted me, Selmberg, I realize now that something has to happen. Only everything is so terribly difficult, I could hardly believe my ears when he went on to say, for God's sake don't let your contact with Hewitt 13 be broken off. Could you not let him be told that I am ready to have a conversation with him? From that point on the blows fell in rapid succession. Cicero's documents showed clearly that the continued neutrality of Turkey would be short-lived. Step by step the Turks were going over into the Allied camp. The Turkish diplomats proceeded carefully and according to plan, almost exactly as Natchbal Hewesson had described in his dispatches to the Foreign Office. First, there was the continuation of neutrality, but with the concentration of Turkish forces in Thrace to tie down German divisions in Bulgaria. Meanwhile, there were increasing shipments of Allied war material to Turkey, and finally, more and more consultations between the Turkish and Allied general staffs. According to the documents, this process of wooing the Turks over was to be completed by May 15, 1944, and was in some way connected with Operation Overlord. Therefore, from that day on we had to count on an all-out effort from the West. Had Churchill been able to carry through his plan for an invasion of the Balkans at the end of 1943, then, according to my calculations at the time, the war would have been over in the spring of 1944. The Balkans were like an overripe plum, ready to fall at the slightest touch, and this would have torn open the German southeastern flank. Instead, the Western Allies inaugurated the bombing by their strategic air arm of important road and railway junctions and oil installations. The first victim, according to the schedule photographed by Cicero, was to be Sofia on January 15, 1944. The city was thus forewarned in ample time, though there was nothing much we could do to counter the attack. About February or March 1944, Cicero stopped his activities and in April Turkey broke off relations with Germany and went over to the camp of the Western Allies. From the beginning I was convinced that Cicero had worked with one or more accomplices. I never discovered his motives, whether greed, hatred, or just love of adventure, but often during my many journeys my thoughts would turn again to this strange case. Again and again I wondered whether perhaps the lay behind Cicero the shadow of the Turkish secret service. The more I thought about this, the more likely it seemed to me that through his material Turkey had tried to warn Germany and prevent her from continuing on her path to total destruction. At the same time, she would be warning us of the almost inevitable transference of her loyalty to the camp of the Western Allies, and would thus be safeguarding herself against the oppressive menace of Russia. With downfall of Admiral Canary a blunder by the Abwehr, Heydrich orders a surveillance of some Abwehr personnel, I sound Canaries on a leakage of information, a Catholic intrigue, friction between Canaries and Heydrich, administrative defects in the Abwehr, Canaries's dossier goes to Himmler, his campaign against Canaries, the Admiral's arrest ordered, he declines an opportunity for suicide. Our last meeting be the end of February 1942 the position of Admiral Canaries was no longer secure. His friends and subordinates may not have been aware of it, but I knew that Hitler was seriously considering getting rid of him. His downfall was precipitated by an incident that assumed considerable importance in the battle of wits between technicians that was joined throughout the war. Since the middle of 1941 we had put into operation a new device for defense against enemy aircraft. It had been developed with great skill by the technical department of the Luftwaffe and was being employed so extensively that our anti-aircraft defenses were able to determine exactly the position and distance of all approaching enemy aircraft. This device, together with our highly developed automatic aiming devices, enabled us to inflict heavy casualties on the enemy, 
as all the main airlines of northern and western Europe were covered by it. One of the most important installations from which it was operated was at Cap Antifa, near Loivre. At midnight on February 27, 1942 a British commando unit made a surprise raid on the installation. They succeeded in removing important parts of it and took photographs of other parts that could not be removed. After massacring the German garrison, they were able to withdraw with their booty. It can well be imagined that this daring and successful stratagem aroused no great enthusiasm in Hitler's headquarters. He was in a blind fury, and this time his anger was justified, for an investigation of the incident showed serious shortcomings in the army's defensive measures and more especially in the camouflaging and security protection of the installation. After brooding over this for several days, Hitler sent for Himmler and demanded a full report on the technical progress of the Western powers with regard to radio detection. He complained bitterly about Canaries, who had so far given him no real information on this subject. The Technical Research Department of the Luftwaffe compiled a report based on their own researches and on the analysis of captured equipment. However, this was not what Hitler wanted to see. He demanded that the secret intelligence material which Kinries's organization had collected on this subject be placed before him. As usual, Kinries failed to provide the required information. This finished him with Hitler, and from that moment his fate was sealed. This was the opportunity for Himmler and Heydrich to make a decisive attack on Kinneries, and I was asked by Heydrich whether my AMT Vi would be able to provide better ammunition than the Abe Ware. The military intelligence department run by Canaries. I said that at the moment I was not in a position to take on any additional responsibilities. This refusal must have contributed to their decision not to follow up their advantage against Canaries for the time being. Later on, when I discussed the matter with Himmler, he admitted that my reluctance to take over the responsibility had made no difference, it would in any case have been easy to remove Canaries. But the Fro was not prepared to assign the direction and organization of a unified intelligence service to Himmler. The fact that I could not help liking the Admiral made things more difficult for me. Canaries was a highly intelligent and sensitive man with many likable qualities. He loved his dogs and his horse almost more than any other living creatures. He often said to me, Selmberg, always remember the goodness of animals. You see. My Dachshund is discreet and will never betray me, I cannot say that of any human being. He was very good company on the many trips we made together, and his attitude towards me was always kind and paternal. Whether in Spain, Portugal, Hungary, Poland, Finland or Scandinavia, Canaries always had a fund of knowledge about the peculiarities of the countries, and especially about their cooking and their wines. In the South he always made sure in spite of the great heat, that I wore a woolen stomacher. And he would ply me with all sorts of medicaments and with pills which he himself constantly took. He often asked me to attend the various meetings of his organization, and I was thus able to acquaint myself with the weaknesses of the military intelligence service. In this huge overinflated organization, Canaries's methods were far too humane. His subordinates were able to twist him round their little fingers, and when he was eventually forced to take strong measures, he would always try to make up for his severity afterwards. In many ways he was of an almost mystical turn of mind. Though he was a Protestant, he was a great admirer of the Roman Catholic Church, of its organization and of the strength of its faith. He was greatly influenced by Italy and the Vatican and many of his conspiratorial activities could be traced back to this influence. His first attempts at peace negotiations dated back to 1939 and were centered on the Vatican. It was for this reason that Heydrich gave the file Canaries, dealing with the circle round the Admiral and General Oster, of the Supreme Military Command, the codename Schwarz Capel, from the Black Chapel in Rome. Heydrich opened this file on Canaries to be able to bring about his downfall at any given moment. During the last days of May 1940, I became deeply involved in these intrigues, in which, of course, Canaries featured prominently. I was working in my office one evening when Heydrich telephoned me and told me in his high, nasal voice to come to his office. Muller had also been summoned, 
And when he and I entered the room, Heydrich motioned us to sit down without saying a word. For almost a minute we sat round the table in silence. Muller watched the smoke of his cigar thoughtfully and drummed nervously with his fingers. I waited for what was coming. Heydrich opened the conversation by turning to Muller and asking, What about the investigation of those Abwehrmen in Munich, Joseph Muller, von Donnerney, 14, and the others? Isn't it pretty clear that this is the circle which started the peace feelers via the Vatican? Later it turned out that through the mediation of the Jesuit father, Dr. Liber, in the Vatican, the Pope had attempted to sponsor a peace offer in 1939 which involved a government without Hitler. The British minister to the Holy See, Sir Darcy Osborne, had assured the Pope verbally that His Majesty's government would be in agreement, provided that there was a change of regime in Germany and that no attacks would be launched in the West. He had implied that Austria and the Sudeten territories could remain within the Reich, subject to the agreement of the French government. Then Heydrich turned to me, tell me, Selmberg, I seem to remember that this Joseph Muller once had something to do with your service, I believe, in connection with Dr. Notchen. Is that right? Not for the first time I marveled at Heydrich's fantastic memory. Dr. Notchen, an SS Sturmbannführer, had reported to me that a man named Joseph Muller had direct access to the highest levels of the papal hierarchy. According to Notchen, this Joseph Muller was a very clever man and although one could not quite trust him, his reports were not without interest. I now explained this to Heydrich, who nodded thoughtfully. Then, turning to Muller, he said, see to it that this whole circle is closely watched. He then went on to another matter, the Führer and the Reichsführer have asked me to investigate one of the most important cases of treason in the whole history of Germany. Some time ago two wireless messages that were sent by the Belgian minister at the Vatican to his own government were intercepted. In them he gave the exact date and time of our western offensive 36 hours before it was officially issued by the Fra. And this information was also passed on to the Dutch government. The Fra is enraged about this. It really is a shocking state of affairs and he's demanding that at all costs the traitors have got to be found. Now this is the point. He's also assigned canaries to the investigation, about the worst thing he could have done, that really is making the goat your gardener, because if one thing is certain, it is that canaries' circle will have to be included in our investigations. I've already spoken to him on the telephone, and of course I've given him an entirely different line to work on. Miller, who had not spoken a word up to this point, said in a dry voice, of course canaries is mixed up in the affair. I suggest that Selenberg takes over the whole matter and keeps us informed. He's on very good terms with Canaries, so the Admiral will be less suspicious of him than of anyone else. And I don't doubt Selenberg will deal with the matter with his usual tact and skill. This last remark was, of course, intended sarcastically. Heydrich looked Muller up and down for a moment, then turned to me and said, All right. The best thing would be, Selmberg, if you would contact Canaries and have a talk with him. With that our meeting ended. The next day I visited Canaries. As usual we talked about all sorts of things, the weather, riding, and so on, but not about the matter which we both knew had to be discussed. Only when I was about to say goodbye did Canaries broach the subject. Did Heydrich speak to you about this incredible thing, the giveaway of our offensive? He did. I said, and I think this might be a good opportunity for us to discuss it. Canaries then gave me an account of the circumstances, as he knew them, but mentioned not a word about Rome, the ambassador, the Vatican, or the wireless messages. According to his version of the story, on the evening before the offensive began, a German embassy official at some function at the Dutch embassy in Brussels had noticed that the Dutch ambassador's wife had had a telephone call which had obviously excited her considerably, and immediately afterwards she had left the embassy. After the capture of Brussels, a note had been found written by a member of the Belgian Foreign Office, which contained a message from the Dutch ambassador in Berlin giving warning of Germany's offensive. 
When I discussed this with Heydrich I pointed out that Canaris's version of the story completely ignored the leads to Rome. In spite of our joint efforts, neither Canaris nor I succeeded in tracing the culprit. Canaris placed Colonel Rolada, the head of the foreign department of the army counter-espionage, in charge of the investigation. He was a most able officer and I discussed the matter with him several times, but it was not until 1944 that any light was thrown on the affair. After the arrest of Canaries in that year, Rolado was questioned about the results of his investigation of this case. He confessed that in 1940 he had submitted a report to Canaries, Donany, and General Loster, in which it was stated quite clearly that the Belgian ambassador in Rome had received his information from a Jewish journalist named Stern. This man was a Roman Catholic convert who had established connections with Joseph Müller, an oblatenant in the Abwehr post in Munich. Stern had testified that Müller had been his informant. Müller, however, maintained that this accusation was a malicious slander originating from a certain Benedictine father who was jealous of his, Müller's, close relations with the Jesuit father, Dr. Liber. In short, it was simply an intrigue calculated to disrupt Mueller's influential connections. Apparently, Canaris believed Mueller and forbade the journalist Stern to engage in any further activities. Nevertheless, Rolader emphasized in his report to Canaris that Mueller was by no means above suspicion. Canaris, however, ordered Rolader to say nothing about the matter. A large sum of money was placed at Stern's disposal and he was transferred from Rome to Sweden. By these moves Canaries successfully managed to cover up for Joseph Mueller. As well as on visits between our families, and on our morning rides, Canaries and I used to meet in Heydrich's house, and I was usually present at the talks between him and Canaries. Indeed, they not only tolerated me but seemed glad of my presence. If ever I failed to attend of my own accord, one or the other of them would be sure to call me in. It was curious to see how they would both ply me with questions afterwards, though I was far younger than either of them. What should I have understood by that? What do you think was behind this? Did I say the right thing? Was I too aggressive? I was a sort of go-between, a postillion de moor for them, whom they both trusted. Heydrich always had the greatest respect for Canaries who in 1923 had been in command of the cruiser Berlin which had served primarily as a training ship for naval cadets, of whom Heydrich had been one. Though he liked to assert his superiority over his former chief, he always maintained an outward respect for him, and for a man like Heydrich this meant a great deal. Shortly before his death, Heydrich spoke to me about the continual differences and frictions between him and Canaries. He was no longer willing to give in to Canaries, whatever might be the outcome. You should not let yourself be lulled to sleep by him, Heydrich warned me. He suggested that I should assert myself more ruthlessly. Seeing the two of you together, one would take you for bosom friends. You won't get anywhere by handling him with kid gloves. Canaries was fatalistic, said Heydrich, and only firmness would be effective with him and you have to be even tougher with his followers, a bunch of talkative highbrows, they interpret courtesy as a sign of weakness. He suggested that I should think all this over and for the time being should try, and this was an order, to act as a mediator between him and Canaries. But now Canaries would have to come to the mountain, he would have to come to Heydrich. Soon after this I again went riding with Canaries, in fact, we rode together several times and discussed service problems. But he realized that the chief purpose of these rides was to preserve the last links between him and Heydrich, for their relationship was now on the verge of a complete and final break. One morning I had to have it out with him on a rather unpleasant subject. On at least six occasions agents of his Abwehr had been arrested by the authorities of neutral countries and had claimed to be members of the political secret service. Two of them had said that they were counter-espionage agents of the Gestapo, but checking with Miller, I had found that they were completely unknown to his department. Canaries's response to this was extremely curious, he suggested that each of us should give orders to our own people that in case of arrest they should claim to belong to the other service, that my agents should say they were working for the Abwehr, and his should claim to be working for me. 
he thought this would cause great confusion in the enemy counter-espionage services, which in any case were incapable of understanding our complicated departmental relationships. I noticed now for the first time signs of an inner weariness in Canaries. He was worn out by the continual internecine conflict. Heydrich's ice-cold tactics of the last months were beginning to show their effect. He felt insecure and restless, and, or so I thought, something like a physical fear of Heydrich. And his pessimism about the war situation was increasing. Repeatedly he said to me, haven't we said again and again that things in Russia would not go the way the Fuhrer and his advisors imagine? But they won't even listen to the truth any longer. I know I'm much older than you, but please let us stick together. If those at the top notice that we both hold the same opinions, perhaps they'll take some notice. I insist on returning to a workable relationship with Heydrich, though. Things can't go on this way much longer. At last, the discussion between Heydrich and Canaries, which they had both asked me to arrange, took place. Canaries gave in all along the line and a joint meeting in Prague of the two intelligence services was set for May 1942. A working agreement, the so-called Ten Commandments, in their newly formulated version, was to be proclaimed. After this discussion Canaries admitted that Heydrich's intrigues had greatly upset him. Though a solution had been found for the moment, he could not rid himself, he said in a resigned voice, of the feeling that Heydrich would attack again. The agreement offered no more than breathing space. I had the feeling that Canaries was right. I am convinced that had Heydrich remained alive, Canaries would have had to leave the stage in 1942. Not so much, I believe, because of his conspiratorial activities, for reasons best known to himself, Heydrich always kept these carefully in the background, but because of the failure of the military intelligence service. The Canaries felt all this but with an almost oriental fatalism made no attempt to resist. He believed in his preordained fate and let himself and his organization drift with the stream. Inflated with false hopes, he neglected his own duties and traveled restlessly from one country to another and from one sector of the front to another. From time to time he made real attempts at a far-reaching conspiracy, but drew back at the decisive moment. He was bedeviled by his anxiety about the outcome of the war and the muddle of his own plans. For me, the situation was difficult both from a human standpoint and from that of my work. I took no account of the struggle for power or the tactics of the two irreconcilable opponents, but quite soberly regarded the apparent facts, and here Canaries came off very badly. He was overinflating his organization, indiscriminately enrolling serious workers and dubious riffraff. Reforms were feebly attempted and then allowed to peter out. To me, his whole organization was a nightmarish oppression, for how was the general situation to develop if no efficient work was done in this important sector of military intelligence? How were we to reach a position from which to influence the leaders and, if need be, change the direction of their policy? This was 1942, which represented for me the climax, as in the classical structure of a drama. The year 1943 was the penultimate pause, while 1944 and 1945 were the tragic conclusion, I explained these lines of thought frankly to my colleagues in innumerable conversations in order to drive them to the greatest possible effort. I wanted them to realize clearly that otherwise we would not achieve the aims set for our work. Our information and data had to be so complete and so well founded that we would be able to convince the leaders of the necessity of an alternative solution, a compromise peace. Later, in 1943, Canaries had become directly suspect in a matter of serious sabotage in Italy. It was at the time when General Badoglio began to establish contact with the Western Allies with a view to ending the war for his country. General M, head of the Italian Secret Service, tried every possible maneuver, together with Canaries, to conceal Italy's change of front from the German leaders. All the reports received by our military and political intelligence services pointed clearly to the imminence of such a change. Yet in spite of this, Canaries's reports to his immediate superior, Field Marshal Keitel, were reassuring. Hitler's anxiety and suspicion had been aroused, however, 
by my reports. But as the only possible preventative measures would have to be of a military nature, the army had the last word. At Key Itel's suggestion Canaries was sent to discuss the situation with General Um, a suggestion which was probably Canaries's own in the first place. For he and Um were both agreed that Italy's exit from the war should proceed undisturbed by any German measures. This agreement, of course, remained a secret between the two, while officially Um's reassurances were brought back to Key Itel. Long live the Axis, Italy is the most faithful of allies. Six days later, I was able to present Himmler with a dossier which included absolute proof of Canaries's treachery. Nevertheless, Himmler refrained from passing the dossier on to Hitler. The facts of the case came to light in the following manner. One of Canaries's assistants, Colonel Helferich, was on the staff of the German military attache in Rome, General von Rentelen. The colonel employed two Italian chauffeurs who were both homosexuals and both in Im's service. I pointed out the dangers of this arrangement to Canaries, but Helferick was of such high standing that he poo pooed my warning. Hook, Selmberg, after one's been in our profession a while, one begins to see pink elephants everywhere. One of these chauffeurs was unwittingly the most valuable source of information for my political secret service for he repeated all them's assignments and conversations to a friend who was in our pay. Thus we were able to piece together a very clear picture of the planned coup, and of how far Canaries was involved in the affair. I remember adding the following sentence to the dossier which I gave to Himmler, it would have been better for Admiral Canaries to have concerned himself with his own tasks in Italy rather than carry on such sessions with Ami. During the years 1941 to 1942 the greater part of the work of my organization was concerned with silencing treacherous informers in Italy. Until the capitulation of the Africa Corps in May 1943, there was not a single German tanker, troop ship or aerial transport whose position was not reported to the Western Allies. This is an established fact. It certainly would have been more in the interests of the German soldiers if the Abwehr had honestly carried out their tasks of counter espionage. Himmler always held Canaries up to me as a wise and experienced chief of secret intelligence from whom I could learn much. His faults and his opposition to the regime were another chapter, with which I need not concern myself. When I presented my reports about his various betrayals, Timler would nervously tap his thumbnail against his teeth and say, leave the dossier here with me. I will bring it to Hitler's attention when the right opportunity arises. Again and again I raised these matters because of their importance to Germany's war effort, but Himmler obviously did not wish to be burdened with the responsibility. Like Heydrich, he seemed to have some inhibitions with regard to the admiral. I am certain that at some time or other Canaries must have got to know something incriminating against Himmler, for otherwise there is no possible explanation of Himmler's reaction to the material which I placed before him. During the following years Canaries's work grew continually worse. In spite of his intelligence, his behavior aroused suspicion and many people became convinced that he was involved in treasonable activities. Himmler had decided to employ a sort of snowball tactic against him. He never spontaneously expressed his opinion on Canaries to Hitler, but always waited until the problem of Canaries was raised by Hitler himself. Meanwhile, he saw to it that other leaders, both political and of the Wehrmacht, who for one reason or another were opposed to the Admiral, continually kept the subject of Canaries in the limelight. Himmler regularly furnished this anti Canaries clique with new material against him and so added continually to the stiffening opposition. In the middle of 1943 Canaries's staunch supporter, Ki Itel, tried to come to his aid by arranging a game of musical chairs in Canaries's departments. He told Hitler that he had taken these steps as chief of the OKW. A fresh wind was to blow in Canaries's service and new heads were appointed to all departments. But this last attempt was in vain because by 1944 Canaries's personal and professional failings had so incriminated him in Hitler's eyes that he had been relieved of his post. The official reason was simply that the conduct of the war now demanded the creation of a unified German intelligence service. It may be recalled that this was one of the main points of the program which I had set myself in 1941.
The inevitable downfall of Canaries came on a Sunday afternoon at the beginning of August 1944. I was working in a military secret service office with several others, when I received a telephone call from SS Krupp N. Fuhamula. He and his chief, Colton Brunner, had been assigned to carry out the investigation into the plot of July 20. Both of them had their suspicions about me and tried to incriminate me with all their cunning, in a sharp voice Muller ordered me to drive to Canaries's home and inform him that he was under arrest, this was an official order from Colton Brunner. I was to take Canaries to Furstenberg in Mecklenburg, and not to return with him to Berlin until everything had been cleared up. I said that I was not an executive officer and would not dream of carrying out such an assignment which was most unwelcome to me. Furthermore, I said, I shall telephone Himmler at once. This is an imposition. You know, said Müller, that Colton Brunner has been put in charge of the investigation of July 20, not Himmler. If you refuse to comply with the order, which I hear with repeat, you will have to suffer the consequences. I realized at once what their game was. If I refused to obey they would have an excellent excuse for proceeding against me. Muller and Colton Brunner, in the abysmal hatred which they bore me, had already tried in 1943 to denounce me as a British agent in connection with the affair of the lawyer, Dr. Langben. Therefore I had to be on my guard. Without another word to Muller I hung up. After considering what to do, I finally decided to comply. I also thought that in this difficult situation I might be able to be of some help to Canaries. I told SS Hauptschirmfuhrer Baron von Volkesum about the situation and ordered him to accompany me. The Baron had distinguished himself in airborne operations in Belgium in 1940 and in the Caucasus in 1943, and he had also served under Canaries. I went to Canaries's house in Berlin Schlachtensee and he himself opened the door. In the living room were Baron Kolbars and a relation of the Admirals, Erwin Del Bruck. Canaries asked them both to leave. Baron von Volkesum had been discreet enough to wait in the hall, so we were alone. Canaries was very calm. His first words to me were, somehow I felt that it would be you. Please tell me first of all, have they found anything in writing from that fool Colonel Hansen? This officer had been involved in the affair of July 20. Truthfully I answered, yes, a notebook in which there was among other things a list of those who were to be killed. But there was nothing about your participation on your part. Those dolts on the general staff cannot live without their scribblings, Canaries replied. I explained the situation to him and told him what my assignment was. It's too bad, he said, that we have to say goodbye in this way. But, and here he made an effort to throw off his apprehension, we'll get over this. You must promise me faithfully that within the next three days you will get me an opportunity to talk to him personally. All the others, Colton Brunner and Muller, are nothing but filthy butchers, out for my blood. I promised to do as he asked and then said in a completely official voice, if the Herr Admiral wishes to make other arrangements, then I beg him to consider me at his disposal. I shall wait in this room for an hour, and during that time you may do whatever you wish. My report will say that you went to your bedroom in order to change. He understood at once what I meant. No, dear Selmberg, he said, flight is out of the question for me. And I won't kill myself either. I am sure of my case, and I have faith in the promise you have given me. We discussed quietly whether it would be wise for him to put on his uniform, what things he should take with him, and other details. Then he went upstairs. He returned after about half an hour having washed, changed, and packed a handbag. Again and again he shook his head saying, those devils, they had to draw you into this thing too. But be on your guard, I've known for a long time that they are after you too. When I talk to Himmler I'll tell him about your case as well. He embraced me with tears in his eyes, and said, well, then, let us go. We drove in my open car. After we left the city, the road led through the lovely countryside of Mecklenburg. The sky was slowly darkening. 
Our conversation grew increasingly monosyllabic, for each of us was pursuing his own thoughts. Canaries assured me several times that he knew very well I had no share in bringing about his dismissal. He hoped that fate would be kinder to me, and that I would not one day be hunted down as he had been. Presently we arrived at Furstenberg, which was a school for the border police, and were received by the director, Brigid Fuhertru Emmeler, whom I found most unsympathetic. He preserved the forms of military politeness, however, and conducted us to an ante room where we took off our top coats. He asked us whether we would like to have supper together and Canaries begged me to stay with him a little while longer. We were taken to the mess hall where about twenty generals and high officers, all under house arrest in connection with the plot against Hitler, were just finishing their meal. After lively greetings, the Admiral and I withdrew to a small table where we had supper. I suggested to him that I should try to reach Himmler by telephone, and he agreed. But when I rang the Reichsfuhrer, his adjutant told me he was on the way from his special train to Hitler's headquarters. Canaries and I drank a last bottle of red wine together and he gave me a few final instructions on how I was to conduct the conversation with Himmler. It was about eleven o'clock when I said goodbye to him. He accompanied me to the ante room, and we stood there talking for another five minutes. Once more he reminded me of my promise to arrange an interview with Himmler and again embraced me with tears in his eyes. You are my only hope, he said. Goodbye, young friends. Upon my return to Berlin I sent a curt teletype message to Müller, I have carried out the order which you transmitted to me by telephone today. Further details you will hear through the Reichsführer SS. Selmberg. The next day I had a long telephone conversation with Himmler. He had known nothing about Colt and Brunner's move against me. He assured me that he would have an interview with Kinneries, and this must have taken place, for there is no other explanation of the fact that Kinneries was not sentenced to death until the very last days before the collapse of the Third Reich. The evidence against him was certainly sufficient to satisfy the People's Court, under its bloodthirsty President Frey Eisler, of his guilt. In July 1944 two dispatch cases containing incriminating documents had been discovered in a safe in one of Canaries' offices outside Berlin. They supplied final proof of his and his collaborators' guilt. In 1944, however, Himmler was still powerful enough to protect Canaries from the death sentence, and instead he was sent to a concentration camp at Flossenburg in Bavaria. From the middle of 1944, I took over Canaries' military intelligence department, incorporating its various tasks in departments for and via the counter espionage organization. In March 1945, Hitler and Colt and Brunner jointly ordered the execution of Canaries. The operations of the Secret Service exchange of information with other departments transmission of material from abroad, the uses of wireless, technical research tapping Britain's Atlantic cable, the infiltration of resistance movements, action Bernhard, effects of Goebbels propaganda, contact with Roosevelt's special envoy, Ribbentrop plans Stalin's assassination, the plot miscarries Hitler's deterioration he always considered highly efficient and skilled technicians the most important part of a good secret service. The Wartime Manpower Act allowed me to draft into my service the most brilliant experts and scientists, from university professors to artisans, until its technical standards were second to none. I was greatly helped in my task by the fact that as well as having the rank of SS Brigade Führer, I was accorded the disciplinary powers of a divisional commander of the army. General Major of the Waffen SS. I spent a great deal of time and effort in winning the trust and cooperation of the heads of the intelligence departments of the various services. Already in 1942, General Felgeberl and General Thel, the heads of the Army Technical Information Service, regularly exchanged information with me. Every three weeks or so, I gave a dinner party at my home where the technical heads of the three services, Defense Ministry, post office, and research stations discussed new developments and helped each other with their problems. These meetings were perhaps more than any other single factor responsible for the high standard of the scientific and technical side of my service. 
It was the cooperation and interest which these people showed towards me personally which made most of my successes in secret service operations possible. The problem of transmitting information from foreign or enemy countries is of central importance in the running of an intelligence service. Many secret services communicate their information either verbally or in writing through couriers. But a great deal of time may be lost in this way, so that information becomes of no value by the time it reaches the evaluation department. Verbal transmission, furthermore, is very difficult and, unless the courier is highly skilled, is usually the source of serious errors through lapses of memory or lack of understanding of the material itself. Written transmission, except through the diplomatic bag, often has to pass through frontier control stations in several countries, and this process brings with it great dangers. Wireless communication therefore became increasingly important in our secret service, as it did in the services of other countries. Naturally, its employment produced counteractivities by our enemies, but modern direction finders and methods of pinpointing usually proved so successful in locating illegal transmitters that the effort and expenditure of clandestine wireless networks became hardly worthwhile. In her wireless defense organization, Germany scored exceptional successes. We were able to intercept the wireless communications between enemy units at the front, and often intercepted important orders about troop movements and offensives. A technique was developed for turning round the illegal transmitters which we captured, that is, we continued working them as though they were still being operated by the enemy. But we transmitted material chosen by us, of which about half was valid and half faked, thereby often misleading the enemy on points of vital importance. Sometimes we carried the game so far as to ask for new agents, codes, arms, money or explosives so that to the enemy it seemed that he was successfully extending his espionage network, whereas he was really being induced to expend large sums of money and valuable personnel for nothing. We were especially successful with the Russian wireless center in Moscow. At one time we had at least 64 turned round stations transmitting to Moscow for us. One of my chief aims was the complete mechanization of the wireless service which would make the lengthy training of wireless operators unnecessary. An incident that illustrates the importance of this development concerned an individual closely connected with the Vatican, who felt it his duty, as a German and a Western European, to pass on important information about Russia. But he refused to do so in writing or to communicate with me through an intermediary, nor could he travel to Germany. He was afraid to pass his messages through one of my transmitters in Rome as he had previously had very unfortunate experiences with this means of communication. I therefore asked my technical staff to develop an apparatus which he could use for direct wireless communication to me. After 18 months the first apparatus was ready. It was disguised as a box of cigars and was of about the same weight, with a genuine layer of cigars concealing the mechanism which might equally well have been disguised as a box of chocolates or built into a small overnight handbag. On the front of the apparatus was a dial such as is found on a telephone, and three buttons. To operate it one merely had to plug it into an ordinary electric socket, turn the first button, and dial the message, in code, as one would dial a telephone number. The message would then be automatically transferred onto a magnetized wire tape inside the apparatus, on which about two typewritten pages of code words could be recorded. After completing his message, the sender would turn the second button and a magic eye would begin to glow. When it reached its greatest brilliance the sender would know that he was beamed directly to our receiver somewhere in Germany. Then by turning the third button the actual transmission of the message would take place. The apparatus could transmit the entire contents of the wiretape within three-fifths of a second. The rapidity of the transmission made it impossible for any direction finder to establish the location of the transmitter. The only inconvenience for an untrained sender was that the apparatus required an antenna wire between 20 and 30 feet long. The receiving stations in Germany were briefed as to the exact times when transmissions would take place but their machinery was so intricate that I, being a layman, can give no detailed information about them. 
They were enormous and took up almost three rooms. I used to watch them spark and hum and crackle, and I marveled to see all the intricate operations completed within a fraction of a second and the automatically decoded messages rattled off as though on a teleprinter. Unfortunately we could never devise a simple method for an agent in the field to receive a message, so this startling radio link had to remain a one-sided means of communication. The amount of equipment required by my organization in the various countries can hardly be imagined. The mass employment of agents in Russia alone required hundreds of sets a month, and getting these manufactured by our already overburdened defense industry involved enormous difficulties. Though I managed to relieve the situation to some extent by having the valves manufactured in foreign countries. After 1942, I set up a special department provided with large funds to carry out research in microfilms, invisible inks, codes, and decoding, and I also set up another department for the forging of identity papers, rubber stamps, and passports. A curious incident arising out of this occurred during my first interrogation by the Americans in 1945. The interrogating officer got more and more annoyed when I insisted that I had never been to America. Finally, he confronted me with an American passport made out in my name, complete with the stamps of embarkation, debarkation, and health authorities fingerprints, etc., and with my photograph, properly stamped, affixed to it. I was flabbergasted, until I remembered that our technical department had given me this, the first faked passport which they had produced, for my birthday in 1943. At first the Americans refused to believe that it was faked, and maintained that it must be a genuine one but extensive tests finally proved that I had told the truth. One of my assistants was a man who had the extraordinary ability of imitating any handwriting within a few minutes, and so accurately as to deceive all the graphological experts. When the National Committee for a Free Germany was formed in Moscow in 1942, handwritten statements by General von Seidlitz and others and letters written to his family by General von Paulus who had commanded the German armies at Stalingrad, were received in Germany. Hitler wanted to know whether the handwriting of these officers could possibly have been falsified in Moscow. With one accord the graphologists and psychologists stated that this was quite impossible. But they were all proved wrong when my own expert wrote long reports in the handwriting of von Paulus von Seidlitz and other members of the Free German Committee. He himself, however, believed that the statements we had received from Moscow were genuine. I used the services of this man in certain cases where signatures had to be obtained of people who were absent. There was a separate department for research into listening and recording devices, which obtained astonishing results by using the newest electronic techniques. We also made great progress in the development of photographic equipment and had special cameras with which one could take photographs without being noticed. Even pictures taken indoors came out clearly. The camera was no larger than a flat matchbox, and the lens was so skillfully disguised that it could appear as a cufflink when the camera was worn under the cuff, or in the form of an insignia as a lapel button. There were special cameras for every sort of assignment. We could reduce a page from a full-sized newspaper to the size of a pin's head, and when it was enlarged it could be read perfectly easily, complete files of documents could be preserved in this way on a strip of film half an inch long. Several times when I was traveling without the protection of diplomatic immunity I carried such films inside a hollow porcelain tooth dot because of the constant threat of destruction by air attacks that hung over Berlin after 1943. I had all the most important files of my department photographed on microfilm. The films were placed in two steel strong boxes, small enough to fit into a briefcase. As a further precaution, a mechanism setting off an explosive was built into the box, so that the contents would be destroyed if anyone who did not know the combination attempted to force the box. Eventually both boxes were destroyed in this way. Our leading chemist succeeded in preparing secret inks which were completely secure against all chemical and infrared examination. I cannot recall the precise details, but I remember that one of the chief elements was an admixture of hemoglobin from human blood, so that when the ink was required, the agent would simply prick his finger, 
mix a drop of blood with the prepared solution, and have a red ink which would disappear completely after three minutes. Only those who possessed the secret formula could restore the writing, which would then appear as if written in green ink. The process did not involve purely chemical reactions, it also made use of biological processes. Through collaboration with experts of the Reich Post Ministry, we succeeded in tapping the main cable between England and America. The word tapping is used here in a figurative sense. In spite of the insulation of the cable, we were able, by the use of short wave instruments, to record the high frequency impulses running through it, and by an incredibly complicated process, to decipher them. The cable that we tapped was used for telephonic communication between England and the United States, chiefly concerned with requests for reinforcements and materials such as aircraft, petrol, guns and tanks. Through a systematic evaluation of this material we could determine the emphasis in armament production and supply. A great deal of information on convoys and shipping could also be deduced which was invaluable for our U-boat trades on Allied shipping. Early in 1944 we hit a bull's eye by tapping a telephone conversation between Roosevelt and Churchill which was overheard and deciphered by the giant German listening post in Holland. Though the conversation was scrambled, we unscrambled it by means of a highly complicated apparatus. It lasted almost five minutes, and disclosed a crescendo of military activity in Britain thereby corroborating the many reports of impending invasion. Had the two statesmen known that the enemy was listening to their conversation, Roosevelt would hardly have been likely to say goodbye to Churchill with the words, well, we will do our best, now I will go fishing. Although in the occupied territories our security measures against the British Secret Service were not without considerable success, the gradually increasing resistance among the civil population in Holland, Belgium, France and Norway made for a struggle that grew ever more bitter between our counterintelligence and the British Secret Service. The British made full use of the resistance in order to gain footholds for their organization, even in the heart of Germany, by infiltrating the swollen ranks of forcibly recruited foreign labor. However, these underground resistance movements in the occupied countries were not only often traced by us, but were infiltrated by our own underground agents. There were even cases where resistance groups were jointly directed by the British and ourselves, and we were sometimes able to order from England radio equipment required by us, as well as currency and explosives, these, incidentally, were superior to our own, to be dropped by parachute. Sometimes it took no more than ten days for our order to be given and the necessary material to be parachuted into occupied territory. The British Secret Service thus became my never-failing currency reserve. The sums collected by me in this way ran into millions, though whenever the British discovered such treachery by their agents in foreign resistance movements they did not hesitate to liquidate them. The situation with regard to the foreign currency and gold reserves of the Reich was always very strained, and the Secret Service had begun relatively early to forge the pound notes banknotes and gold rubles required for its own needs. It took two years to imitate the so-called grease-proof paper needed for English pound notes, and two paper mills, one in the Rhineland and the other in the Sudeten territory, were devoted solely to this task. The highly complicated process of engraving could only be started after the 160 main identifying marks had been determined, then the most skilled engravers in Germany were drafted sworn to secrecy, and set to work in three shifts. Professors of mathematics worked out, with the help of complicated formulae, the system of British banknote registration numbers, so that our output was always 100 to 200 notes ahead of the Bank of England. These forgeries were so accurate that even the most cautious cashier in a bank would not have suspected anything. A plan had been worked out to send bombers over Britain which, instead of dropping bombs, were to drop forged pound notes by the ton. The country was to be flooded with them. One can imagine what the result would have been. The government would probably have been forced to withdraw all treasury notes from circulation which, apart from the expense involved, would have placed a great burden on the administrative machinery. The population would have been entirely confused, 
and would have lost confidence in the Bank of England. However, this plan was dropped because the air above Britain was too well defended, and our fuel situation was critical. We were assured of the technical perfection which our banknote production had achieved when, towards the end of 1941, one of our men changed a considerable quantity of five and ten pound notes in Switzerland. Boldly, he requested to have their validity checked, saying that he had acquired them on the black market. The Bank of England withdrew about 10% of the notes as forgeries, but the rest they confirmed as bona fide Bank of England notes. This was the sign for me to change over to mass production. However, we made only the most sparing use of the notes. Colton Brunner, for reasons of his own, sought to use them for purchases in the black market of occupied countries. But this was prevented because it would have threatened our own currency situation by forcing the Reichsbank to buy our forgeries and change them into gold and hard currencies. I used the notes myself for the financing of enterprises abroad where I knew that I had to deal with cold blooded and mercenary businessmen. The forged money was also used in the extensive trade of smuggled arms in which the Secret Service was employed. Wherever there was a resistance movement, in Italy, Greece, and also in France, the trade in such arms flourished, and we were able to acquire British and American weapons with our forged pound notes. Most of them were automatic hand weapons which we used in combating the partisan groups. It seemed ironical that the partisans should have sold us the very weapons which we used against them. The operation of producing these forged notes went under the code name Action Bernhard. In 1945, because of Action Bernhard the Bank of England was forced to start printing a new issue of £5 notes and had to withdraw all the old ones from circulation. Unfortunately, more often than not a great deal of money was wasted as a result of the unrealistic fantasies and brainwaves of the leaders. Their imaginations became even more erratic and more fantastic as the fortunes of war turned against Germany. But orders were orders and I was frequently forced to take my most valuable technicians away from their serious tasks to work on some crackpot idea. Goebbels, as propaganda minister, had established a comprehensive monitoring service which served mainly to supply his ministry with suitable material for propaganda to enemy countries. This service, with its host of foreigners working as monitors, was of course a breeding ground for the enemy's intelligence services and was therefore under constant and thorough surveillance by the Gestapo. My approach in this matter was cautious and involved a great deal of patient and painstaking work, in which I was given valuable assistance by Norman, Under Secretary of State in the Propaganda Ministry, who also enjoyed the fullest confidence of Himmler. Norman, a dynamic personality, identified himself fully with the tasks of the Secret Service, and indeed he was the only one who was able to match and counter the brilliant dialectics of his chief. Fifteen time and again he managed to neutralize violent attacks by Goebbels against me personally. During 1943 Goebbels and I were at loggerheads over the question of the treatment of the churches. I had warned Himmler not to fall in blindly with Goebbels's and Bormann's anti-church campaign for as Hitler's heir presumptive he would lose any potential confidence abroad once he allowed himself to be involved in these matters. Under the influence of Goebbels a point had been reached in the autumn of 1943 when Hitler was seriously considering the deportation of the Pope into a kind of exile at Avignon. In extensive reports I tried to point out the immense disadvantages that would result from such an action and how it would discredit Germany in the eyes of the entire world. At last, Himmler agreed with my views and took the matter up with Hitler, who then gave him a comparatively reasonable answer, if full churches contribute to the maintenance of unity amongst the German people, then I cannot object to it, in view of the strains imposed by such a war as this. The setbacks we had received in rapid succession in the years 1943 and 1944, the capitulation of our armies at Stalingrad the collapse of our African army in Tunis, the landing of the Allies in Sicily, the fall and arrest of Mussolini, the capitulation of Italy, all in 1943, and finally the invasion of France in 1944, 
confirmed the analysis of the situation that I had given to Himmler at Sittema during August 1942. In view of this meeting, I had taken up indirect contacts with the Russians through Switzerland and Sweden, and it seemed to me that they were genuinely interested in negotiations which might end the fighting with us. But all my efforts were wrecked by Ribbentrop's short sighted clumsiness and his incredible conceit and optimism in spite of all reverses. Before agreeing, for instance, to meet the Russians, he demanded proof that their representatives were not of Jewish origin. Of course it may easily have been that the willingness of the Russians to negotiate was simply a maneuver to bring pressure on the Allies to open their second front. But whatever the reason, we were in no position to turn them down. As soon as I heard from Dr. Kirsten that a Mr. Hewitt, an American diplomat, was in Stockholm ready to talk about the possibility of peace negotiations, I took a special plane to Sweden. Mr. Hewitt was Roosevelt's special representative for European affairs. Taking all possible precautions for secrecy, I met him in his suite at one of the largest hotels in Stockholm. Afterwards I asked some well-informed Swedish friends to tell me precisely the extent of Hewitt's influence. The references they gave him were excellent. Apparently he had a decisive influence on Roosevelt in all matters concerning Europe. Therefore, on my own responsibility and without reservations, I told him how essential a compromise peace was to Germany. He agreed to arrange official negotiations as soon as I gave my consent. When our talks ended, I flew back to Berlin and worked all night on a report to him. The next afternoon at three o'clock I saw him and informed him fully about my conversations with Hewitt. He was confused and quite aghast at my independent actions, and kept shaking his head and literally gasping for breath. Then he began to talk and gradually worked himself into a state of rage. Fortunately at its climax he had to take part in some ceremony but later he called me to his office again to continue our talk. There followed a heated discussion between us. I was lucky not to be arrested, but all my plans were upset. My powers of persuasion, my efforts to present my analysis of the situation of Germany in a form that would be comprehensible to Himmler, were unavailing, nothing could break the spell which Hitler still exercised upon those around him. When in the summer of 1944 Ribbentrop asked me to go and see him at his summer residence, Schloss Faschel, I was full of apprehension. I had not heard from him for a few months and felt sure that he must have been brooding over one of his intuitions, which would solve all problems and win the war in one stroke. I combined the trip with an interview with Himmler who had set up his headquarters in a special train near Berchtesgaden, Hitler's mountain retreat. I was very overworked at the time, for it was just when I was taking over Kenrizi's military sector of the secret service. Ribbentrop lived at Fushl in a very beautiful palace with a magnificent park, which the state had placed at his disposal so that he could receive important visitors there and still be near Hitler. Contrary to his usual custom, He received me with great cordiality, asked how my work was going, and emphasized how important my department had become to him. I did not know whether this was plain hypocrisy or whether he had some special motive. Calmly I waited for his flow of words to subside. After declaring his wholehearted recognition of the importance of the Secret Service, he said he wanted detailed reports about the United States and especially on Roosevelt's chances of re election. He also wanted me to arrange the passage by U-boat of special agents to work in America on the German minorities there. He visualized a great radio campaign directed towards the various national minorities in the United States to create feeling against Roosevelt's re-election. We discussed details of this plan, and I asked why these minorities should have any special reason to prevent Roosevelt's re-election. He looked at me with astonishment. They don't have to have any special reasons, he said. The important thing is for us to find a way of speaking to these minorities by broadcasts from Europe. The reasons will be invented later. I pointed out that there were certain technical difficulties, among them the great burden borne by our U boat fleet, which would prevent any of our larger boats being available for such an operation. 
Suddenly I remembered my former conversation with Ribbentrop, and his strange theories of secret service work, and I could not help adding, you are somewhat late, Herr Minister. After all, a handful of super agents for the whole world cannot accomplish everything. Ribbentrop stiffened. My dear Selmberg, he said, in a pained voice, that is really unjustified. You should realize that I have done everything in my power to help and encourage the Secret Service. This was so contrary to the truth that I could find nothing to say. I turned, intending to leave the study, when Ribbentrop rose and with a very serious expression, drew me into a corner. One moment, Selmberg. I have a matter of considerable gravity to discuss with you. The utmost secrecy is essential, no one knows of this except the Fra, Bormann and Himmler. Fixing me with a penetrating stare he went on, Stalin must be removed. I nodded, not knowing quite what I was supposed to say. He explained that the whole strength of the Russian regime lay in the ability and statesmanship of one man, Stalin. Then he turned away and strode to the window. I have intimated to the from my readiness to sacrifice myself for the sake of Germany. A conference will be arranged with Stalin, and it will be my mission to shoot down the Russian leader. Alone? I queried. Suddenly he turned to me. That is what the Fuhrer said, one man alone cannot do it. The Fuhrer asked me to name a possible accomplice, here he stared at me intently, and I named you. Hitler, he said had directed him to discuss the matter with me alone, and was sure that I would see the practical aspects of the plan in a realistic light. And you see, Ribbentrop concluded, that is the real reason for my sending for you. I don't know what kind of face I made, but it can hardly have been an intelligent one. I felt utterly at a loss and more than a little confused. Ribbentrop had thought everything out very carefully, and now began explaining the details to me. Undoubtedly there would be an extremely close security check, and it would scarcely be possible to smuggle a hand grenade or a revolver into the conference room. But he had heard that my technical department had developed a revolver disguised as a fountain pen, from which one could shoot a heavy caliber bullet with reasonable accuracy at a range of between 18 and 25 feet. He had been told that it was so cleverly made that a superficial inspection would not reveal its real purpose. We should certainly be able to take it, or something like it, into the conference room, then all that would be needed would be a steady hand. At last he stopped talking. I had been watching him very closely. He had talked himself into such a state of enthusiasm that he seemed like a boy who had just enjoyed his first thriller. But it was quite clear that I was confronted by a determined fanatic and all he wanted was to hear me express my agreement with the plan and my immediate readiness to join him in it. I considered the whole thing as the product, to put it mildly, of a neurotic and overstrained mind. But the situation was not a very comfortable one. I had to assume that every word I said would be reported at once to Hitler. At last, I thought I saw a way to wriggle out of the dilemma. I said that though I considered the plan technically feasible, the whole project was based on whether we could succeed in bringing Stalin to the conference table. This, I thought, would be extremely difficult, especially after the experience the Russians had had with us at Stockholm. Therefore, I refused to have anything to do with any new attempt at making contact with the Russians, for already I had completely lost face in front of them, and all because of Ribbentrop's attitude on the last occasion. I suggested that he himself should try to establish the necessary basis for his plan and get Stalin to agree to come to a conference. Once he had accomplished this, I would be ready to stand by him both in word and deed. I will consider the matter further, Ribbentrop said, and discuss it again with Hitler. Then I will call on you. He never mentioned the matter to me again. But Himmler did, and was obviously very pleased about the reply I had given to Ribbentrop. However, after further discussion with Hitler, Timler himself suggested that something on the same lines as Ribbentrop's plan should be attempted. Accordingly our experts constructed a special device for Stalin's assassination. It consisted of an adhesive charge of explosives which was about the size of a fist and looked like a lump of mud. The idea was for it to be attached to Stalin's car. 
The charge contained a fuse which was controlled by shortwave and was so powerful that very little remained of the car on which we tried it out. The transmitter, which would automatically set off the explosives, was the size of a cigarette box and could send out an ultra short wave for a distance of about seven miles. Two members of the Red Army who had previously been exiled for a long time to Siberia, and one of whom was acquainted with a mechanic in Stalin's garage, accepted the assassination assignment. They were flown in a large transport aircraft at night and dropped near the place where our agents had informed us by short wave that Stalin had his headquarters. The two men jumped and, as far as we could ascertain, landed at the correct place, but that was the last we ever heard of them, although they both carried short wave transmitters. I doubt very much whether they attempted to blow up Stalin. I feel it is more likely that they were either picked up soon after they landed, or that they reported their mission to the NKVD. Meanwhile the threat of collapse was coming nearer. When Himmler took me with him to report to Hitler in the Fras headquarters, there was the usual atmosphere of intensive work and excitement. I had not seen Hitler for a long time and was really alarmed by his appearance. His eyes, which before had been so strong and dominating, were listless and tired. His left arm trembled so violently that he was forced to hold it, almost desperately, with his right hand. He tried to hide the ungainliness of his movements. His back was so bent that he appeared hunchbacked. His gait was clumsy and heavy. Only his voice was still as strong and clear as before, but more staccato. His sentences shorter. He and Himmler were striding up and down the room. They broke off their conversation as soon as I entered, and Hitler sat down for a moment, then turned to Jodl and gave orders concerning the Eastern Front the replacement of two divisions in the central sector, and other military matters. Turning to me, he discussed several of my recent intelligence reports, the problems in the Balkans, especially relations between General Mihailovich and the British, and British relations with Tito. He also wanted to know more about our intelligence activities in the Near East. Then he asked about the elections in the United States and I reported as briefly and concisely as possible. Suddenly he rose, looked at me piercingly, and said in a deep voice which vibrated angrily, I read your reports regularly. There was a long pause, and the words seemed to stand, suspended accusingly in the air of that room. I noticed that Himmler began to show visible signs of uneasiness. Involuntarily I had retreated two steps. But Hitler followed me and said in the same voice, remember this one thing, Selmberg, in this war there can be no compromise, there can only be victory or destruction. And if the German people cannot wrest victory from the enemy, then they shall be destroyed. I shall never forget his concluding words, yes, then they deserve to perish, for the best of Germany's manhood will have fallen in battle. Germany's end will be horrible and the German people will have deserved it. I felt that stark insanity stood there in the middle of the room, and any ties which still bound me to the man fell away at that moment, for he was willing to condemn what was dearest to him, his own people. He willed the destruction of all this to satisfy his vengeful spite. I recall another conversation between Hitler and Himmler at which I was present. Hitler claimed that by the year 2000, no more infantry units would be employed in warfare, there would be only armored units composed of one-man tanks. These would be able to withstand all types of weapons, including chemical ones. Liquid fuel would no longer be needed, and the tanks, which would have an operational radius of more than 2,000 kilometers without the need for servicing or supplies would carry new types of incredibly destructive armament. Before the launching of the Great Offensive in the Ardennes in 1944 Hitler summoned his army commanders to his headquarters. He dwelt at length on the fateful position of Germany as between East and West and emphasized that this was for Germany a life and death struggle. If Germany loses, it will have proved itself biologically inferior and will have forfeited its future existence. It is the West that forces us to fight to the last. However, it will transpire that the winner will not be the West, but the East. Xxxvp feel as Herr Moussi's efforts to save Jewish internees, discussions between Himmler and Herr Moussi, 
Colton Brunner frustrates the efforts of the International Red Cross, a message from Count Bernadotte, Himmler consents to a meeting with the Count, agreement reached on the transference of prisoners, the SS supervised the transfer while Hitler's fortunes declined rapidly, I had to make frequent and desperate use of my position with Himmler to ensure that at least Swiss neutrality was respected, and I honestly feel that it is largely due to my influence with and through Himmler which I was never tired of exerting to the utmost, that a preventive occupation of Switzerland did not take place. Needless to say, these purely negative interventions were inevitably linked with my ceaseless attempts to establish direct or indirect peace feelers. My efforts brought on me the wrath of Colt and Brunner, Bormann and Müller, who were waiting for just such an excuse to bring about my downfall. They almost succeeded. A radio message about Dr. Langben's negotiations with Allied representatives in Switzerland was intercepted, and the fact that Dr. Langben had my blessing in this completely unofficial undertaking was mentioned, as well as Dr. Kirsten's part in furthering these negotiations. Colton Brunner and Muller immediately arranged for a secret investigation, but Kirsten's influence with Himmler saved me from disaster. Later I was able to repay Dr. Kirsten by warning him or taking countermeasures whenever Muller's Gestapo had plans to liquidate him. It was at this time that my contacts in Switzerland brought me into touch with Herr Musi, a former president of Switzerland. He was an utterly selfless man, highly intelligent and knowledgeable, who had one name, the saving of as many as possible of the hundreds of thousands of concentration camp inmates. Towards the end of 1944, after weeks of persuasion, I managed to arrange a secret meeting between Musi and Himmler. At first Himmler kept the conversation on general lines, but at length Musi's forceful personality and clever arguments, together with the pressure I managed to exert, made Himmler come to a decision. He let it be understood, however that he would only agree to a mass evacuation of Jewish concentration camp inmates in return for tractors, cars, medicines and other things of which we were badly in need. Musi made a counter-suggestion that Himmler should content himself with payments in foreign currency to be credited to the International Red Cross. Himmler could not realize that the freeing of thousands of Jews was important from the point of view of Germany's foreign policy. He seemed only to be concerned with the effect such an action would have on the party clique and on Hitler. I realized, during this talk that he genuinely wanted to free himself from his past record on the Jewish question, but he could never work up enough courage to take the decisive step. This part of the talk ended with a suggestion that Switzerland should be recognized by the United States as a place of transit for Jews who would eventually emigrate there and Musi promised to discuss the question with certain Jewish organizations in Switzerland. Just before Musi left for Switzerland I persuaded Himmler to prove his sincerity by conceding one of Musi's special requests, that a number of prominent Jews and Frenchmen should be released. Himmler reluctantly agreed, and asked me to be responsible for seeing that the arrangement was carried out. He also asked me to keep in close contact with Musi and arrange a further meeting between them. I immediately got in touch with Muller to get his permission to take care of these prisoners, but he rejected this request, ostensibly because I was not a member of the Gestapo, and therefore he could not reveal its internal affairs to me. However, he did allow me to contact the officials in charge of the various Gestapo establishments and I was able to find out where the various prisoners were and get them better food and lodging and enable them to receive food packages, in some cases I was also able to get them civilian clothes and lodgings in hotels, and to arrange for their emigration. All this required the unraveling of endless red tape and constant liaison with the Gestapo offices. The second conference between Himmler and Musi was at Wildbad in the Black Forest on January 12, 1945. The following agreement was then reached through my active intervention, 1, every 14 days a first class train would bring about 1,200 Jews to Switzerland, 2, the Jewish organizations with which Herr Musi was working would give active support in solving the Jewish problem according to Himmler's suggestions. At the same time, the beginning of a basic change in the worldwide propaganda against Germany was to be brought about, 3, 
According to my suggestion, it was agreed that the money should not be paid over directly to the International Red Cross, as had originally been decided, but should be handed to Musi as trustee. The first transport went through at the beginning of February and everything functioned very well. Musi acknowledged the receipt of the 5 million Swiss francs, which were paid to him as trustee at the end of February 1945, and also saw to it that the fact was made known to the press, as had been agreed, while an article was published by President von Steiger of Bern, and another appeared in the New York Times. Unfortunately, a decoded message referring to these arrangements, which came from one of de Gaulle's centers in Spain, was brought to Hitler's notice. It was alleged in this message that Himmler had negotiated with Musi through his representative, Selmberg, to secure asylum in Switzerland for 250 Nazi leaders. This obvious nonsense, cunningly circulated by Colton Brunner, had the most uncomfortable consequences for me. Hitler immediately issued two orders, that any German who helped a Jew, or a British, or an American prisoner to escape would be executed instantly, any such attempt was to be reported to him personally. Musi was desperate and shed tears of rage and bitter disappointment. During his last visit to Berlin we both decided to make a final attempt to see if some sort of plan could be worked out. I suggested to Himmler that a four days truce on land and in the air be requested from the Western Allies and that this period should be used to bring all Jews and foreign internees through the front lines in an organized manner, and thus show Germany's goodwill. I brought the chief of the prisoner of war administration, Obergruppenführer Berger, into this plan. He accepted my advice not to pass on many of Hitler's orders, and by doing so saved the lives of hundreds of people. Air Musi and I felt that if such a truce was brought to the Allies through official and responsible channels it would be accepted. Further negotiations might then lead to a general compromise, which would benefit not only those directly involved, but indeed all men. However, Himmler lacked the courage to place this proposal before Hitler. Favoring the plan himself, he turned instead to the leader of the circle around Hitler, to Colton Brunner, who himself gave me his answer, have you gone off your head? This was on April 3, 1945. Musi and I agreed after this that there was only one thing to be done. In view of the continually worsening military situation, Himmler must be made to issue an order to prevent the evacuation of all concentration camps which might be overrun by the Allies. After a long discussion Himmler finally consented, in this matter Dr. Kirsten, who was then in Stockholm, exerted considerable influence on Himmler and was of great help to me, and I was able to tell Musi on April 7, 1945 that Himmler had agreed not to evacuate any concentration camp, and especially asked that his decision be conveyed to General Eisenhower as quickly as possible. In spite of being over 70 years of age, Herr Musi left in his car that same night, and three days later informed me that Washington had received the message and had reacted favorably. He then sent his son back with the car in order to fetch several Jews whose release from Buchenwald had been promised him by Himmler personally. The younger Musi went to the camp commandant and was very badly received. He was horrified to notice that preparations had been made for the evacuation of the camp and at once came to see me in Berlin. I had been quite certain that Himmler's original order would be carried out. However, after hearing Moose's story, I decided to look into the matter. I found that the numerous intriguers had achieved their aim and Himmler was now completely discredited with Hitler. It was Colton Brunner who had given the orders to evacuate all the Gestapo camps. I was still not certain, however, what arrangements were being made about the prisoner of war camps. I telephoned to Himmler at once. He was very embarrassed by my reproaches and annoyed that he had been bypassed and promised me that he would intervene. An hour later I talked with his secretary, Brandt, who assured me that Himmler was doing everything in his power to keep his promise not to evacuate the camps. Himmler, by his energetic intervention, I believe I am right in maintaining this, succeeded in countermanding Colton Brunner's orders, and thereby saved the lives of innumerable people. Through our many negotiations, I had by this time established close personal contact with Herr Musi, 
who confided to me much of the rich experience of his political life, while I was able to explain to him the oppressive worries of my own position. Our discussions were of great help to me, and we determined to work together to prevent as many as possible of the evils that we had to fear. Air Moussi had suggested that M. Harriet, the famous French statesman, should be set free, for this would be a real service to France and would show a delicate sense of political timing. I discussed the matter with Himmler, but he brusquely rejected my suggestion, obviously having talked it over with Colton Brunner. Because of repeated requests from various friends in Switzerland, I tried also to secure a release of another former French minister, Paul Renaud, but this attempt also failed because of Colton Brunner's opposition. Finally I tried to secure a release of some of General Giraud's family, and although at first my efforts failed, after six weeks of continual struggling against Colton Brunner and Müller, I succeeded in getting Himmler's permission. Later Giraud thanked me personally in a letter written in his own hand. Air Moussi had established contact with Dr. Burkhardt, the president of the International Red Cross, who wanted to secure a generous approach from Germany to the question of political prisoners, especially those of French and Polish nationality, and of the Jews. Dr. Burkhardt expressed the wish to meet Himmler and for several days I sought to secure his agreement, but as usual he delayed discussing the matter with Colton Brunner. Finally, I asked Colton Brunner to approach Hitler, who, of course, gave a sharp refusal. I then suggested that Colton Brunner should meet Dr. Burkhardt. He covered himself by informing Ribbentrop, but at length the meeting took place. Dr. Burkhardt came away very satisfied with the result. At last it seemed that the Red Cross would be able to intervene in the question of concentration camp inmates as well as of prisoners of war. Dr. Burkhardt formulated the results of the conversation in a long letter. But Colton Brunner found these results much too concrete. He could not possibly fulfill Dr. Burkhardt's proposals, he said. But in order to save face, he agreed to let the Red Cross remove most of the French women interned in Ravensbrück. I tried to put further pressure on Himmler and pointed out the seriousness of the breach of faith with regard to the Jewish transport, but I was unable to move him sufficiently to take energetic action. Thus, this attempt to solve the problem on a humanitarian basis came to naught. This, then, was the atmosphere when, in February 1945, a message from the Swedish ambassador, Amtman Thompson, stated that Count Bernadotte wished to come to Berlin to talk to Himmler. Ribbentrop sent his personal advisor, J. R. Wagner, to me to ask whether I had organized this move through my connections with Sweden. I told Wagner quite truthfully that I knew absolutely nothing of Count Bernadotte's suggestion, and at once informed Himmler and Colton Brunner. Himmler was very interested but was annoyed that the matter had gone through the embassy and the foreign office. This forced him to treat the Count's visit officially, which meant reporting everything to Hitler. As Himmler was at that time in command of the army group Vistula, and had his headquarters in Prinzlau, he instructed Colton Brunner to talk to Hitler at an opportune moment and to sound the fur on his attitude. Colton Brunner was present every day at the main military council in the Reich Chancellery and would often be alone with the Führer for hours afterwards. However, in order not to risk a personal rejection, he also requested Gruppenführer Feglin, whose wife was Eva Braun's sister, to ask Hitler about the Count's visit. Feglin reported Hitler's reaction the next day and repeated his comment, one cannot accomplish anything with this sort of nonsense in a total war. In the meantime, Count Bernadotte had already arrived in Berlin. I spoke to Himmler on the telephone and begged him earnestly not to miss this opportunity to receive the Count, and emphasized that various points of political interest would be bound to come up during their discussions. After talking back and forth for a long time, Himmler finally agreed to a suggestion that would still leave a line of retreat open to him, Colton Brunner should speak to Ribbentrop, while I at the same time should speak to Wagner. Both of us should try to persuade Ribbentrop to receive Bernadotte, but not to inform Hitler, and Ribbentrop should not be told that Hitler had already expressed objection to the visit. If Ribbentrop agreed, then Colton Brunner and I could receive the Count immediately afterwards. 
Himmler would thus have time to see how the affair was developing before committing himself officially. What actually happened, however, was that Count Bernadotte telephoned to me from the Swedish embassy. First he was received by Colton Brunner and myself, and went to see Ribbentrop immediately afterwards. Though I was reserved during this first conversation, I felt that I had established good relations with the Count. In this visit I saw the possibility of pursuing my original plan, to end the war for Germany. Contact with Sweden could be extremely important in this connection, for she would have a special interest in the pacification of Northern Europe. Thus my original effort to do something for Denmark and Norway would be in line with the Count's aims. The next step would be to secure Sweden as a mediator for a compromise peace. At the close of our conversation the Count again told Colton Brunner that he wished to speak to Himmler, having something which he wanted to say to him personally and alone. I decided to make a bold move to try to win Colton Brunner over, in spite of his personal antagonism. As soon as Bernadotte had left, I praised Colton Brunner for the pliant and skillful manner in which he had responded to the Count's questions and told him that he had handled this delicate situation in the best traditions of the old Austrian school of diplomacy. All this went down beautifully, and I continued by telling him that I had decided to suggest to him that it was now high time to remove Ribbentrop and appoint him, Colton Brunner, as foreign secretary. The slow thinking Colton Brunner took this bait so eagerly that I could hardly hold him. In the subsequent telephone conversation with Himmler he became the most ardent protagonist of the proposed meeting between Himmler and Bernadotte, in spite of Hitler's orders forbidding it. Himmler declared himself ready to receive the Count, on condition that Colton Brunner should not attend the meeting. Disillusioned and embittered by this rebuff, Colton Brunner soon returned to his old antagonism towards me. The meeting between Count Bernadotte and Himmler took place at Hohenlichen two days later. During the drive, I was able to offer him some advice about the impending conversation and prepare him for some of Himmler's peculiarities. The Count's original plan had been to transfer all Danish and Norwegian prisoners to Sweden and intern them there for the duration of the war. I knew that this would never be agreed to and suggested a compromise proposal, that these prisoners should be collected in a central camp in northwest Germany. This suggestion was, in fact, the basis of an agreement reached between the Count and Himmler during their meeting. I had an opportunity of speaking to Himmler immediately after his conversation with the Count. He had been very favorably impressed by him, and intended to maintain close contact with him. He wanted me to supervise the implementation of their agreement, which, as he very well knew, would meet with considerable difficulties from Colton Brunner and Müller, and perhaps from Ribbentrop too. I was to inform Ribbentrop of the essential points of the conversation and of the agreements reached, so that he could present them to the Count officially. First, I informed Colton Brunner of the outcome of the conversation. He began to reproach me at once for having exerted an undue influence on Himmler. Müller, whom he brought into the discussion, immediately produced insuperable technical difficulties, the whole idea was completely utopian, he was not in a position to furnish lorries and petrol for all the widely dispersed Danish and Norwegian prisoners, nor would the Camp Nagam be available, as had been suggested, since it was already full up. It was always the same thing he grumbled, when the gentlemen who considered themselves statesmen talked Himmler into agreeing to one of their ideas. To his objection about the lorries and the petrol, I replied that the Swedes could furnish these. The quickness of my county suggestion caught Müller off his guard and he agreed to it without perceiving its full implications. But the next day he raised new objections, all the roads in Germany were crowded with refugees and it would be imposing on the German people to have Red Cross lorries rolling past them full of prisoners. To this I said that they could be transported during the night, and I offered to assign members of my own department to this operation. Thus, the intervention of my own faithful personnel saved many lives. They worked in conjunction with the Swedish Red Cross in transporting Danish, Norwegian, Polish and Jewish prisoners.
and their combined activities created such uncertainty among the camp commandants that many conflicting orders which came in from Colton Brunner and others were lost sight of in the general confusion. Xxx Himmler shirks the issue the struggle for Himmler's soul, I tried to persuade him to act. His fear of Hitler, his bodyguard degraded, pressure on Himmler to end the war after the meeting with Count Bernard. I talked very seriously to Himmler and told him clearly that the collapse of Germany was inevitable. I begged him to avail himself of the good offices of Sweden and attempt to steer the wrecked German ship of state into the harbour of peace before it capsized. I suggested that he should ask Count Bernadotte to fly to General Eisenhower and transmit to him his offer of capitulation. I also tried to make it clear that his proper place as the commander of an army group was in Berlin, and not in Prinzlau. He should have realized that it was Hitler's advisers who, for the second time, had succeeded in removing him from the Führer's side. He ought to return to Berlin at once and arrange preparations for peace. If need be, he must use force. It was a very stormy conversation. But Himmler finally gave in and granted me the widest authority for negotiating with Count Bernadotte. But the next day he revoked everything. He would only permit me to retain superficial contact with the Count and perhaps influence him to fly to Eisenhower on his own initiative. From that day on, it was at the beginning of March 1945, there was an almost daily struggle between Himmler and me in which I wrestled for his soul. I had already told Count Bernadotte about this struggle. In our talks we had agreed that I was to notify him as soon as Himmler finally made up his mind. I had planned to accompany the Count myself on his flight to General Eisenhower, and we also arranged that in case the Reich capital itself was cut off by the enemy, I would fly with Himmler to South Germany and make contact with Bernadotte by way of the Swedish ambassador in Switzerland. Though in the first place Count Bernadotte had undertaken his mission on behalf of the Danes and the Norwegians, he also tried to intervene on behalf of the Jews and through his intelligent handling of the situation he had already been able to save the Danish Jews. Of special importance were the conversations between Bernadotte and Himmler which started at the end of March, when Himmler had promised the Count not to evacuate the internment camps at the approach of the Allied armies, but to surrender them in good order, especially Bergen-Belsen, Buchenwald and Thracienstadt and the camps in southern Germany. I kept on reminding Himmler how desperate the situation was, and warned him that one day history would hold him responsible for his lack of decision. He replied that the order of the SS had been built on the principle of loyalty and he could not violate this. If he did, he would threaten the very basis of his own position. I told him that compared to the existence of the whole nation the SS represented only a small minority and after their long period of suffering the German people would expect to release from their ordeal. They looked to Himmler, for he was a man who had not sought to profit personally from the regime. To this kind of talk he would merely say, so you want to remove the Fra? And such was his changeable nature that there were days when it would have cost me my position to have answered. Yes. Hitler's appearance as seen in the news reels confirmed my impression that he showed increasingly obvious symptoms of Parkinson's disease, so I arranged a meeting between Himmler and Professor de Krines, to which Himmler asked Tri Health Leader Kinti, to discuss this. De Krines told me later that Himmler had listened with great interest and understanding. Several days later, on April 13, Himmler asked me to go and see him at Wastro. He took me for a walk in the forest and during it he said, Selmberg, I believe that nothing more can be done with Hitler. Do you think that de Krines is right about him? I said, yes, though I haven't seen the Führer for quite a while, but everything he has done lately seems to indicate that now is the time for you to act. On this occasion I pointed once again to the necessity of improving the treatment of the Jews, and of his promise to Herr Musi. Then we discussed Kirsten's plan to come to Germany in the course of the next few days with Heil Storch, a representative of the World Jewish Congress of New York, who wanted to talk about the Jewish problem with Himmler personally. As this visit drew nearer, Himmler was still unable to decide on a definite reply. I told him that for Kirsten's sake, and even more because of the basic problem, 
arrangements for this meeting could no longer be put off. Himmler was well aware that to have a conversation with Herr Storch while Hitler was still alive would be an action of fundamental importance which would have the greatest consequences for his relations with his own associates in the party and in connection with the Jews. I too felt that such a meeting would be of symbolic importance, and for that very reason urged him most strongly to agree to it. Himmler was afraid that if Colton Brunner found out he would immediately report the matter to Hitler, but, as I pointed out, Colton Brunner was going to Austria, so the meeting could take place at Kirsten's estate without his knowledge. Himmler finally agreed to this, but not without reluctance. He was very greatly troubled about his rupture with the Fuhrer, which by this time was almost complete. Hitler had even given orders that Himmler's special SS Lubstandarte, bodyguard, were to have the stripes removed from their sleeves as a mark of dishonor. Himmler said to me that I was the only one, apart from Brandt, whom he could trust completely. What should he do? He could not shoot Hitler, he could not give him poison, he could not arrest him in the Reich Chancellery, for then the whole military machine would come to a standstill. I told him that all this did not matter, only two possibilities existed for him, either he should go to Hitler and tell him frankly all that had happened during the last years and force him to resign, or else he should remove him by force. Himmler objected that if he spoke to Hitler like that the Führer would fall into a violent rage and shoot him out of hand. I said, that is just what you must protect yourself against, you still have enough higher SS leaders, and you are still in a strong enough position to arrest him. If there is no other way, then the doctors will have to intervene. Our talk lasted about an hour and a half, but Himmler was still unable to arrive at a decision. Instead, he wanted to confront Bormann with Professor de Krines, Professor Morel, Hitler's personal physician, and Dr. Stumpfiger, another of Hitler's doctors, who was also an SS leader. Two days later, I asked Professor de Krines what the decision had been. He was very disappointed. The doctors had refused to commit themselves, and nothing that they permitted themselves to say would have been of any help with Bormann. When I reported this to Himmler he begged me to maintain silence about the whole matter. I then pointed out to him the senselessness of the Wehrwolf organization, which was being formed to carry on the struggle after Germany's defeat. This plan, I said, would bring nothing but suffering to the German people. Opportunities would arise for every sort of crime to be committed, as each individual would take it upon himself to decide what he considered justified in the national interest. Yet these grave measures were being lightly and irresponsibly advocated by the German leaders. They were even announcing over the German radio that they would repudiate the Hague Conventions. I ended with the words criminal and stupid. But Himmler was obviously too exhausted by this spiritual struggle with me. He merely said, I will try to think of some way to finish this business. During the first week of April, I had established contact with the Rye Minister of Finance, Graf Schwerin von Krossig. We had a long conversation, and von Krossig agreed with me that the war had to be ended quickly in order to save as much of Germany's resources as possible. I had been talking about this with Himmler too for quite a time. Himmler had gradually become estranged from von Krossig, and therefore I brought the two of them together again for a discussion, which took place on the afternoon of April 19. Once again Himmler jibbed at the last moment, and it was touch and go whether the meeting would take place. However, when we finally arrived at von Krossig's office, we found that the Minister of Labour, Seld, was also the dot von Krossig and Himmler carried on their discussion privately, while I had a conversation with Seldt. Seldt felt that Himmler should seize power himself and force Hitler to read a proclamation to the German people on his birthday, announcing a plebiscite, the formation of a second party, and abolition of the people's courts. He elaborated this thesis for almost two hours then asked me what my opinion was of the chances for a defense of the Alpine area, known as the Redoubt. I replied that I saw no chance at all in any further military action, that only by speedy action on the political level could anything be achieved. In the meantime, the conversation between von Krossig and Himmler had ended. Von Krossig was very satisfied, although he knew that it was really much too late and that little chance of success remained. 
he begged me to continue to influence Himmler so that he might take the decisive step with or without Hitler. After the meeting Himmler thanked me for bringing it about. I told him that I was convinced that von Krosik was the only man in Germany who could become foreign minister. After we arrived in Hohenlichen the general report of the military situation made a sad picture. I advised Himmler most emphatically not to drive into Berlin for Hitler's birthday the next day. A message had come that Kirsten and Norbert Mazur, who had come in Herr Storch's place as representative of the World Jewish Congress, had arrived at Tempelhof Airport and had gone on to Kirsten's estate at Hartswalder. As Count Bernadotte was expected in Berlin at the same time, there was a great danger that these two meetings might conflict, especially in view of the difficult military situation. Therefore Himmler begged me to drive to Kirsten that night and begin preparatory conversations with Mazur, and also arrange a time for Himmler to meet him. I had dinner at Hohenlichen and tried to persuade Himmler to send Berger to southern Germany. I thought he would be a counterpoise to Colton Brunner, whom I deeply mistrusted, so much so indeed that I feared for the safety of my family. But Himmler defended Colton Brunner whom he described as a politically intelligent and far-sighted man. In fact, the more clearly he perceived my opposition, the more he praised him. I excused myself shortly before midnight, just as Himmler, quite contrary to his usual custom, had ordered another bottle of champagne in which to toast Hitler's birthday at 12.00 apostrophe clock. It was a bright moonlight night. But we were held up on our drive for a considerable time by aircraft which were dropping flares over Berlin. We arrived at the Hartswalde estate at 2.30 and I found the whole place fast asleep. I talked to Kirsten until 4 o'clock in the morning. He was very unhappy about Himmler's hesitation, and doubted whether a successful meeting between him and Mazur could still be brought about. But it was very important that Himmler should show his goodwill. I explained to Kirsten how difficult my whole situation had become lately, and how I had tried all possible means to bring this meeting about. Excel negotiations with Count Bernard. Himmler gives assurances concerning the Jews, an all night discussion. Himmler confers with Count Bernard. A plan to contact President Roosevelt. The Count is asked to transmit a declaration of surrender. Himmler and the Count confer again. The Allies refused to negotiate with Himmler, I renew discussions with the Count, terms agreed for our evacuation of Scandinavia, Colton Brunner dismisses me from my posts, Admiral Dennitz nominated to succeed Hitler on the morning of April 20th I was awakened at 9 by the noise of planes overhead, and while I was shaving a bomb dropped about a mile away, an unpleasant surprise for Herr Mazur. I breakfasted with him and immediately afterwards we had our first discussion. He insisted that nothing could be accomplished without a meeting with Himmler, but he would have to leave Berlin by Monday at the latest. As I knew that Himmler intended once again to put off meeting him, I had got to get him to keep to the agreed date. At this point a telephone call came through from Count Bernadotte, who was staying at the Swedish Embassy in Berlin. He told me that he would like to speak to Himmler once more before leaving for Sweden at 6 o'clock the next morning. Somehow or other I had to get Himmler to see Mazur, and arrange for a meeting with Count Bernadotte, who was coming to Hohenlichen for this purpose that same night. At about 9 in the evening I went to Wastro to wait for Himmler, who was delayed by heavy air attacks. When he eventually arrived, I managed to persuade him to drive with me to meet Herr Mazur. Accompanied by a driver and Himmler's secretary, Brandt, we left for Hartswaldo at a quarter past one. On the way Himmler told me what he intended to say to Mazur. In essence it was a chronological summary of the past with a clever attempt at justification. I asked him not to speak of the past at all, or to expound his astrological and philosophical theories, but to determine precisely what had to be done in the future. Now and then we had to take cover from low flying aircraft, and we arrived at Hartswalde around 3 in the morning. Mazur and Kirsten were waiting for us, and after a brief greeting, their conversation began. It was conducted for the most part by Himmler, who wanted to prove that he had tried to solve the Jewish problem in terms of expulsion, but that this could not be done because of the outside world's resistance on the one hand, and on the other, the opposition within the Nazi party. 
Major did not embark on any long discussion of the various points, but said after about three quarters of an hour that although Himmler's account had been very interesting, it was not in any way conducive towards changing the situation. That, however, was his main purpose for coming here, and he wanted the following assurances, that no more Jews would be killed, that the remaining Jews, and their numbers were very uncertain, should remain in the camps and under no circumstances be evacuated. He asked for lists of all the camps in which Jews were still being held to be given to him. On these points agreement was reached, Himmler repeating every time that he had already given such orders. He was, in fact, ready to free the Jewish women in Ravensbrueck camp and turn them over to measure, for he had received permission from Hitler to free all the Polish women from that camp. Therefore, if there were any questions about it afterwards, he could say the Jewish women were Poles. I then went into another room with Maja in order to decide on other points to be discussed, but when the conversation was resumed it tended to become more and more vague, dealing with completely unimportant side issues. I was anxious to bring it to a conclusion in order to be able to arrive at Hohenlichen with Himmler by six o'clock in the morning, so after briefly saying goodbye, we left Hartswalder, it was now half past four. I assured Maja once more as we left that I would do all in my power to arrange for his departure the next day. We arrived at Hohenlichen punctually at six o'clock, this was on the morning of the 21st, and had breakfast with Count Bernard. I hoped that the frank conversation between Himmler and the Count, which I had desired for so long, would now take place. Himmler told the Count of the possibility of transporting all the Polish women in Ravensbrueck to Sweden. In fact, I had made all preparations for this and had drawn up a list of all the Poles in Ravensbrueck camp. As they were mostly children or young girls, I was determined to free them at all costs. I impressed most strongly on Himmler the shamefulness of this situation, and emphasized the high racial qualities of the Polish people by pointing to my own wife as an example. This impressed him greatly and he seemed considerably preoccupied with the question, for he constantly referred to it, although it was not until much later that he took any action. Count Bernard asked whether it would not be possible to transport the Danish and Norwegian internees to Sweden, but Himmler was unable to grant permission for this, though he agreed that should the Allied armies threaten to overrun the Nagam camp there would be no evacuation. The Count thanked him for his willingness and for the confidence shown him in previous conversations. The discussion then came to an end and they said goodbye. Himmler, knowing I was to accompany the Count part of the way, hoped that I would once more beg him to fly to General Eisenhower and try to arrange for him to have a conference with the General. However, at our parting on the road near Wehren in Mecklenburg, Count Bernard said to me, the Reichsfuhrer no longer understands the realities of his own situation. I cannot help him any more. He should have taken Germany's affairs into his own hands after my first visit. I can hold out a little chance for him now. And you, my dear Selmberg, would be wiser to think of yourself. I did not know what to reply to this. When we said goodbye, it was as though we would never see each other again. I was filled with a deep sadness. I drove back to Hohlichen, slept for two hours, and was then called to Himmler at about 12.30. He was still in bed, the picture of misery, and said that he felt ill. All I could say was that there was nothing more I could do for him, it was up to him. He had got to take some action. At lunch we discussed the military situation in Berlin, which was steadily growing worse. At about four o'clock, having convinced him that it would be unwise to drive to Berlin, we drove towards Wustrow. In Lohenburg we were caught in a traffic jam, troops having become involved with the unending columns of fleeing civilians which blocked all the roads between Berlin and Mecklenburg. As we drove on, Himmler said to me for the first time, Selmberg, I dread what is to come. I said that this should give him the courage to take action. He did not answer. Just before we got to Wastra, we were attacked by low flying planes. However, their main target was the column of refugees and troops through which we had passed. After dinner, when we were alone again, we spoke of various problems of food supplies, the danger of epidemics, reconstruction, prisoner of war administration and so on. 
I told him of Colton Brunner's blind and unrealistic attitude in insisting on the evacuation at all costs of all the concentration camps. Himmler grew very nervous when I called this a crime, and said, brusquely, Selmberg, don't you start too. Hitler has been raging for days because Buchenwald and Bergen Belsen were not completely evacuated. At that moment, Figlin telephoned to say that Hitler and Goebbels were raging because Berger had not remained in Berlin. He had in fact just left Berlin to fly to southern Germany in Himmler's place. He was needed by Hitler to carry out the sentence passed on Dr. Brandt, Hitler's former personal physician who had just been condemned to death for smuggling his wife into the hands of the Americans in Thuringia. Apparently this was a complex intrigue among Hitler's entourage involving Hitler's friend Eva Braun, and her sister, who was Figlin's wife. Himmler did everything he could to prevent the doctor's execution and immediately gave instructions over the telephone to the Gestapo chief, Müller. Dr. Brandt was transferred to Schwerin, which was safer from air attacks and Figlin was told that Berger was on his way south by plane. For this reason sentence could not be executed at the moment, unless Bormann and Goebbels wanted to do the job themselves. When Himmler returned he told me what he would do once he had complete power in Germany, and asked me to think about a name for the new alternative party which I had suggested to him. I suggested National Unity Party. After referring once more, though only in the vaguest terms, to Hitler's removal, he dismissed me, it was now about 4.30, and went to bed. The next morning, it was Sunday, April 22nd, it appeared that the military situation had become so much worse overnight that four Waffen-SS divisions, under Obergruppe and Steiner, had been ordered by Hitler to make a suicide attack on the Russians. Himmler was convinced that this order was necessary though both his military adjutant and I agreed that it would only mean unnecessary bloodshed. After breakfast Obergrupp and Führerberger came in. He was to drive back with us to Hohenlichen and Wastra was to be evacuated as it was threatened by the enemy. We discussed the case of Vannerman, an American Air Force general who had formerly been military attaché in Berlin, and was at this time a prisoner of war in Germany. Berger and I suggested that Vannerman, together with another United States Air Force colonel, should be got out of Germany and flown via Switzerland to the United States to contact Roosevelt. He was to try to get better supplies and conditions for the American prisoners of war, and at the same time tell Roosevelt of Himmler's desire for peace with the Western powers. I had planned this long ago, having in mind the freeing of influential British prisoners of war so that they might work towards an understanding between their country and Germany. Hitler and Himmler, however, had given strict orders against this. I had had long conversations with Vannerman, and we were in full agreement. As Himmler had refused his permission, I arranged with friends in Switzerland and with the United States military attache in Bern, General Legg, for Vannerman to cross the border illegally. I did this on my own responsibility and arranged for a car to bring him and the Air Force Colonel to the frontier near Constance. As I had had no news of them, I asked Berger to attend to the matter. By this time Himmler was in agreement with the plan. Towards noon we had to leave Wastro in great haste as Russian armored spearheads were reported in the vicinity of Oranienburg, as well as in the general direction of Lohuenburg and Kremen. We drove in a northerly direction from Wastro towards Mecklenburg, and then angled off to the east in order to reach Hohenlichen. For more than an hour and a half we drove past Weimacht columns, artillery, and armor on the move, constantly harassed by low-flying light bombers and fighters. Finally we arrived at Hohenlichen. After a belated lunch Himmler said to me, I almost believe you are right, Selmberg, I must take action now. What do you suggest? I explained to him that things had gone too far. Certainly there could be no hope from Vanneman's mission, though there might still be a possibility of talking frankly about the whole situation with Count Bernadotte. Without Himmler's knowledge, I had already informed the Count much more fully about the true situation in Germany, I did not know whether I could reach the Count in Denmark, but he might still be in Lwebeck. Himmler decided that I should go to Lwebeck at once. He was prepared now to ask the Count, officially and in his own name, 
to transmit a declaration of surrender to the Western powers. I prepared immediately for my departure, and left for Quebec at 4.30 in the afternoon, but because of enemy aircraft and the blocked roads I did not arrive there until late at night. I found that Count Bernadotte was in a pen raid in Denmark, and in spite of tremendous difficulties I got through to him on the telephone and asked him to receive me at Flensburg the next day. He agreed to meet me at 3 o'clock on April 23 at the Swedish consulate in Flensburg. It was already morning. I rested for three hours, then telephoned Himmler to inform him of my appointment, and afterwards drove on to Flensburg. I arrived at 1 o'clock, and was received by the Swedish attache, Chiron, who took me to lunch with the consul, Peterson. Count Bernadotte arrived at 3 o'clock. After discussing the general situation and Himmler's intentions, the Count said he believed it was no longer necessary to go to Quebec to meet Himmler, and that the best solution would be for Himmler simply to set down his proposals in a letter to General Eisenhower announcing unconditional surrender to the Western powers. As I did not think this would be possible as long as Hitler was still alive, I begged him to drive with me to meet Himmler at Quebec. After an hour's conversation the Count agreed to do so. From Flensburg I telephoned to Himmler's special train to ask him to come to Quebec. Brandt answered, and said that Himmler could not be reached at the moment but promised to call me back. It was very fortunate that in spite of the emergency situation the telephone still functioned so well. Brandt called me back at 6 o'clock and said that Himmler would be glad to meet Count Bernadotte at Quebec at 10 o'clock that night and that he wished me to be present. After a quick meal, the Count and I left Flensburg and drove to Quebec, arriving at the Swedish consulate at 9 o'clock. I went to the office which had been set up at the Danziger Hof Hotel and got into touch with General Wennerberg's office, where Himmler planned to stay. At 10 o'clock I saw Himmler and told him the essential points of my conversation with the Count and sought to strengthen his decision to make a declaration of capitulation. For a little while Himmler hesitated, but finally he agreed. Very well, we will drive to see the Count at 11 o'clock, he said. Please arrange for the meeting at that time. At 11 I drove with him to the Swedish consulate, where the meeting took place by candlelight owing to a power cut. After formal greetings had been exchanged, there was an air raid alarm, followed by a heavy raid on a nearby airfield. We had to go down into the cellar and it was midnight before we were able to resume the conversation. Himmler made a lengthy exposition of the military and political situation of the Reich before reaching his summing up, it was a comparatively honest one, of the situation, we Germans have to declare ourselves defeated by the Western powers, and I beg you to transmit this to General Eisenhower through the Swedish government, so that we all may be spared further unnecessary bloodshed. It is not possible for us Germans, and especially is it not possible for me, to capitulate to the Russians. Against them we will fight on until the front of the Western powers replaces the German fighting front. Himmler pointed out that he had the right to make the decision on these matters, for it would only be a question of two or three days before Hitler gave up his life. At least he would have died in the struggle to which he had devoted his existence. The fight against Bolshevism. Count Bernadotte expressed his readiness to transmit Himmler's declaration. As he pointed out, he, and probably the Swedish government, too, were primarily interested in preserving the Scandinavian area from senseless destruction through a continuation of the war. For him, as a Swede, this was his justification for agreeing to Himmler's request. Himmler said that he fully understood this point. In reply to a further question from the Count, he said he was ready to permit the transport of Danish and Norwegian internees to Sweden. A great deal of time was taken up in deciding how the declaration of surrender should be transmitted to the Western powers. The original plan, that Count Bernadotte should fly direct to General Eisenhower, without any diplomatic preliminaries or preparation, was abandoned. Eventually they agreed that Himmler should write a letter to His Excellency Christian Genther, the Foreign Minister of Sweden, begging him to give his kind support to Himmler's communication, handed to him through Count Bernadotte. 
Himmler briefly discussed the wording of the letter with me and then drafted it himself by candlelight. The Count expressed his readiness to fly to Stockholm the next day, April 24, to initiate the necessary arrangements. It was agreed that I should drive the Count to Flensburg and remain there to act as liaison over any further questions that might arise. After warm farewells, Himmler and I left the Swedish consulate at 1.30 p.m. Both on the way to and from the consulate, Himmler drove his car, a very heavy one, himself. He drove so badly that I and one of my men, acting as our guide, were in a cold sweat. He was never a good driver to begin with and now was in a state of considerable nervous strain. He repeatedly jumped the curb, and each approaching lorry was a fresh ordeal. When we set off from the Swedish consulate he started too quickly and drove into a ditch. All of us, including Count Bernadotte, had to struggle for a quarter of an hour to get the car going again. I accompanied Himmler back to General Wennerberg's office and stayed with him for another half hour in order to calm his fears about the steps he had taken. I tried to give him courage, and told him that he had not committed an act of betrayal towards the German people. Then I went to the Danzigerhof, and at five o'clock in the morning returned to the Swedish consulate to fetch Count Bernadotte and drive to Flensburg. When we arrived at the German Danish frontier, I said goodbye to the Count, who expressed his hope of telephoning good news to me shortly. It was getting on for midday before I was at last able to try and get some rest at the Swedish consul's house, but I had scarcely settled down when I was woken again by a heavy air raid and a naval bombardment from warships lying offshore. I hurried down to the cellar, only half dressed, and was rather embarrassed to meet my hostess for the first time. The next day, April 25th, I ordered Standart and Fuhr above and Sippen to report to me at Flensburg. First I showed him my special authorization signed by Himmler which read, acting under special assignment from me, General Selenberg's orders are to be obeyed without question. I told Bovensippen that all inmates of Danish and Norwegian concentration camps were to be turned over without fail to Sweden. I said that I intended to go to Copenhagen the next day to discuss the Danish political situation with Dr. Best, Minister Extraordinary and Plenipotentiary in Denmark, and asked him to make arrangements for this meeting. The chief aim was to stop all death sentences and executions. On April 26, I received an interim report from Count Levin Haupt, of the Swedish consulate, that the negotiations were not going very well, and that the Allies refused to negotiate with Himmler. I did not pass this information on to him, however. During the night, I was informed that Count Bernadotte would arrive from Copenhagen at Odense Airport the next morning. When I got there I learned that the Count's departure from Copenhagen had been delayed by bad weather, and I waited with increasing anxiety as the weather continued to deteriorate. The airport commandant instructed all observation and anti-aircraft stations to be on the lookout and flares were shot off continually until the plane finally landed at 4 o'clock in the afternoon. We then drove to a pen raid where we were able quietly to discuss the negative result of our plans and the difficult situation which resulted from the Allies' attitude towards Himmler. We then considered what conclusions could be arrived at. Count Bernadotte spoke as a private person, but his chief concern remained the prevention of further fighting in Norway and Denmark and he offered to drive with me to see Himmler in order to discuss this. Not only had our plans come to nothing, but the Allied press had published an account of the matter. My position with Himmler would therefore be a rather delicate one and I was very glad to have the Count come till we back with me. We arranged to meet at four the next morning and to drive the together. I returned to Flensburg and tried to get in touch with Himmler, but was only able to speak to Brandt, who asked very excitedly what the results were. I said that they had been negative, but that the Count wanted to come till we back to discuss the question of the German armies in the Scandinavian area. This proposal was sharply rejected. I was to report to Himmler alone. This conversation took place just after midnight. I did not wish to awaken the Count at that hour, so I left for a pen raid at three o'clock and at the appointed hour saw the Count and asked him not to accompany me, I was to meet Himmler, I said, to the south of Lwebeck and would have to approach too close to the front line. 
Then I left him and drove till we back. This was on the morning of April 28. I realized that my position with Himmler would now be so difficult that I should have to face the fact that I might be liquidated. I therefore arranged for an astrologer from Hamburg to accompany me. Himmler knew this man personally, and thought very highly of him. He could never resist having his horoscope read, and I felt this would soften his reaction to the disappointment. The first part of my talk with Himmler need not be described here. It was not easy, and looking back on it, I cannot understand why it turned out so well. For a long time, we discussed the grounds of the Allies' rejection. Himmler was bitterly disappointed, and particularly annoyed that the facts had been published in the world's press. He feared that his letter to the Swedish foreign minister would now be published as well. We then discussed the problem of Denmark and Norway. The fact that Himmler held me responsible, as the instigator of his peace move, for its failure, which could have such fatal consequences for his relationship with Hitler, did not seem to offer a very good basis for my plans to save the Scandinavian countries. However, with the aid of the astrological gentleman, I was able to persuade him to accept my view and after thinking the matter over for an hour, he gave me permission to discuss with Count Bernadot the ending of the German occupation of Norway and the internment in Sweden of the German occupation forces for the remainder of the war. Himmler stated that he was prepared to arrange a similar solution for Denmark, but that this should be finally decided later on. However, he authorized me to prepare Dr. Best for such a plan. Furthermore, he was prepared to appoint me as his special representative to the Swedish government to negotiate a peaceful solution in the Scandinavian area. At that time he still took for granted that within a day or two he, as Hitler's successor, would be in a position to decide these questions without any difficulty. I immediately returned to Flensburg, arriving at a pen raid at about noon on the 29th, and lunched with the Count and Ambassador Thompson at the latter's house. Afterwards the Count and I discussed Himmler's agreement concerning the Scandinavian area, and he arranged a meeting for the next day between the representatives of the Swedish government and myself, at which he would also be present. Thompson drew my attention to a number of special requests involving the prevention of execution and the freeing of Danish policemen, and the following day I was able to deal with these matters to his satisfaction. That afternoon at about five o'clock we left a pen raid for Copenhagen. The Count drove, and after a smooth journey we arrived at the Danish capital, where we stopped at the Hotel de Apostrophe Anglita. On the morning of April 30th, I first drove to Dr. Best to inform him of my authorization concerning the peaceful lifting of the German occupation of the Scandinavian countries and of Himmler's assumed succession to Hitler. As I had foreseen, Dr. Best agreed to everything. At noon I met Herr von Post, of the Swedish government, and Count Bernadotte. All went very smoothly. The Swedish government asked for the whole plan to be arranged through me with clear and binding proposals on the part of the German government. At the close of the meeting the Swedish ambassador at Copenhagen, von Dardell, gave a lunch to which Dr. Best was also invited. Immediately after lunch I drove to Corsa to take the ferry, which had been held up for me for two hours. I arrived at Flensburg at night and there met a member of my organization, Sturmbanfuhrer Dr. Worsing who informed me that Carlton Brunner had dismissed me from all my posts, and had appointed Obers Chermbanfuhrer Wonk chief of the political sector of the Secret Service, and Obers Chermbanfuhrer Skortsny chief of the military sector. After a short telephone conversation with Himmler, Dr. Worsing and I drove on till we back, as I wanted him to be able to fly back to the south with Himmler's counter orders in connection with my dismissal. Our journey which was only 30 miles, took us three and a half hours because the roads were completely blocked by troops streaming back from the Mecklenburg area. We arrived at four o'clock in the morning on May 1st, and I was conducted to Himmler's new quarters at Kolkhorst, near Travmuend, by one of his adjutants. As Himmler had not gone to bed until three o'clock, I went to Brandt, who told me the startling news that Hitler had committed suicide and Admiral Denitz, not Himmler, 
had been made his successor. Xlmi last mission Count von Krossig replaces Ribbentrop, military opposition to the surrender of Scandinavia, a manifesto to the German people prepared, a dangerous journey, von Krossig coffers to appoint me his assistant, Dennis remains adamant on the question of evacuation, I am appointed von Krossig's envoy, Copenhagen on the eve of surrender, peace discussions in Stockholm, my authority in question, Germany surrender Schimmler and Admiral Dennitz, the new chief of the German Reich, had met at Plön and conferred late into the night on the immediate future policy that was to be adopted. Himmler had prevailed upon Dennitz to proclaim, as his first act, the removal of Ribbentrop and the appointment of Count Schwerin von Krossig as foreign minister. But the admiral and his entourage, consisting wholly of Wehrmacht officers, had shown no understanding of Himmler's political moves towards the Western powers, and consequently the Reichsfuhrer was in the worst possible mood. He was playing with the idea of resigning, and was even talking of suicide. I tried to rest for half an hour, and then at nine o'clock Himmler called me to join him for breakfast. I reported to him on my conversations with Herr von Post, Dr. Best and the Count. He was very nervous and distracted and told me that he was no longer capable of taking action in the matters I had discussed with them. The only thing he had been able to achieve was to secure removal of Ribbentrop and the appointment of von Krossig. Himmler wanted to take me to Dennitz right away, so that I could act as von Krossig's assistant on questions of foreign policy. It would also be an advantage if I could report to the Dennitz government on my efforts regarding Denmark and Norway. If I could persuade them to agree to the peaceful surrender of the two countries, someone else should be sent to Sweden and I should remain with the government. At eleven o'clock that morning we set out to drive to Plön to see Denitz. We went by way of Lwebeck and after a difficult journey, arrived at two in the afternoon. There was an air of great excitement among the whole staff, and after paying my respects to Denitz, Kiitel and Jodl, I got into touch with von Krossig. In the afternoon, I learned that although von Krossig agreed with my view on Scandinavia, Dennitz, Kiitel, and Jodl were by no means ready to surrender Norway without a fight. I had promised Herr von Post to return immediately to Copenhagen with a decision. To continue aiding at Plön would only mean a loss of time and might make it impossible for me to accept the Swedish offer. General Oberst Bohm, Reichskommissar Turboven, General Abbast Lindman and Dr. Best had, in the meantime, been called to Plön to discuss the problem with Dennitz. I therefore decided to tell Herr von Post about the new situation, and Himmler agreed to my returning to Copenhagen for this purpose. In the meantime, he and von Krossig would continue to press for a peaceful solution. I left Plön at three in the morning and arrived at Flensburg at seven. I remained there for three hours, working with Dr. Worsing on a draft which was to represent my first collaboration with the new foreign minister. I suggested that the National Socialist Party, the Gestapo, and the SD should be dissolved and that this should be proclaimed over the wireless. Dr. Worsing completed the draft for me and sent it off, for I could no longer fight off my overwhelming need for sleep. Dr. Worsing was to fly to southern Germany the next night. So in view of Colton Brunner's action in removing me from my office, I instructed him to tell my staff to submit outwardly to his authority, but to preserve their professional loyalty towards me. In the evening I left for Copenhagen. From Padborg, in Denmark, Count Bernadotte's personal Red Cross car was placed at my disposal. This was a great advantage, especially in getting past Wehmacht control points, and served as excellent camouflage for me. I was cheered and welcomed as a Swede and continually asked for my autograph. I felt rather uncomfortable. I arrived at Copenhagen at one o'clock on May 3rd, and my conversation with Herr von Post and Herr Ostroem took place at four. I explained the situation, and told them that Admiral Dennitz had ordered the military and civilian authorities of Denmark and Norway to report to him for a conference. There were good grounds for assuming that backed by the influence of Count Schwerin von Krossig and Himmler, my plan for surrender would be agreed upon. Herr von Post said he was no longer in a position to make any binding agreements. A general capitulation was inevitable within the next few days, 
and at that moment the surrender of Denmark and Norway was a purely academic question. However, he was still willing to pursue our old plan, and I should immediately forward any offer from the new German government to him. We agreed that I should return as quickly as possible, and I arranged to communicate with him by telephone, using the following code words, I should be very happy to see the gentleman again, which would mean there had been a binding proposal on the part of the Reich government with regard to Norway. The words, and report to you added would mean that the proposal would also cover Denmark. Herr von Post and Herr Ostrom emphasized that they could no longer remain in Copenhagen. The maintenance of secrecy necessitated their departure, for, of course, the negotiations were being conducted in the strictest secrecy. So I returned to Flensburg that night and started for Plön early the next morning. The journey was one of the most difficult and dangerous I have ever undertaken. On the relatively short distance of about 55 miles, there were more than 12 strafing attacks on roads which were completely jammed with retreating army columns and immobilized transport. There were long lines of burnt out lorries, corpses covered the roads, and here and there were the ruins of tanks. We had to fight our way through all this, periodically taking cover in ditches and fields from strafing by low flying aircraft. When we did arrive at Blown, the guards informed us that the seat of the government had been transferred to the Marine School at Muick, near Flensburg. As my mission would not brook an hour's delay, I had to turn round at once and make my way back through the Holocaust from which I had just emerged. However, I managed to arrive at Muick at five o'clock in the afternoon, and ten minutes later I was reporting to the Foreign Minister and Himmler. Again I stressed that in spite of the continuing deterioration of the situation, a solution in the Scandinavian area, through the help of Sweden, would be of the greatest importance. Then I spoke with von Krossig Cologne. He told me that if I would stay with him, he would appoint me his first assistant. On the other hand, he considered it was important for me to go to Stockholm. We agreed that time was of the utmost importance, for a total capitulation could not be far off. The only thing that was holding it up was the fact that in the Bohemian Moravian area the army groups of Field Marshal So Anna and General Abbas Trendulic, consisting of almost a million men supplied with munitions and provisions for seven weeks, were still intact. They were doing a more than adequate job of defending the Eastern Front. At about 8 o'clock in the evening, I reported to Admiral Dennitz. At first, he would hear nothing about lifting the occupation of Norway or the internment of German troops in Sweden. Obviously, his military advisers had pointed out to him the excellent strategic position of General Bohm's army. Even after I had proved to him the political importance of a peaceful solution, and of the intervention of Sweden, he still demanded to know what immediate gain it would bring for Germany. I explained to him that it was a question of long-term political prospects, apart, of course, from the saving of a large number of German lives. It would ameliorate world opinion towards us, and in the near future it might be of some importance for a defeated Germany to have support from a neutral country like Sweden. In view of Germany's collapse, to continue fighting in Norway and Denmark was not only misguided, it was utterly futile. At this point, the meeting was broken off, and I went to dinner with von Krossig, Ki Eitel, and Jodl. At the table, we continued the discussion. Both Ki Eitel and Jodl wanted me to remain with them, as I had the most experience in matters of foreign policy. However, I pointed out the importance of my mission to Stockholm, and in the end Jodl at least seemed to understand. Afterwards I spoke again to von Krossig and advised him to induce Dennitz to follow my suggestions to dissolve the party, the Gestapo and the SD as soon as possible. We then discussed in which capacity it would be best for me to go to Stockholm. Von Krossig offered to make me ambassador, special plenipotentiary, representative or whatever I preferred. I suggested that he should appoint me envoy, for this corresponded accurately to the tasks upon which I was embarking. That night secretaries of state Stingrecht and Henk were called over by the foreign minister, and together they prepared the documents authorizing my appointment as envoy. Dennitz signed these the next morning, May 5, and after reporting to Krossig at 10 o'clock, 
I bade farewell to Himmler and left for Copenhagen. A few days later, Himmler committed suicide. Arriving at Copenhagen, I went to the Dagmarhus, for I wanted to inform Dr. Best of my mission. While I was waiting for him, a huge crowd gathered in the town square inches expectation of the impending surrender of Germany. Shots were fired and police vans and ambulances drove up, the crowd growing meanwhile until it must have reached tens of thousands. It was obvious that Dr. Best would not be able to make his way through the tumult. I could not wait as it was imperative for me to get to the Swedish embassy right away for apparently they had not received my telephone message from the frontier. After a long discussion with the SS guard at the Dagmarhus, an opening was made in the barbed wire barrier, and I was able to drive through in Count Bernadotte's car. Though the driver tried to avoid the crowded streets, we suddenly found ourselves surrounded by thousands of people. They recognized the Count's car and pressed round it until we could move neither forwards nor backwards. Fortunately I had locked the door from the inside and closed the windows, otherwise they would have pulled me out. I ordered the driver to push on, come what may, and slowly we inched our way through the solid mass of human beings. Those immediately next to the car began to cry out as those behind them kept on pushing forward, gesticulating with wild enthusiasm. By now there were about thirty people all over the car, on the running boards, on the roof, on the bonnet, and only the calm and skill of the driver kept it moving. Meanwhile both he and I, in order to placate the wild demonstrators, kept nodding and saying tack, tack, and taking off our hats. When eventually we reached the Swedish embassy, after an hour and a half of this, it was like coming out of a steam bath. But even while I was greeting Herr von Dardell and his wife, the demonstrators were gathering outside the embassy singing the Danish and the Swedish national anthems. Eventually the singing and shouting became so loud that we could hardly hear ourselves speak. Arrangements were made for my trip to Stockholm, and then I returned to the Hotel Dangliter to rest for a few hours. In front of the hotel I was stopped once more by Danish partisans, but when they recognized the car and the driver told them that I was a Swede, they let me pass. On the morning of May 6, after encountering considerable difficulties with the control post of the Danish partisans and of the German airport guards, I took off from Copenhagen in one of Count Bernadotte's Red Cross aircraft. We landed at Malmo at a quarter past seven and I was told that a Swedish military aircraft was ready to take me to Stockholm. I strapped on an oxygen mask and a parachute, and after a smooth flight of hardly more than two hours, the Swedish bomber landed at Broma. Herr von Ostrom met me at the airport and took me to the house of Count Bernadotte, where talks with Herr von Post and State Secretary Bohemann were begun at once. I presented my credentials and explained my mission. After a heated conversation, the gentleman decided that in view of the state of developments in Germany, they would discuss the whole matter with the representatives of the Western powers in Stockholm. However, we could not get a definite answer but only a vague promise that a special Allied Commission might be sent to Stockholm by General Eisenhower. The next day, Monday, May 7, the point was raised as to whether General Bohm, who commanded the German troops in Norway, would recognize my authority and conform to any agreements I might reach with the Swedish government. I decided to send Ambassador Thompson and the military attaché, General Utman, to the Norwegian frontier to discuss my mission with General Bohm. On the morning of the 8th Ambassador Thompson flew there in a Swedish bomber and met a leading officer of General Bohm's staff. Thompson telephoned me at noon and said there was some conflict of opinion which he could not discuss in detail on the telephone but he would be back in Stockholm at 6 o apostrophe clock. I had a meeting with Herr von Post and Count Bernadotte and was advised to get in touch with Dennitz and report to him that General Bohm had not been informed of my authorization. We then drew up a lengthy message to the Admiral and General Utman managed to arrange a telephone conversation with him via Oslo, but it was of little use because connections were so bad. We got through a second time, however, and I talked with von Krossig. He explained to me that during the previous night Germany had made a declaration of total capitulation, and that negotiations were still in progress. 
I should be careful, therefore, not to annoy any of General Eisenhower's representatives, who were now also involved in negotiations on the Norwegian question. He suggested that if the Swedish government was still interested in intervening, they should contact the Western Allies at once. The Swedes, however, now declared that there was nothing to be done, for obviously both the Norwegian and the Danish problems were part of the surrender negotiations as a whole. They would wait to see whether the Western Allies on their part had any intention of asking them to mediate. On May 9, the last telephone conversation with Flensburg made it quite clear to me that any intervention by the Swedish Red Cross with regard to the internment of the German forces in Norway was not desired by the British military authorities. For the time being, my services were no longer required.